I'm going to bring this meeting to order. All meeting attendees are advised that all electronic devices should be placed on silent mode to prevent interruptions in our public meeting process. Thank you. All right, we'll call. I'm going to call for order. So, you want to do roll call? Here. I'm here. Here. Mr. Pereira. Mr. Peterson. Here. Mr. Santiago. Mr. Ritman. Here. Dr. Scherer. Here. Here. Okay, so now we'll stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, somebody's going to put a flag on the screen. Oh, there it is, a little one. And, and Amy, you want to lead us in? I would. Please uh, join me in saluting our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, Mr. Chair and board members, wow, this is a pretty powerful microphone here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I typically have a booming voice, but not quite this booming. Um, let's see. I just wanted to cover really quick uh, some housekeeping and logistics. Um, if you haven't found them already, the restrooms are right over here under the exit sign. With uh, Thank you, Heather, for pointing that out. Help yourself to coffee, tea, and other beverages at the back of the room. Uh, we're going to try to keep sort of the entrance and exit um, focus at the back of the room um, over there. Uh, is that correct? those back doors there, to try to minimize some disruption here on the side of, of the building. So if you would use those doors, I'd really appreciate that. And we will be passing out room keys a bit later for those that are still not sure exactly how this is going to work. Um, as we get those keys from the hotel, we'll be um, releasing those. And um, hopefully you've got your stuff still in the car. Once you get those keys, um, you can then you know, move your, your, um, your stuff into your room uh, later at the end of the, the, uh, the meeting today. Um, you probably noticed that there's a lot of kids around. Um, I think sixth grade is here doing some, some camp type stuff. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Yes. Um, so uh, hopefully they join us here. Maybe learn a little bit about air quality and our, the next generation to help us with our clean air mission here. Um, so with that, I just wanted to also just uh, quickly just thank everybody for being here. Really looking forward to a, a really educational, really interesting meeting. A lot of items on the agenda. And I'm not going to steal um, the thunder from our esteemed chair and Dr. Pacheco Warner, who are actually going to do welcoming, welcoming remarks on, on the next item here. So I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Ooh. Thank you very much. Okay. So, all right. Let's, all right. Well, too much. Okay. But anyway, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. I would like to welcome everyone to beautiful Wonder Valley in Fresno County. Very much looking forward to this meeting. Many important items to discuss related to our clean air and public health mission. By way of background, in addition to the regularly scheduled monthly government board, it has been the board's tradition to hold a longer study session to allow board members and the public to engage in a more detailed discussion for educational and strategic planning purposes. The governing board study sessions are conducted in full adherence to the Brown Act requirements and are designed to provide a fuller but less formal exchange, more relaxed dialogue amongst the board members, district staff, and members of the public in attendance. As everyone can see, we have a full agenda so I'd like to close by taking a second to appreciate the district team that worked hard to make this meeting possible. you got to remember, we've never met here before. This includes Jamie, Shanika, Amtia, Amtias, okay, Adriana, and so many wonderful staff that are here. I also like to thank members of the public that have taken time out of their schedule to join us here and support the discussion. To help kick off the meeting, 
As my co-welcomer, I'd like to turn to Dr. Pacheco Warner, who is a uh, native. She lives right here in Sanger. Yeah, just uh, thank you so much, and thank you so much for allowing me to, to welcome you all to um, all of my fellow board members and community board members, uh, community members to my neck of the woods, and um, glad that you'll be able to enjoy, and I hope you enjoy the drive over here, and, and just, you know, one of many of, of our beautiful communities here in the San Joaquin Valley that, that um, we all serve to try to improve air quality and, and make it a, a greater public um, health place for all. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chair, if I could just um, use the wonderful words, and this is an opportunity to talk a bit about the, um, the agenda flow uh, under this item. As everybody here will, will notice, there are time limits. Um, I'd like to believe they're, they're pretty firm time limits, but obviously depending on where the conversations go and through chair um, direction on this, there may be some adjustments to these time limits, but every item does have an allocated amount of time. Um, we're planning the presentations to fit well within those times and then have time for conversation amongst the board. And then um, depending on whether there's uh, actual action happening in the item, there really, there's really just uh, two items that is recommended action. We'll also allow for uh, public commenting and discussion um, within those allotted times. And so there may need to be uh, times where we, I'm sorry, I think there may be a little bit of feedback here. So hopefully it's not, not too, I'll step back a little bit. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, good. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as we're within these items, you know, we can um, solicit maybe a show of hands um, as we conclude the conversation and see if, how many people want to comment, and then we could adjust uh, discussion times kind of based on, on um, you know, how, how much time we have and what the level of uh, participation is going to be. And then, you know, there's a lot, a lot on the agenda, a lot of outside speakers also coming in as well, so I, I will work with the chair to kind of keep an eye on different times and help make sure that the... Uh, we're able to get through as many of these items as possible. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, so. so I guess I'm not just talking to you, so. <laughs> so I guess we'll move to our first item, health, Healthier Air Living Schools Program. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It is my pleasure to be before you this morning. I'm glad you have all made it here safely. And we're going to talk about healthier living schools. And I wasn't going to take credit, but I did have the idea to bring up a bunch of school children around here to give you the full <laughs> feeling of my item. So let's begin. <clears throat> All right. As you are well aware and have prioritized for many, many years, um, school outreach and education is a multifaceted program, and we are focused on connecting with youth in the Valley. Um, we, at its core, we would like to see schools adjusting activities based on air quality and having conversations about air quality, adopting new item initiatives, engaging teachers and parents uh, and staff in educational activities, um, and of course, the key piece being notifying personnel. There, there's common language and discussions on a daily basis about air quality and action taken around it. Diving in a little bit, um, we definitely spend a lot of time sort of educating the K through 12 student base. Um, we focus on every school in the valley that has um, pretty much outdoor activities. That's about 1,500 schools. So there's a handful that maybe are charter based and, and not actually bringing kids on campus, but for the, for the bulk of it, we are looking at kindergarten through middle school all the way to, to high school across the entire valley. And we're trying to connect with parents. We're trying to connect with teachers and administrators and specifically go one step beyond being aware of air quality and actually start in the engagement of our challenges, our progress, the, the grant uh, money that's available to the public, and just the way we work to empower um, people on the ground, students on the ground, and administrators and staff with air quality information um, to get into those schools, have them adopt no idling initiatives, have them recognize when they're standing out front and they see the, the ingress of, of cars in the morning that what's happening, what did those 50 cars lined up mean in the morning and the afternoon and how does that impact my students? And for our staff, it's engaging at uh, whatever level is necessary. That could be the district level, the superintendent, um, all the way down to an administrator, um, office administrator that maybe takes those calls from the parents and is the one getting the call from the, the parent that sees the air quality is bad and wants to know how they respond to it and has that information to share. We have
have spent a lot of time and energy developing the materials that also support this outreach. Um, I like to applaud my team, their effort. They've designed a kid's kit up in the top corner. We hand that out in bulk. We have it in uh, Spanish as well. Um, it becomes the base for a lot of air quality conversations uh, for young kids all the way through about sixth grade. Um, on the bottom left, you see outdoor idling signs. We have those up at many, many dozens, if not um, hundreds of schools in the San Joaquin Valley. We provide them in both languages. Um, and I am proud to say that when I go pick up my student, I definitely see the no idling sign in Fresno Unify. Um, and across the valley in every county, they're all over the place. Uh, in the middle, you see our app. Uh, we push that. It is free for download on any platform. And um, it has really become commonplace. That's what we're getting uh, a lot of conversation and feedback from coaches and athletic directors. Um, they're finding the most useful resource to get the air quality information to make decisions about the activities for school action. Um, many, many of these schools have incorporated uh, RAN and air quality notifications into their decisions, and they absolutely alter activity based on poor air quality, and that's what we want. Quick progress update. Um, happy to report that while COVID changed the life of everyone, um, it, it made us adapt uh, as we were uh, applying the program during the, the downturn, but it did not m make us uh, fail, if you will. We grew. We grew schools, um, and we're now at over a thousand schools um, participating actively, uh, engaging in uh, air quality activities and, and changing behaviors. Um, this is the part where you can do a little banter with, <laughs> with regard to <laughs> this. You, you're right on point. Thank you. <laughs> you you have earned the right to look across your table and and share in the in the um, Tulare County being the highest uh, participating county for health schools. Um, we give every county the same support, but um, they definitely have responded um, in, in full turnout. And we definitely have a few schools, um, the holdout schools, right? They're just, it is um, ongoing conversation we have with Samir and just staff that schools harbor sort of that entrance into this vital population. Um, and the, to the school's credit, uh, we have had to put in a lot of effort building relationships, explaining why we're there. We're not selling something. We actually have health protective information. This is what we're doing. This is why we do it. It's no cost to you. But basically, <laughs> yeah, all those details. We'll leave that slide up a little longer. I'll even point to it for you. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, so... The 297 schools, I'm going to show you a couple images that will make this more, more clear, um, have online read information displayed on, their, displayed on their public website. That is very key. Hold on, I'm just going to go ahead and skip ahead to that, um, and then I'll go back. This is something that we spent some time in during COVID because it just gave us a way to be present in schools um, when schools weren't physically operating. Um, all of the information during COVID, people, the staff drove parents and students back to their websites, and we were happy to work with those schools to make sure air quality was present. Uh, this is an example of a district. So the top left is Turlock Unified. They actually pull multiple school sites to place information on there. Um, it's uh, uh, probably pulling from the same air monitor, but just the same. They customize it that way. Um, on the top right is another district. The bottom two are individual school sites. Many, many schools um, often have just a, a templated style, and so if we can get the district to adopt it, um, they'll push it out at the school level. And we have the ability, as you see, to customize it and have the school name, and, and it just offers some credibility to that school that's plugged in. Parents know this is credible information coming forward. The other part that we've talked about um, that some of you may not have seen, the video I'm going to show at the end, these are real-time electronic air quality displays. Um, their intention is to catch the public, the staff, the students, make it front and center. This was the sort of prototype that evolved from the flags. We use the hourly uh, RAN notifications instead of flags, but this takes those hourly RAN notifications and presents them to the front of the school. Um, many schools actually have taken it a step further. Um, and they'll start engaging students with it. We have a couple that have them facing interior courtyards in addition to the exterior. Um, we also have this. I want to highlight Hanford, Hanford Elementary School District. Yeah, right, right, there you go, there you go. <laughs> this 
district is off the hook, and here's why. They have um, all 11 schools in their district, they have taken the time. So in the very beginning, I might have skipped over, I apologize, we as a district deployed reads, these displays, and we provided almost 30 schools with uh, the equipment and the online URL. It's basically just pointing back to a website with our air quality data to display local air quality for that school to the school body. Generally, they were in windows facing the public. Hanford Elementary School District took it to every single school. They also, as you see, customized it, and they have worked, and they've adapted school announcements um, in the different pieces you can see on the far right, that's a middle school, um, but they use it multi-purpose, and that's exactly what we want. I mean, the kids are coming in, checking the daily schedule, seeing air quality front and center, part of the conversation all the time. And the response since COVID. So obviously during COVID, we went virtual, and it actually has served, I think probably in many forums around the world to, to change how we move forward, being that we can be virtually in a classroom anytime now. Didn't used to be that way. We weren't invited into classrooms uh, all the time in a video sense, but now we can. We can show up in person and deliver a presentation. We can also hit that environmental science class um, and, and jump in for a 10-minute conversation if we need to. We have the ability to also do it in multiple languages. Um, as a matter of fact, we had a request just this week uh, at a school, and at the very last minute, they they needed someone bilingual, so we're going to jump on Zoom and provide it in a bilingual fashion, and they, and they got what they needed. Um, we really enjoyed that because it got us into parent coffee hours. It got us into some of the back-to-school nights and some of those things that certainly we can't be everywhere at once, but it allowed us to sort of um, divide and conquer and, and show up at a lot of places, even though COVID had settled things to kind of being virtual. Um, and then, of course, during this time, we consistently stayed in touch with schools. We wanted them to know. I mean, there's 1,500 schools still trying to operate. We want them to know that we're out here. We, we never went away. Um, and we consistently provided the same tools for air quality protection. And then, of course, we spent a lot of time looking to develop the, the connection and get the schools to put those uh, read widgets, if you will, on the homepage websites and uh, in their school windows. And then enter... Return to in-person activities. Yay! My team cheered and rejoiced. Um, that it, it is just so in, engaging and um, really informative to connect directly with parents, and that's what we were able to do. This fall, we embarked on a pilot program um, with a connection to our AB617 communities and this sort of intense work we're doing with schools there. Um, we targeted schools in uh, Stockton, Shafter, and Fresno, and we showed up in, in teams of two or three at uh, school, either ingress or egress, drop off or pick up, and we handed out packets to parents, and we talked to parents, and we talked to parents in multiple languages, and um, we got their feedback. We asked them how they get air quality information, and we handed them, I dropped it earlier, we handed them, you all have one. Um, these fun little, so you can imagine it's hot in the back to school season and we're just chatting with folks asking them to cut their engine potentially. But when you show up with a fan that you can plug into your cell phone and be like, check it out. And you, and you're like cooling off while you're asking them to shut their engine off. Somehow it, it made it better. It was a good conversation. And then they came back and asked for another one. And suddenly we start talking about actually what it means to be idling in your car and uh, kind of took the barrier down. Just, you know, offer a little incentive and, and have a good conversation. And it worked really well. We handed out probably I think 1,100 packets uh, in those three communities um, with the intention to continue doing that. It was fantastic uh, work. We talked about, I can't tell you how many uh, parents are going to maybe try the tune-in tune-up program or trade out their car or trade out their uh, wood-burning device. And then this is, uh, on the left you see Madi. She's giving a presentation to the PTA. Um, we've found success there as well. Obviously, it is across the board. It's not just handing out flyers and backpacks, it's all the way across the board. Parents, school outings, you know, sports, PTA groups, looking to connect that message. Um, and then just being able to be back in the community on the right there, tabling at carnivals and uh, events and such. What's next? What's next for health schools? Well, we continue the robust communication with over a 1,000 schools. Um, uh, I may not have mentioned we still are using our internal um, tracking tool, which gives us the ability to stay in touch with, I think that slide had 1,800 is the contacts we have now in our database. It is. It takes staff time. It definitely does. It, um, the turnover at school sites, we might have a year um, where we were out at the school, we presented, we engaged, and then if, if you know a year went by, 
personnel change, we have to re-engage, right? Reintroduce, make that connection again if the top uh, administrator changed hands. Um, so it's a constant work to keep our uh, tracker updated and our ability to send out a quick notice, just one quick notice if we have, say, a wildfire event, major impacts in the valley, we can reach out to schools. Um, and then, of course, there's lots of funding. We all know money is coming for schools. We want to leverage those opportunities. We want to be talking about air quality as they make changes and decisions and um, make purchases for school sites, indoor filtration being a top one, and, of course, air quality education, and then leveraging our partners. We have lots of partners um, still in the community, our environmental justice partners doing good work on the ground, and we've built relationships with those folks, too, because we realize in the same fashion they're bridging the connections in these school sites and, and making it easier. And we also hand out lots of tchotchke. Um, and the orange frisbees um, in front of you are part of our school's program as well. Samir made me promise not to throw them to all of you while I was up here. So I laid them on your desk. I mean, I, I played softball. I have an arm. I could. I, I said, it's okay. I got you. I got you. Okay. Um, and then, of course, very, very big and, and very important, integrating into uh, air quality education into STEM opportunities um, and the science and a um, whole world of, of things we can dive into there. So we're still pushing forward in that regard. Um, and then enhancing air quality tools. Um, we talk often about the fact, oh, here's a quick picture I want to, before I jump into that, apologies. The top left is an old pre-pandemic photo. Um, that's what it looked like when we were recklessly pulling all the children together, I'm kidding, uh, for mass uh, assemblies outside. We're still doing those. We're actually getting back in the, in the swing of those. Um, the bottom is just this last uh, spring at Hildago in Fresno. Um, just in the library, awesome opportunity to engage with kids. And the top right was a really cool one. Um, the Bu uh, Building Healthy Communities program has interns. Um, and our connection with BHC through our AB 617 program led us to the intern group. And we were able to have a sort of in-depth one-on-one. The students were so excited about that air quality monitor and being shown how to use it and how it works. It was fantastic. And then, of course, moving forward, enhancing our air quality tools, recognizing that Families, parents, administrators, there's a lot of places you can gather air quality information. Making sure, one, that that is a habit, it's forthright, you're doing, you're checking air quality, but two, recognizing there's lots of tools available and getting folks to those tools is our goal. Uh, to make sure they are protected and, and uh, activities are uh, adjusted accordingly. And I think that's my last slide. Oh, nope, have a video. Uh, if you haven't seen the video, uh, you're in for a treat. If you have, you're also in for a treat. When it comes to our kids, we take their health and safety very seriously. Here in the San Joaquin Valley, our air quality is an important consideration that may sometimes be overlooked. That's why the Valley Air District developed the Real-Time Electronic Air Quality Display, or READ, which provides teachers, administrators, parents, and students up-to-the-minute air quality alerts. The indicated air quality level corresponds to the district's real-time outdoor activity risk guidelines, enabling everyone to make informed decisions throughout the day. READ is meant to replace the less precise flag system, which is based on daily air quality forecasts, which cannot account for hourly changes. For more information about this pilot project, contact the Valley Air District at publiceducation at valleyair.org. That is all. Uh, Mr. Chair, board members, just... Uh, we started a little bit uh, past 11, so on the 30 minutes for this item, I think we're probably hitting at about um, 11.40 or, or so, 11.45. Um, we just wanted one last uh, set of closing comments. First, I just want to thank Heather and Jamie and her team. They do a really great job in, in reaching out to schools. There, there is no other district actually anywhere in the country that does what we, what we do with schools. Uh, it's the reason why when the state was really interested in this recently, um, coming out of the wildfires a couple of years ago, there was an effort to to look at models that could be replicated and maybe more more widely distributed across the state. They actually took, in that case, our guidelines, the, the, the ROAR guidelines that Heather was talking about, kind of generalized them a little bit, and then the Department of Education ended up sending that out statewide to, for schools to look at as a potential model for them to follow. Um, so we're, we're doing some really innovative work here, and part of why it's innovative is because we have to keep evolving the program, and that's something that uh, is a central theme to what Heather was talking about. There's a lot of opportunities actually now with new technology, with um, the attention that air quality is getting. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's becoming a, a much more uh, widely talked about issue. There's a lot of interest in schools and looking at the environment and thinking about air quality. 
There's new air quality sensors that are available that I think if you couple that with, you know, a STEM program, inquisitive minds, you can get kids really thinking about air quality through more experiments and more, more um, curriculum type work. And so I think there's some opportunity there. And I wanted to actually recognize um, Councilmember Fugazi for, Vice Mayor Fugazi, I should say, for uh, her interest in this issue. And uh, this is actually, uh, I don't know if you were going to say this at some point, but maybe I can let the cat out of the bag. This is actually her last uh, district board meeting. Uh, she, she won't be able to make it to our, our December board meeting. And th this item is actually a secret agenda item to keep her yeah. actually working and involved in our issues because she's actually volunteered <laughs> to help with um, developing some extracurriculum and experimentation kind of STEM related tools that we can, we can bring into classrooms to really get kids even more involved. She's already been doing this. She's already been doing it with um, box fan filters. She can talk about that. Um, so there's a lot of interest, I think, in schools in kind of taking it to the next level in terms of how we approach the curious minds in, in schools, especially in STEM programs, but even more broadly. And then I think the air quality tool side is very confusing right now. I'll just yes. be, be blunt about this. There's a lot of tools. You can go to Siri on your phone and say, what's yes. the air quality? And they, they give you a number and they tell you, they give you a recommendation. And sometimes it's pulling from one source or the other. And you know, we have, RAN is actually a very popular tool amongst administrators and residents. It's easy to use, it's, it's accurate. They don't really trust a lot of these other tools. There are new tools like EPA's Air Now tool mm -hmm. that is actually um, using our data, mm -hmm. using other data, using formulas and other, other tools to actually provide a lot of this data now. And so we're actually looking at having a process. We talked about this with your board before, but it's just I want to make sure the board is, is uh, fully briefed on this. We're actually looking at having an engagement with researchers, school administrators to talk about where do we go from here in terms of the best coupling of air quality tools with guidance. Do we need to also update our guidance as well right. based on the latest research? That's an effort that is ongoing and it's going to be a big priority for us because if we don't keep up on that front, there's going to be a, a lot of disconnects between our app and Air Now and Siri and uh, weather apps all have air quality data in there now as well. It, it gets really, really confusing, you know, to really sift through all that data and, and see where, you know, where people should really be looking for their data. So. Just want to thank the team again. These are things that are, they're working on with our air quality science department yep. on the scientific front of that, as well as, you know, again, um, hopefully keeping um, Vice Mayor Fugazi uh, really engaged with us to help yes. us with and others with, with uh, <laughs> the curriculum type work that we're, we're looking at doing as well. With that, Mr. Chair, maybe I'll turn it back, back to the board and you for, and the board for okay. discussion. Okay, I'm going to see if any board members want to ask. I know you want to ask a question. One thing I want to say is that it would probably be helpful if we put a little element in the curriculum to show, especially we're dealing with people that were born in this century, because they're younger kids, and a lot of them after 2010 even. So we need to have some kind of comparison. We don't want to, we just need to kind of slip it in. Here's, here was the air quality before you were born and before we started doing this work. So I just want to say that before I turn it over to our great teacher, Vice Mayor Fagazi. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm always excited uh, when, when we have this discussion. Um, and I will tell you that as somebody who is in education uh, and knows the need that we have for students to go into STEM, I mean, seriously, I, I don't know which cities or counties don't have vacancies for engineers and planners and things of that nature. So we really want to funnel uh, kids in that direction. And just some of the things, though, is you need a person or a group of people to really kind of bring it in, though. And those people, usually your frontline workers or your teachers. And so one of the things that I look at is always at trainings, partnering with your county office of education, with your school districts. Uh, one of the things I put down here is a summer program, not only for teachers that would come in and it'd be a two or three day training yes. on this and how they can incorporate in, into the uh, next generation science standards, which the state already has, which everybody has access to if you wanted it, but also for students to become, I put, air ambassadors. Yes. And so these air ambassadors then for high school level kids or even community college or college kids could then go into the elementary schools because in Stockton we're K-8, 
but bring them into the elementary schools and allow them the opportunity to then share that information because there are teachers out there that will be like, oh, I really don't have time, but if you want to come into my class and, and do, do it, it for us, we got th- then okay. I'll make time for it because yeah. uh, I've had teachers say that to me and I said, I'm on my way into your classroom. And I did bring that box fan. It's in my car, <laughs> but I didn't know how far I was going to have to walk. And that was a collaboration between the engineering students at UC Berkeley and our high school students at Edison, who then brought it to the elementary feeder schools. So they made them, and when we incorporated into Earth Day, so they built them then at Earth Day, showed the community how to to build them and use them and give out that information. So just very successful, uh, uh, many opportunities. And then Science Saturdays. I was thinking that as well. Science Saturdays. For for kids, because guess what? School is often the safest place for a lot of our children. And if you offered something on Saturdays, there are kids and there are parents that would flock to it because they're looking for that value-added, educational-based uh, uh, instruction for their kids as opposed to them sitting at home on a video game exactly. all, all day. So I think there are many opportunities. And then one more, CSTA, California Science Teachers Association, schedule to be a presenter there of the material that teachers will show up and make sure you have a nice little, here you go, here it is, here's the website, there it is, all the materials are there, mm-hmm. and send them on their way all up and down the state to then disseminate the information. As a science teacher, are you required to go to that, that CSTA? You're not required, but uh, I will tell you, we had five teachers from my school that went, and one of them was a presenter because this is connections, obviously, to earth science, to chemistry, to environmental science. I mean, you can really touch across uh, the different science disciplines. Uh, um, But I just think, you know, and and I'm happy to help any way that I can uh, in putting that out there. But it it really is, I think this is too important not to have our kids equipped. And if we just focus on elementary, you know, they forget, they're getting lots of information. But but looking at the the older kids as well, because we really want to funnel them into that, for those that are going on to college, you know, into those career pathways. So, thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to to mention to you all, and um, Heather knows a little bit about this, but um, last week I attended a a roundtable that the First Partners Council on Physical Activity and Well-Being is doing around the state, and one of them was in Chowchilla, um, because uh, one of the members on this council is actually a physical education, a a coach in in Chowchilla, Um, and it was it was fascinating to me, you know, these are, you know, folks listening to and, and implementing these recommendations around policy, um, how, how little they knew about the impact of air quality on physical education. And including, you know, there were some coaches there that are, you know, state-renowned. And so I do think that there's a, a lot of opportunity with coaches as well, um, and maybe that could be the, the sort of, in point because I know that that's been a struggle in terms of games and that continues to be a concern for me um, you know um, having been here you know as you see now how close we were to you know one of the bigger wildfires we had um, in the last um, year you know it's just to, to see that there were still football games being held yeah. and you know outside um, for me continues to be a concern and I think I don't. I don't think it's it's malice. It was like, you know, just puzzle. You know, they were they were and they were interested in knowing more. But I, I saw that that was so interesting to have these experts and for there to be this just total gap in knowledge about that. So I think there's there's some more to be done on the physical education side. I'm glad you were in the room. <laughs> Me too. Is there Show of hands. Anybody in the public that wants to speak? Okay, yeah, make a run for it.
Thank you. Mr. Chair, just a, maybe a quick summary, because um, I thought you had a great idea. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, the, um, the, I also wanted to make sure it was clear that when we talk to, to residents, you know, through the idle free kind of campaigns, you know, we're also providing information about cleaner vehicles, um, our grants, and you know, so, because I think there's, there's stop idling, but if, actually if you're in a cleaner vehicle, even an electric vehicle, um, you can actually run the AC and and I should yeah. do it in a, in a pollution-free uh, environment, right? So there's, um, and as, as vehicles become more available and, you know, our programs ramp up and now there's new funds. So I think there's, you know, we, we need to keep evolving our messaging to, to continue kind of meeting meeting these different moments that, that are happening. Um, and I think to, to Dr. Pacheco Warner's point, that's a great idea. I think we do need to follow up on the athletic side, um, continue to kind of keep building those relationships. There's policy in place that at the CIF, which is an acronym that I always forget. California Interscholastic uh, Federation. Exactly. Thank you. I already forgot it. See, you just said it, and it's already gone. <laughs> um, but the, the CIF puts out guidance on sort of rec recommendations related to outdoor athletic events, and, and uh, they tie it to Air Now, which is a, the, the EPA, um, you know, sort of metric. So there's, there's already a little bit of a disconnect between yeah. RAN and Air Now. And then what, what people do with the guidance, right? And are they even aware of it? And so there's an ongoing conversation about that. So I think it's a big opportunity, you know, especially during wildfire season, which is when a lot of the, uh, the issues come up. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and something we can definitely, you know, follow up on. And with that, Mr. Chair, I believe we bought some time we actually on, on the uh, agenda. Yeah. So. Um, We'll turn it back to you. And it, the next item is actually lunch. Okay. So um, I think the big question is, is it ready? I think it's very close to being ready because they are putting out the last bits, signing up tech, and lunch is for everyone. Okay. Okay. What's that? Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, stretch. Right? Or stretch. Yeah. yeah. Well, just very quickly, um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, Everything that's been said here today, I think, um, you know, the, the, the total clean air mission that we have, and I've shared this with Samir uh, several times, but it's, it's about telling the district story. And I think it, what we've seen, whether it's legislation coming out of Sacramento, actions taken by federal agencies, um, sometimes folks try to take that story and bend it. And I think it's so critical that we're out there telling the story, the positive benefits of, of this organization. And, and uh, I think, you know, looking at our agenda later, how we message that in the community, our, our great relationships now with the AB 617 communities and all the communities in our, our district, we need to, to refine uh, how we tell our story and make sure that it's our story and not a blend of someone else's story that, that meets their criteria. And uh, I, I think the more that we can um, get the honest, and I would say honest, the, the correct um, message out there, the, the real message of what this district does um, is only going to benefit uh, the program and, uh, you know, the naysayers that want, you know, less funding or challenged on making decisions on funding. I just think it's critical and, and, uh, and that should be one of the main goals of this organization continually as, as we do today, but um, making sure that our message is, is our message. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to acknowledge yeah, it, and that's actually one of the founding principles of this program. So I'm glad you, you and Heather talked about that. Um, we are continuing to look for ways to keep um, embedding that. You know, so when we talk about STEM programs or other, other opportunities, you know, that progress that we've made, the efforts that are going on, um, that's absolutely embedded into the, the core principles of the program. So I think we need to continue looking for, you know, even more ways to, you know, because that, that, that story also changes over time. We keep making even more progress, right? The challenges keep evolving. So I think we need to, to really um, continue that principle moving forward. And we just wanted to state that that is, that is something absolutely that's front and center with, you know, with the program. It's one of the biggest things that we try to accomplish. So thank you for that. I guess with that, we'll go to lunch. Let's see. Yeah. All right, let's let's get started. So we'll move to item seven: discuss Clean Air Act impl implications, challenges, and opportunities. Thank Thanks you. for being up there quickly.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to just, real quick, Jesse, just introduce uh, you, number one, as our Director of Air Quality Planning, who works really hard on, on the various uh, Cleaner Act implementation. One of the most important things that our agency does is actually uh, work to, to attain federal standards and satisfy Cleaner Act requirements. And as the board knows, this is a very complex, a very challenging uh, set of issues, ever evolving, standards change, policies change. And so we very frequently talk with, with the board about the various aspects of the Clean Air Act and, and what we do to try to implement it. Jesse's gonna have a very interesting presentation. It's gonna cover a lot of the different facets of kind of where we are today with, with implementing the act and some of the key issues that we are, are working on with Carbon EPA. And so with that, Jesse, I'll turn it to you. Thanks. Thank you. I know you guys just ate a nice big meal and you got to visit, and now you get to sit down and listen to me talk about the Clean Air Act. But I will make it as interesting as possible. There is, as always, a lot going on, and it can be very complex. So we're going to start by setting the stage and reminding ourselves of the vehicle for so much of the work that our agency does. It really starts with the Clean Air Act, the Federal Clean Air Act that was first adopted back in 1970, and it's been amended a few times, the most recent in 1990, which was some time ago, but that is still the vehicle for a lot of the clean air benefits that we've seen over the past several decades, and it's the vehicle for a lot of the work that our agency does. The Clean Air Act prompts EPA to establish National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACs, or just standards, for several criteria pollutants, um, ozone in particular matter being the most significant for our regions and many other regions. After EPA sets a standard, they have to designate all areas as either attainment or non-attainment of those standards, and then put together planning requirements that, that tell states and regions, you know, here's the roadmap for how you need to put together plans to achieve these health-based standards. And then it's up to states and in California regions to work together to craft state implementation plans, or SIPs, that demonstrate how your region will improve air quality continuously until you attain the standards, and also meet a, num a number of administrative requirements along the way. Uh, each SIP builds on the work of prior SIPs. EPA goes through this process of setting an acts and establishing non-attainment areas periodically. And in fact, you can see on this table, we have three eight-hour ozone standards and three PM 2.5 standards. And before these, we had PM 10 and one-hour ozone standards. So this is a cycle that our region and other regions and EPA, we've been through this cycle several times. And this cycle has really led to all the regulations that we have and all of the air quality improvements that that we've seen over the past several decades. But this also adds to the challenge because the work is never done. It is ongoing as we continue to evaluate federal standards, evaluate ways to improve air quality, and we go through the cycle again and again. So there's always a lot to talk about, and that's why you hear some versions of this presentation periodically because there's always something moving. Every th each SIP we do is just one checkpoint. It builds on the work of prior SIPs, and it established the work that is to come as we figure out innovative ways to keep improving Valley's air quality so we can also improve uh, public health in our region. Now, part of the Clean Air Act also relies on each agency doing its part. It's built on this system of co cooperative federalism, where there are roles and responsibilities for various agencies that are involved in this process. When it comes to EPA's role, it's really important for EPA to do their part, to help states and regions do their jobs effectively. We need to ensure that federal mandates are adequately addressed and this is critical to avoiding major punitive consequences under the Clean Air Act. If we don't do what we're supposed to do, then we face the risk of sanctions. But conversely, if EPA doesn't act on our submittals, on our attainment plans or our regulations in a timely fashion, well, then as that plan or rule sits on the shelf for several months and then new information comes available, it becomes harder for all of the agencies to move forward. It becomes harder for EPA to act on the plan formally, and it also becomes harder at the local level to be able to implement our regulations. There's a lot of regulatory uncertainty, and really you face uh, increased 
increasingly devastating consequences, not just to public health, but also to the economy, because there's financial sanctions that go hand in hand with the Clean Air Act process. Under the current law, local, jurisdi lo local jurisdictions are subject to these consequences. That can include permitting barriers, for uh, new and expanding businesses, and this can be very cost prohibitive. Uh, loss of federal highway funds, which could cost the, our region billions of dollars and numerous jobs. Also, uh, there's the potential for federal takeover and loss of local control and expensive non-attainment penalties. So certainly our, our agency wants to do everything we can to make sure that we are giving EPA things that they can approve, but also relying on EPA to be good partners and act on our submittals in a timely fashion so we don't increase the risk of some of these um, potentially harmful consequences. The good news, though, is that by and large, the attainment plans that we're adopting and the regulations that we've adopted as a result really are improving air quality. You can see the evidence of this at the air monitoring sites, and we know that public health is also improving as a result. This governing board has adopted numerous attainment plans over the years and air quality control strategies to address these federal standards. The stationary sources... Um, for ozone and particular matter forming NOx emissions have been reduced by 90% over the past several decades. That is a tremendous reduction, and you'll see it graphically on the next slide. CARB has also adopted numerous mobile source emissions controls. Together, the district and the CARB truly have the most stringent air quality regulations in the nation. And we also couple that with strong incentive programs. And part of why we do that is because as as effective as these regulations are, there are limits in our jurisdictional authority. Our agency can only regulate certain things, and CARB can only regulate certain things. And so to expedite emissions reductions beyond what we could achieve just with regulations, we start utilizing incentive programs to accelerate the turnover of equipment to get additional emissions reductions. And you, you hear Todd DeYoung and others at our agency talk a lot about the incentive programs of our region, and, and they're so important because they get even more reductions than we could with, through regulations alone. And really, and we can't even take all the credit, right, because it's not just our regulations and our incentive programs, but it's the significant investment that comes along with it. Our regulations and our incentive programs would mean nothing if it weren't for the partners out in the community, the regulated community, that do their part to invest in cleaner technologies and to participate in these incentive programs. And so thanks to all that work, all that cooperation, and all that effort, emissions are being reduced. So this chart shows you uh, NOx emissions reductions uh, and NOx is a precursor to both ozone and particulate matter. So the NOx emissions reductions get us benefits all year round. And between 1980 and 2021, we see a tremendous reduction in all sources of NOx emissions in our region. Bigger reduction in stationary sources than in mobile sources in terms of a percentage, but overall you see a lot of emissions reductions. This corresponds to reductions in particulate matter and ozone in our region. These maps show you the progress in improving PM2.5, um, both for 24-hour averages and for annual averages. You may have noticed, I didn't talk about it in detail, on the, on the second slide where I had that table of the different air quality standards, for particulate matter, there's a 24-hour component, so the daily um, concentrations that um, people are being exposed to, as well as annual averages. Two components for that standard. And the good news is, is our regulations are being are pretty effective in addressing both components of that standard. We still have a little bit of work to do, but we can see that between 2003, 2024, 2025, uh, we are well, even to 2020, we are seeing a lot of progress and we are expecting um, additional progress based on the work that we've done in those attainment plans. We're seeing good things in ozone as well between the year 2000 and 2020. Because of those emissions reductions I showed you a couple of slides ago, the ozone concentrations in our region are improving quite a bit. But we're not done. Those standards that I showed you in slide two, those are very challenging standards. And we know that the work we've done in the past is effective, but we're going to have to keep doing more. And one of the, the SIPs that we've been working on, and I've talked to you about this SIP a few times over the past year, is our 2022 ozone plan. This plan addresses the 2015 eight-hour ozone standard. That's the largest ozone, uh, I'm sorry, the lowest ozone standard that EPA currently has. And it does, this plan does demonstrate that the Valley is on track to attain this standard by the deadline of 2037. This plan demonstrates that we are achieving a 62% reduction in NOx from 2017 to 2037. 
And I want to put that into context for a sec for a moment. I already showed you a couple of slides ago all the emissions reductions we got between the year, what was it, 1980 through 2021. We need even more. And this plan shows that more. That This plan shows that thanks to the regulations this board has adopted uh, very recently that we're still implementing, thanks to the mobile source regulations that are being adopted by the state, an additional 62% reduction in NOx. That's just staggering. And that's going to help us cross that finish line for this ozone standard on time. This plan also commits to a number of further study measures. This plan, we're, adopt, we're looking to have your presented to your board uh, in December. It's a 2022 ozone plan projecting attainment 2037. There's a few years there where we're going to keep doing the work to figure out if there's ever anything we can do to expedite attainment, to expedite public health benefits. We're not done. This plan is just one more checkpoint in the continuing work. This plan documents that that continuing work is a number of further study measures where we're going to keep pushing the envelope and we're going to keep looking for more. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, continuing to evaluate these opportunities. We're also committing to um, a SIP strengthening measure of our LDAR rule amendments. That's leak detection and repair. Um, and we've... We've gone through an extensive public process on this SIP. We've been holding regular meetings since February of 2020 um, to the present. We've given updates to your board and CAC and EJAG. We've held a few public workshops, uh, the most recent of which was a couple weeks ago on October 27th. Uh, the full draft of the plan published in mid-October. And uh, we will be publishing the proposed version of the plan next Tuesday and hopefully presenting it to your board for your consideration uh, at your December board meeting. That's just one plan. There's a few other plan issues I need to tell you about today. One is the plan for the 2012 PM 2.5 standard, and this is one you may have heard about recently. This plan was adopted in 2018. It was adopted by CARB in early 2019. And EPA proposed to approve this plan in December of 2021. And there was some pretty extensive analysis that had gone into that. Uh, EPA re reversed this action and proposed disapproval of, of, this, uh, of, this act, of this plan in uh, early October, on October 5th of 2022. And in response to that reversal, CARB withdrew the plan and the district concurred with this withdrawal. For a number of reasons, and one of the bigger reasons is there's just a need for federal guidance. There were some issues addressed in that proposal that really no region's ever had to deal with before, and there isn't clear guidance on how to deal with those issues, and I'll tell you more about those specifics uh, a little bit later in the presentation. But knowing that we need federal guidance and we need approvable pathways and we need to know well, what does an approvable plan look like, that model just doesn't exist. You know, when it comes to what we put together in this plan in 2018, we, we definitely base that plan on the best available guidance and science that was available at the time that plan was adopted. But we recognize now that if there's a need for federal emissions reductions, if there's a need for, there is additional planning time. We adopted that plan early to expedite public health benefits. And we're drawing, we do have some time to address some of these issues and maybe um, enhance some documentation if there's an opportunity to do that. The bottom line is, is even though we've withdrawn this plan from federal consideration to help avoid the risk for federal sanctions, we're still implementing the plan. Every control measure that was included in that plan, we are still implementing those. We are committed um, to work collaboratively to try to uh, address the questions that, that EPA had in advance of the December uh, 2023 submittal deadline. So that is a plan that we are continuing to work on. For some of the other standards, uh, and again, there was the table back on slide two. Uh, because of our successes in reducing emissions and improving air quality, we've actually attained several of the standards. And so the process when you attain a standard is you request a clean data finding and you show EPA my data meets the standard. And when EPA uh, concurs with your clean data finding, then you put together something called a maintenance plan. And a maintenance plan is is a lot like an attainment plan, but basically what you're doing is you're showing I attain the standard now, and here's how I'm going to ensure that I continue to attain the standard. And we've actually done a maintenance plan before. We already have a maintenance plan for um, the PM10 standard that EPA established in 1987. Um, so we have some upcoming clean data findings that we are working on with EPA, and following those, we will work on maintenance plans as well. Um, so our region gets full credit for all the work that's being done here, and so we can make sure that we are on track um, to meet all the requirements. So even, the, even when you attain a standard, there are still requirements. We're going to make sure our region uh, meets all those requirements 
um, and we demonstrate continuing compliance and we're supporting EPA doing formal redesignations to attain it for um, a handful of standards, the 1997 24-hour PM 2.5 standard. Um, we have a maintenance plan update for the PM 10 standard we'll be working on. We're also looking at um, the eight-hour ozone, the first eight-hour ozone standard of 84 ppb. We're on track to attain that very soon, so we look forward to presenting a clean data finding and hopefully doing a maintenance plan. So hopefully I'll, I'll be able to talk to you guys at a future study session about all the maintenance plans. Teaser, right? And now you're oh, I can't can't wait to hear more about these maintenance plans. Little fun fun facts to share, like over dinner tonight. Like if the conversation lulls, here's a tip: just talk about maintenance plans. It's gonna be great. Now no one's gonna talk to me at dinner. They're like, ah, oh, shoot. That's the girl that talks about maintenance plans. I can talk about other sip things too. Anything about the cleaner. Uh, <laughs> We need EPA guidance, you know, on this journey to improve air quality. The Clean Air Act is complicated, and it evolves over time because as you deal with different standards, as you adopt all these generations of control measures, the, the landscape changes, and things don't get easier just because you've done a lot of work. On, on the contrary, they tend to get more complicated as you go along, and we really need EPA's assistance and cooperation on some of these issues. And there are some specific things that I, I think we'll be hearing more about in, in the coming months as we work on these maintenance plans and these upcoming state implementation plans. EPA's recent proposals and changing directions and even some recent court rulings. And again, like, this isn't all EPA's doing in a vacuum. Sometimes what happens is EPA has a policy they approve a plan, and then the courts weigh in and, and aren't happy with where things landed. So it, it, it's just an ongoing journey on all of these fronts. There's just a number of areas that need some focused attention to make sure that we are meeting the spirit of the Clean Air Act and addressing all the requirements that apply to our, our, our region and regions nationwide. And that's another thing to keep in mind. Because of our air quality problem, we're often in these tight spots first, and that can be a real challenge because there's not an existing model of success to look to. Hopefully, we can be that model of success. EPA is considering new standards, harder standards. A lot of the country is going to be non-attainment probably in the next decade or so. And they're going to be looking to us to see how did the San Joaquin Valley regulate their pollution? How did San Joaquin Valley deal with these tough Clean Air Act requirements? So there really is an opportunity here for us to be really innovative and for you know, just work ahead as much as we can with our partners at the other agencies. We need EPA's help on Title VI. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act is about ensuring that government actions um, do not discriminate against communities uh, in the various things that they have to do. Um, Title VI was mentioned in EPA's uh, October 2022 proposed disapproval of our PM 2.5 plan, but it's not, Title VI is not addressed specifically in EPA's implementation regulations or guidance. And we are expecting that new guidance is forthcoming. And I want to make clear, Title VI was not written because of air quality. Title VI is a different statute that it was focused on discrimination on a broad level. It was never, it's not specifically an air quality statute. We're already subject to Title VI, but there are concerns about how do you couple Title VI with other environmental regulations. And, and we need guidance on that. We, we need all the agencies to work together to figure out, well, what can we do to demonstrate that the things that our agency and other states are doing are completely consistent with all the applicable statutes. But so this is a, a different kind of requirement, though. Most of what we're dealing with here is about the Clean Air Act and California Health and Safety Code. This is new territory for us, and it's new territory for a lot of states and for EPA a little bit as well. And we really need EPA guidance so we can do it right. You know, we don't want to we don't want to get this requirement wrong. We want to do it effectively and efficiently, but we can't do that without knowing what we're aiming for. Another big issue is contingency measures, and that's one that we've been talking about for years. It is very challenging. Contingency measures are those extra measures that you're supposed to hold back in your plan just in case you need them. But in an area like ours, where our air quality challenges are real and they're happening every day, the idea of holding back anything is just patently absurd, let alone if you think about the amount of contingency measures that's required under EPA's baseline policy. It's horrifying to think about having that much air quality benefit and not using it and holding it back just in case. So this is a real problem. We understand the spirit of the contingency measure requirement, but how do you meet that requirement, especially when you think about the fact that 
Congress wrote the phrase contingency measures back in 1990 before they had a region like ours that got 90% reduction in their, in their um, precursor emissions. When you were allowed to take credit for contingency measures back then, that you can't now because litigation has changed this landscape. Court decisions make it very, very hard to identify any contingency measure whatsoever. At this point, you're required to come up with something that has a contingency trigger. And what that means is your measure is fully adopted, but you're not using it yet. And not only are you not using it, but it has to be set up so that if someone, if EPA acts and says, you have a contingency trigger, you failed to meet a milestone, you failed to meet, meet an attainment deadline, you need to implement your contingency measure right now. Well, the idea of coming up with a regulation that's just sitting there and waiting that can be implemented like that, it's, it's just not feasible for most things. Think about the contingency, um, the control measures your board has adopted over the past few years. They're very expensive. They're, they take a lot of technology. It takes a lot of planning, and it takes certainty. EPA's current policy, it just doesn't fit with the reality of regulating air quality in a region like ours right now. And we, we expect that uh, guidance from EPA is forthcoming. And uh, really, there's just a scarcity of measures that meets this definition. And so we need to find a way to meet the intent of this requirement without shortchanging public health for our region as a whole and for our environmental justice communities. But we are on the hook to address this quickly. And so even though we definitely need EPA guidance and EPA partnership on this particular issue, it's got to happen fast. We are already under sanctions clocks for contingency measures for existing attainment plans. Many of our attainment plans have been approved except for contingency measures. And again, it's not like we don't want contingency measures. It's just prohibitively difficult to come up with contingency measures. So we need to find a way to put together a contingency measure submittal um, CARB and the district will be working on this together probably in early 2023. We'll put together a package that demonstrates what's available um, and hopefully find ourselves in a place where we can meet this requirement. Uh, and it is going to be tough. There is simply a scarcity of measures that meets the existing contingency measure criteria. So as I mentioned, EPA guidance is really needed. We must establish a framework for meeting this requirement without delaying public health benefits. And the district and CARB are also requesting that EPA review federal mobile sources under their jurisdiction, given the significance of federal sources. At this point, federal mobile sources constitute a huge amount of our emissions inventory, and it would be really helpful if there was a way to get a contingency measure out of those sources as well. And in fact, even beyond, <laughs> even beyond contingency measures, and sometimes I feel silly when I say, oh, what about a federal contingency measure? If there's a federal control measure, like our control measures, we really should just implement them. Our region needs all the emissions reductions we can get. Mobile sources now make up the majority of emissions in our region and many regions throughout the state, uh, not just for criteria pollutants like the oxides of nitrogen, but also for our air toxics and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, California does have stringent stationary mobile source measures, uh, and the mobile emissions um, that are left, it, it is a lot of interstate trucks and, and, and mobile sources that are dominated by the that are within the federal jurisdiction. And so we really, we can't attain federal standards without significant mobile source reductions under federal jurisdiction. We're not alone there. South Coast is in a similar situation. And so the more emissions reductions that come out of the federal side of things, the better off our region, South Coast, and other regions nationwide will be because we, the whole country can benefit from those emissions reductions and from that leadership. Um, to support carbon district efforts to ensure the needed reductions under cooperative federalism, federal investment and in actions are, is really needed. And again, like our situation, even if regulations alone can't get you there, investment and um, incentive dollars, there really is an unprecedented amount of um, funding available lately, uh, and you're going to hear more about that in some of the other uh, study session items that you'll hear throughout the day today and maybe a little bit tomorrow. Uh, but we can make dedicated investments and, and dedicate strategies for transformative uh, vehicle equipment and infrastructure technologies across sectors. There, there really is an opportunity here for some co-benefits and to, to do really good things for the San Joaquin Valley. And even within, the, even within our region, we have really stringent uh, control measures in place, but we, we review them all the time. 
I said at the beginning of the presentation, each attainment plan is just one checkpoint on this ongoing effort to find ways to improve air quality in the San Joaquin Valley. Given our air quality challenges, the district continuously monitors control measures. We look at any technology, new technologies that are available. We look at regulations that are being adopted in other parts of California, other states and beyond, and continually asking ourselves, is this technologically feasible? Is it economically feasible? Would it work for the sources that exist in the valley? Because just because something works in one place doesn't mean it's going to work in another place. So there's a lot of questions and a lot of review that gets involved in doing these analyses. Um, the district actually has best available control measures in place and most stringent measures, and this has been affirmed through EPA actions. Uh, and there were numerous stationary source regulations adopted in recent years. So, so as we're looking for more, it's never with this expectation that there's something specific you're going to find, but it's because you have to keep doing that work. Make sure you didn't miss anything. Make sure you didn't miss an opportunity. Some upcoming areas of focus, and, and I, I list these here not because I necessarily think, oh, there is absolutely a regulation to adopt here. That's not what I'm saying at all. When I say that these are areas of focus, these are things we're going to keep looking to, we're going to keep documenting and evaluating and simply asking the question and showing our work. That's a big part of it. Can we show the work as to whether or not there are control measure opportunities in these categories? And some of the categories that have gotten attention recently and will continue to get attention include ammonia emissions, building electrification, under fire commercial char burling, leak detection and repair that I mentioned a little while ago, and just ongoing stationary and mobile source evaluation. Every time we do a SIP or a maintenance plan or anything else, we're going to keep looking everywhere we can to keep improving public health in the valley. Not just for the table I showed you on slide two. That table is going to be growing because EPA is in the process of reviewing the NACs to look for our, to see if the NACs need to be lowered based on the most recent public health research. So their work is ongoing too. And so for example, um, the Clean Air Act requires EPA to periodically review the NACs based on the most recent health research. Under the Clean Air Act predicted that this would happen every five years. In practice, it takes a little bit longer than that because it is very complicated between all the research and all the commenting that goes on and all the steps that are involved uh, for evaluating those NACs. Uh, EPA is prohibited from considering implementation costs or the difficulty of reaching the standards. Now, they do evaluate uh, the economics of it, but, but really it's about uh, setting a public health level. Uh, real quick to wrap this up, they're currently reviewing the PM 2.5 NACs, and they are expected to review the eight-hour ozone NACs as well. The new standards are going to be even more challenging to address than the current standards. And so all this work that I've been talking about, it will help us as we deal with EPA's upcoming standards as well. So with that, that concludes the presentation. Uh, real quick, uh, just closing um, comments, Mr. Chair, board members. First, I wanted to acknowledge... Um, both the, uh, the chair of CARB, uh, Leanne Randolph, who's here right behind me, and uh, just maybe a round of applause, perhaps, for <laughs> <laughs> And um, Administrator Martha Guzman, who's uh, right over here <laughs> from, uh, from Region 9. Um, I just want to make sure everybody was aware they were here as we, as we talk about both CARB and, and, and EPA. Um, but no, I'm, I'm kidding. No, I just... Uh, <laughs> No, but on a more serious note, uh, it's definitely an honor to, to have them here and um, really appreciate them taking the time to be here as we talk about these difficult issues. Jesse, great job with the presentation. I think I've lost you. I'm not sure where you are anymore. Um, oh, there you are. Um, the, these issues, as I mentioned um, earlier in my introduction, uh, are, are the most complex issues that we deal with. The Clean Air Act is, is ever-evolving. Uh, there is, as Jesse just alluded to, a new PM 2.5 standard looming. The, the CASAC, which is the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee, I think I might have gotten that right. Um, they are actually uh, in the process right now. They've, they've done some initial work. They've posted some, some policy um, documents. And there, there's a lot of indications that the PM 2.5 standard may be uh, made even more stringent than it currently is. So as we think about our current plans and all the work that's, that's ongoing with, with dealing with those mandates, we're already now seeing that there's a, maybe another standard that's looming and maybe with an eye towards that you need to keep really thinking about how we make sure you know that we're, we're best positioned not only for the current standards but also thinking ahead to those standards and just as a reminder for PM 2.5 unlike ozone there are very tight windows 
for developing plans and for attaining the, um, the standards. Unlike ozone, there's a black box potential. There's a little bit of a longer time frame for ozone. For PM2.5, you don't have that, that capability in terms of the way that you write the plan. So it is very challenging. And uh, this is something the board talks very, very often about and just really appreciate Jesse trying to lay that out in as quick of a fashion as possible. We will have an opportunity to engage with both CARB and EPA with a follow-up item to this one. The next item on the agenda, I did want to definitely acknowledge um, the leadership that's here and really appreciate them for that and then turn it over to the board for any, this an educational session, but also any guidance, feedback, ideas that you have great opportunity for that as well to make sure that we're all rowing in the same direction and um, are able to accomplish these very difficult tasks together. Okay, turn back to you, Mr. Chair. Any questions from the board or comments? Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, you know, we've documented, well documented, um, you know, the, the progress that the Air District has made in our uh, areas where we're responsible. Um, yeah, I'm just curious, when we look at um, the federal requirements and, and the areas where they're responsible, um, how are those built into our progression models, or are they, you know, where, you know, emissions issues come into play? How do you, how does, I, I haven't seen the EPA chart that shows the progression that we've had. And, um, you know, I mean, responsibility is responsibility. Um, we're both responsible, and I'm, you know, very. We're, I know we're very grateful to EPA, federal government, for all the funds and, uh, you know, truck replacement programs and things of that nature. But I, that's one thing that I don't think I've seen. Um, we talk about our progression, and you know, <clears throat> we are being held responsible. And uh, just curious, if we have some of those. You kind of talking about real gold goalposts, like, hey, here's the goalpost. Well, you know, I, I mean, we, we have, yeah. you know, we can show our emissions reductions. Yeah. The, the one thing that I, I don't know, and I, I haven't always seen that um, front and center. Yeah, that's a great question, Supervisor. Um, so just in words, I'll describe it, and then there's a little bit of information on slide 13 on that, but it doesn't really fully answer the question that you've raised. Um, so just overall kind of big picture on this, the reductions that are being achieved locally and through CARB's uh, uh, mobile source control program are, are definitely on a much faster pace than what you see established at the national level. Uh, and and w w whether it's trucks and um, it being at least 20 years, I forget the exact year, the last um, heavy duty truck standards were established, that they're going through a process now, EPA is, on, on establishing new standards that's still being, that's actually, um, there's some news on, on a couple of these um, issues that uh, we can talk about today. But generally speaking, uh, we're a lot more nimble at the local level and at the state level. And it's not easy, obviously, to adopt the rules that we do, for CARB to adopt the rules that they do. But because of the way the Clean Air Act is, is written, the SIPs are developed by us and by the state, and there's very little incentive, there's very little uh, uh, actually requirement in the, in the Clean Air Act for, for EPA to do the same thing that we and CARB have to do which is actually quantify all the reductions that you need to meet a standard. EPA has no such obligation um, as far as we can uh, tell, <laughs> although obviously, you know, there's partnership and there's, uh, there are standards that are established over the years, but when it ultimately comes down to it, they receive a, a plan from us, and then based on our own performance at the local and the state level, we'll reach right findings as to whether or not they, they consider that plan to be whole. And if it's not, the sanctions are applied entirely at the local level. They're not applied up you know, to the federal level. Um, and that, that, also, that also goes, by the way, for Title VI. This is another sort of similar aside. It, you know, us and CARB, for example, are subject to Title VI. EPA itself is not. Uh, so there's some, there's some, some interesting kind of nuances there. Uh, so what we continue to do is wh when it comes to, you know, we've got petitions that the board has submitted on issues like trucks and locomotives. Um, we also, uh, with uh, targeted air shed funding, Diesel Emission Reduction Act funding, and other opportunities, we advocate heavily for EPA to provide investments in, in the region and throughout, throughout the state, but in areas like ours, getting priority. And with Inflation uh, Act funding and other opportunities, and you're gonna hear a lot more about this later, we really feel that because the challenge is so great, there needs to be a very delib deliberate or deliberate 
intentionality there with EPA and other federal agencies to bring that funding to our region and actually, you know, quantify those benefits and actually provide us those benefits so that we can then show that, we're, that we have a, a compilation of these reductions across all levels. And what, just last point, the, there's an inflection point on slide 13. Jesse didn't really get, I think she was trying to wrap, wrap it up there at the end, maybe at my urging too. Uh, <laughs> so, but there is a graph on slide 13 where you see basically um, federal mobile source emissions uh, represented in, in yellow, orange. You see the blue being the, the state sort of mobile emissions totals. And you see those dropping rapidly where the federal emissions look pretty flat for the most part. And there's an inflection point so where federal mobile source emissions become greater than this, the state regulated mobile sources. And we're actually there. And so what happens over time is everything from locomotives to off-road equipment to other things become uh, a larger uh, proportional share of total emissions in the valley and really highlights the importance of, of working to reduce those emissions if we're, if we're to have basically approvable plans at the end of the day. And that's, I don't know if that answers fully your question, but that's, that's essentially what's going on there. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. that it, it's just, you know, we have been demonstrating quantifiable numbers and to, to be held to a standard and, and meet our requirements is very difficult without a quantifiable alternate measure um, for those responsible. And, you know, as we go through these approval processes, you know, obviously there's some frustration with that because I think this board takes uh, their responsibilities very seriously and, and uh, you know, the, the collaboration that we need to achieve um, these standards is going to be a team effort and, and I think the more quantifiable numbers that we can get from EPA on how they're going to meet their standards, it, that's the collaborative effort that gets everybody across the line and, and so um, not pointing fingers, just saying that, um, you know, this is a team game and, uh, you know, it would be very helpful to have those numbers and, and, uh, and goals and work as a team to achieve them. Thank you. I'm, you know, if you do want to speak, you can do this, you know, with your card too. So, and I will recognize you in order. Thank you, Dr. Pacheco. <laughs> My short arms here. Yeah. To, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. And, you know, thank you team. Uh, I think, I think it's definitely uh, paying off, I want to say, first off, to have Jess, as, you know, leading this effort and, you know, having a concentrated person. I think it's really helpful for us. So thank you for the work that you've been doing. Um, fantastic. And i um, glad that we, that you, you know, the district moved in that, in that direction. Um, so a couple of things. Um, I think that as, um, you know, like kind of like looking forward, right? How can we how can we be forward looking as as we have this major task ahead that you that you talked about and that I'm sure you know our next presenters are going to talk about as well. Um, I want to also be proactive about looking ahead in terms of the stronger um, standards that are coming. And how can we do that? I mean, I already know that we have so many great partnerships um, with um, our regulated industries. But I also feel like a lot of where we ended up or why we ended up or the issues, even, you know, the Title VI issues that are, you know, who knows how, how that's going to roll out. But I feel like some of that is also tied to land use decisions. And I think that I would like for us to be proactive in maybe having a, a more designated work group thinking through these issues of, you know, air quality, um, as, as we, because there's a lot of different economic development having, happening up and down the San Joaquin Valley. There's a lot of plans. You know, there's everything from like high speed rail to, you know, uh, warehouses to, uh, you know, a possibility of an inland port, right? So there's all these things happening at the same time as, you know, our housing crisis, electrification with the state. I just feel like we need a work group that's that's helping us think ahead in terms of what are the policy challenges because as we're going to need our governmental folks, you know, and we have some obviously here at the table, but I think we need a work group that helps us think through and helps them 
plan through as well so that, you know, we're not sort of hitting them up later, you know, when they come with their permits and, you know, being like, you know, that's a challenge for us to, to do because X, Y, Z, right? I, I feel like we have an opportunity here. Um, we're at a really, really critical point where we now have seen this. I think no one probably has more expertise on how to do this than, than here in the San Joaquin Valley um, because of our experiences. And I just would like us to be more proactive so that when these stronger um, you know, when we get these numbers of what our next target's going to be, we can think more comprehensively as a region with all of our stakeholders on how to do that and what are some of the opportunities that we can have to, to reduce, um, um, you know, to reduce pollution and, and meet those things. And then I just have a really simple question, um, or maybe not so simple. Um, in terms of, you know, you talked about working on the contingency package, um, which I think is excellent. And I just was wondering when, when we should be expecting to hear back about what that looks like as a board. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, Dr. Pacheco, Warner, I, I, your idea on having, you know, work group discussions on, you know, especially in the context of a new plan, you know, I think that's definitely the tradition that we've we followed and, you know, it's only going to get even more important, I think, with that kind of a plan, uh, that the levels that EPA is talking about is probably in the 8 to 10 microgram range is sort of where the conversation is right now. We're at 12 today. And so at that level, um, you start approaching what some might consider, you know, even background levels. And so the, the, the real challenge, I think, is that I think any work group and our staff are certainly going to be engaged in is really understanding the science behind you know, what are, what are all the emission sources? You know, what, what are we looking at in terms of growth, projected growth in the valley, like you're talking about development? And how do we, local, state, and federal level, you know, how do we actually kind of grasp what, what could be a very difficult standard that when it's established, by the way, as Jesse mentioned, you're not looking at feasibility, you're not looking at cost, you're looking strictly at the health science, right? So once it's established, then, then you really start having those conversations around, you know, how do you actually get to these standards? And so, it's going to be very important to have some really good dialogue around, around you know everything from the science to the the, the potential control measures being innovative and and um, thinking about those ideas. Um, I think on the contingency, just a real quick response on that. As Jesse mentioned, also we are under a very tight time frame to try to get um, packages to to uh, package to EPA us and CARB jointly. Um, part of the issue on this has been that we've been trying to figure things out jointly with, with EPA. Um, there is no guidance right now. We think there will be some guidance soon on this, and so we hope it's useful to, to, to helping us kind of get whatever package we pull together kind of across the finish line. Um, but that's kind of part of why, you know, we are where we are. But as Jesse mentioned, early 23 is our anticipated um, return to, to both our board and to the, the CARB board, you know, subsequent to, to us taking some action at the local level. So ahead of that, you'd have to publish a draft you know, have some discussion. So that's probably going to be towards the end of the year to be able to meet the 23 uh, timeframe. Dr. Sheriff. Thank you. How's the volume? Good. Okay, thanks. Um, hey, Jesse, progress. Every time you do this, it actually gets clearer. I don't know about the rest of the board, but I, <laughs> it's more understandable. It's better organized. It's it's complicated, but it's simplified, and I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your outlining the, the progress that we, we, we have indeed made and also reminding us that withdrawing a submission is not halting our commitments nor the progress that we're continuing to make. And again, thanks to the uh, district staff for getting us to this place. Um, it's definitely a better place. Um, thanks to Chair Randolph and to Martha Guzman for joining us for this discussion. Um, great to have you here. Um, as a doctor who's interested in prevention, I, I need to remind us that the NACs are health-driven, and health is sometimes cruel, right? We can't be eating all those wonderful saturated fats that taste so good. You know, there's a terrible price to pay for that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I hope our language about the lower PM 2.5 NAC we talk about it as likely, not as looming. Because um, looming, wait a minute, this is people's health. This, this actually will improve people's health. 
And we can certainly debate the cost, and we're going to struggle with how to do this in the most efficient way. Um, but in terms of emergency room visits for asthmatics, in terms of hospitalizations, in terms of cardiac deaths, you know, this stuff's going to make a difference in people's lives and in individuals' lives. Um, and we may not get thanked for it because nobody thanked me for prevention. Hey, doc, thanks for that uh, colon cancer I never got because you made me go through that horrible test. Um, not many lined up to say that. Um, but it is real to the public. It's real to individuals. Um, as was commented, yeah, a collaborative effort. I guess one of the questions I would raise also in terms of being proactive is, well, how do we push the federal government, not just the EPA? Because in a sense, the EPA is in the middle. The EPA is by law setting standards, uh, but, but they don't, I don't think they control the legislation that uh, sets a bunch of the federal standards that we need. Um, so how can we push um, our elected representatives to, to, to get these things that we need so desperately? Uh, one tiny question and one bigger question. One, in terms of residential wood, remind me what percent of the total PM 2.5 that comes from residential wood burning have we so far eliminated? We talk in half. Um, yeah, I think it'll vary a little bit by county, right, depending on, um, on, on but, but it's somewhere in the probably 60 to 70 percent range, okay. maybe 75 percent range, yeah. All right. So that, that I hate to say it because I love yeah. my warmth of wood, but that, that needs to be on the table, too. Um, a more difficult question, I think. Um, do we have modeling yet that brings the issue of climate change into what's going to happen to the challenges we're facing? Because it's getting hotter. And we know hotter means more ozone. And we know hotter means more secondary PM 2.5. Um, and that would seem to be another I'll call that one a looming challenge um, that we're coming up. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if, you would, if I could take a second to offer a little bit more. Uh, thank you very much for your generosity. Uh, just wanted to uh, provide a little bit more information related to Dr. Sheriff's questions. I think on the federal point that you made, it's a, it's a very important point, and it's part of, obviously, our, our advocacy position to to look not only with EPA but also other federal partners, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of funding, policy, advocacy, we, we do that on, on a regular basis and are, are always interested in looking for new ways to do it as well. And you'll hear a little bit later from um, our federal consultant and some of the things that are going on um, related to part of that advocacy. Um, but I wanted to just acknowledge that and, and also mention that while, while earlier I, I had talked about EPA not necessarily being obligated under the Act to sort of be the the third leg of the stool of putting a plan together, um, but it doesn't stop EPA actually from um, uh, bringing uh, either direct measures or contingency into the process as far as I understand it. So, so the advocacy absolutely is pointed not only at other federal agencies, but EPA definitely has a lot of latitude in terms of what they can do both from a regulatory and from an incentive-based uh, perspective. And so I think the advocacy is always there and I think will always be there as there's always advocacy back, you know, towards us to, to look at different things. And there's a sort of a healthy tension that I think uh, occurs in, in that sort of um, local, state, and federal uh, process. So I just wanted to make sure it was clear, you know, that EPA actually has quite a bit of authority over a lot of what we talk about here. Um, on the residential wood burning question, um, the, I just want to make sure it's clear to, you know, in areas like Fresno, Madera, Kern, and, and even the other counties, we are probably approaching closer to 90 percent, you know, with the hot spot um, type levels. Most of the winter gets curtailed now. The, the, the biggest challenges we have with residential wood burning are, I, I think, twofold. You know, one is, and we'll talk about the public opinion survey uh, a little bit later in the meeting uh, to, to really keep teasing out, you know, where the public um, perceptions and opportunities are. I think that we can keep building on what we're doing because I think residents are accepting this more and more over time. Um, and so the question becomes, you know, that rule is only as effective as you get buy-in from the public, you know, and I think that we've gotten a lot of buy-in over the years that the board has really emphasized this point. 
And I think that there are certainly some opportunities down the road, but it is, it is the most stringent measure already out there and it's been acknowledged as such. The Ninth Circuit Court just even specifically ruled that we have the most stringent measure anywhere in the country. And so we, it, even within that, we keep looking for, for opportunities. Um, and not just from a regulatory, but also from incentive and educational kind of an approach. And it's actually on the table, we are talking about that. Uh, we just talked about that with the board recently and are actually looking at different opportunities there. On the climate side, um, I do think that guidance will continue to be developed on, so currently it's not uh, an official part of you know, the state and our modeling on, on, on this. I think as there's better understanding and more predictability to, to those different factors, I, I, down the road, I, I would imagine that that's going to be probably an, an important element of you know, pulling plans together. Um, but currently, as it, as it stands, um, you know, it's, it's really conservative. And, and you may recall, we didn't go through the whole modeling discussion of a plan, you know, but what base year you pick, what sort of meteorological conditions you pick. We generally plan for worst case conditions under these um, state implementation plans that are developed, which is why there's so much reductions that are you know, generally needed with those models. So, um, you know, within that already very conservative regime, you know, are there opportunities to your point that is something that I'm sure will continue being discussed and evaluated. But just to be clear on that, it's, it's not a specific sort of element of, of, um, of the implementation rules that are put forth by EPA and the pest and carb um, follow. And but I think it's coming. Right back to you, Mr. Chair. There's nobody else. I'm going to go for public comment. Okay. Well, Manuel knows. He understands the rules, so, yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Samir, staff, board, buddy. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge um, if any of you want horse riding, we certainly can make arrangements. We, uh, we can put uh, non-saddle, of course, because that's how it really is. But we can handle that. We have Clydesdales, and we have ponies. So uh, we can make it work for you, okay? But again, I want to thank Samir, all the work your staff has done to do these retreats, staff, educational trainings, discussion groups, whatever you want to call it, but they're valuable. Um, I'm going to give a handout, and if I can have assistance, maybe if you could pass it to the board members, please. But first, I want to acknowledge what Jesse Farrell has said about the SIP requirements. I want to first thank this board from the beginning, the board members, 1992, 93, and so on. You allowed your staff to open up communications with the most important partner, and that's business. You made sure that business was here because if business is gone, we drive them out, there's no jobs. Now, what does that do to the rural community? Los Angeles? San Francisco, they can care less. But the Selma, Mendota, Del Rey, Orange Cove, Orosi, those are the heart of the communities. And those are the heart of the communities, Gonzales, King City, that produce the food for this nation, for this world, and the most safest food. But the thing you did, Samir, from the beginning, you were a little kid. You were, uh, <laughs> You're a little kid at that time, in 90. Uh, uh, but you allowed the staff to outreach a public process of communications with industry on how these rules work. How can we get to what the achievements see the Sierra Nevadas just about every day now, see the coastal range every day now. And that, thanks, goes to all of the businesses, what oil has done, what construction has done, even what agriculture has done. This board did the greatest achievement on ag burn, a very tough rule, one of the most toughest rules you've had. But if it wasn't for Chair Randolph and your team, Richard Corey, Michael Benjamin, Lucina, Michelle, all of those staff communicating with the ag industry of what works for us, what can we do without putting the farmers out of business. The biggest challenge this lady has right now is going to be Sigma. How does Sigma affect what we do in this valley? On the east side, but the biggest impact will be the west side. 500,000 to a million acres 
will be out. Maybe some people from the environmental side may say, that's great. That's fine where you're going to get your food from. But here's the issue that she is going to face with that rule. The definitions. State rules, state water board versus federal EPA. ARB's rules. The district rule. But the key of that is the state water board. They're the ones that adopted Sigma. A very tough situation that we're going to deal with because of farmland that's not going to be farmed and how do we deal with it. The question was, we're going to grow barley on it for wheat. No, you can't. If it's in a wide area, you're going to be penalized if you take the rain and you grow barley. You've taken rain from Mother Nature that's going to fill the ground and grow a plant. You're going to be penalized. That's going to be a challenge. But the thing I will say before I got on the other item, you've had a tremendous open communications. Dr. Randolph, you and your team, the door has been open from day one of 1992 under Jan Sharples when we did the research on, on the seacoast and the SARMAC and all that. You've allowed agriculture to sit down. You've allowed oil to sit down. You've allowed other industries to sit down and work through the regulation of what is feasible. And if it wasn't for the board, you've allowed that process. We don't want Los Banos to lose all of its businesses because then what do we have? We have a population that's going to go where? And that's their home. They have that right. Amazon is not the key. Amazon, you can't eat a computer chip. Today, everybody had a great lunch. And where did it come from? It came from the farmers, the ranchers, the people that all of you that have been working with. And, buddy, I would be proud of being a chair of what you've done for years. But the guidance that this board has allowed Samir and Syed and others, Dave Crow and others, to work with industry. Because if you don't work with industry, then how in the heck do you know what you're going to do to me? And yes, we've got to worry about the future. There's no doubt about that. But it's a very, very dangerous situation when you play with food and you buy it from another country. What does that look like? Pretty dangerous. We have a very safe food supply. But again, this board and this staff, and I commend Todd, Aaron, Ryan, Shiraz, Todd, Jesse, Jamie, all of you have had the door open to us to work and communicate and try to get things done in a positive, like you did with the ag burn. It would have never happened if this staff would have not opened up to us with Richard Corey and figure out a solution rather than telling the staff, don't communicate. We're going to do this the way we want to do it. Yeah. We're, get, we're about out of time, Daniel. <laughs> but thank you very okay. much. Um, you have a document before you as I walk away that is from the Farm Tractor Program from NRCS. Please read it because agriculture does get SIP credit from NRCS's program. Somebody said that we did not. I've got a document that you all have. Please read it. And again, I want to thank this board very, very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else? So, actually, something that I think would be very interesting and kind of going into Dr. Sheriff's comment. Hey, Kevin, could you just announce your, yourself to you, Mike? Who, who, who are you? Uh, <laughs> let me look at my wallet. Kevin Abernathy with uh, Milk Producers Thanks. Council and Dairy Cares and also the chair of uh, CAGI, Citizens Advisory Group of Industry, and former chair of CAC. So, with that... On the graphs that you showed of the progress that we've made over the years of, of the Central Valley itself, 
I think it would be interesting to kind of include your comment of climate change and drought and more, more specifically what those maps actually look like before the wildfires and after the wildfires. And I tie that into a conversation because Samir knows I'm going to make this comment. It's called exceptional events. We have got to get EPA to acknowledge the fact that due to climate change and wildfires that we have exceptional events. And to not get credit for that in our SIP is absolutely ludicrous because we are meeting the standards in most cases until you add those exceptional events into the equation. So it would be very interesting to see the maps pre and post. That was my only comment. Okay, with that, I think we're going to conclude and move to the next item. So we're moving on to item number eight. So I would invite Administrator Guzman and Chair Randolph up to join us. There's a couple of spots up here. And um, we just talked quite a bit about a lot of Clean Air Act issues, but I know there's other things that are also going on <laughs> at EPA Region 9 and CARB. And so there really isn't a formal, um, as they get settled here, uh, there really isn't a formal agenda for this item. We do have some time um, for, for both uh, Chairman Randolph and for uh, Administrator Guzman to share basically updates as to what's going on at EPA and, and CARB. Obviously, we just talked a lot about uh, a lot of planning issues and some of the upcoming work between the different agencies that I'm sure they're going to want to hit on, but also any other, any other updates, um, you know, words of advice. We don't have a formal agenda for the item, and obviously eager and really, really grateful and really honored to have both of you here to exchange with our board as we have so much of a, you know, shared stake on, on these issues, work so closely together on, on so much in implementing the Act and other, other initiatives. So with that, I will turn it over to, um, I'm not sure, uh, where should we uh, start? Should we start uh, with uh, Administrator Guzman? All right, thank you. Uh, okay, there we go, green button. Well, first I want to congratulate you on uh, the most uh, clearest day of the year <laughs> and making it rain this week. So thank the Lord for the rain. Um, and uh, thank you all for having me here today to share some of the progress and to hear some of the uh, feedback like we just heard and have a little dialogue. That's definitely what I'm here for. And some of the ideas have been talked about. Um, one is just to start by saying that I certainly, I just want to acknowledge, uh, as um, Dr. Sheriff said, the progress that has been made that Jesse outlined so well. And within all the circumstances that are faced, uh, of course, the unique geographic constraints of the valley that everyone is aware of, um, as was just mentioned about the enormous amount of wildfires um, that we've been dealing with over the last decade, really. And, and of course, uh, the lack of federal action that um, I'm sure we're going to dialogue even more about. I want to commend you on the progress of the 18 measures that you've taken that were part of the integrated plan, as Jesse said, that you've continued to move forward on. It's incredibly impressive. It's, it's at a pace of change that I think is new, uh, new history, and that your leadership has made that happen. So I want to thank you for that. Um, as somebody who grew up in the Sacramento Valley uh, with the uh, rice burns, grew up, you know, we kind of just knew what time of year it was. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Sacramento phased that out. I want to particularly acknowledge um, the phase out of the ag burn. And I had the privilege of being with your chair last week in Modesto for an electric uh, bus event at the Modesto City Schools where he shared his uh, personal um, investments and his commitment to that particular strategy. So. It was really incredible to hear that, honestly. It's, it's uh, something that I think our, our generation has really made a change on. And it takes a tremendous amount of partnership uh, like those that Manny mentioned. 
So congratulations. All right, so on to the federal contribution or lack thereof. <laughs> uh, well, uh, let me give a little bit of update and a very exciting announcement. So on the federal side, of course, uh, with this administration, there has been a commitment from the president down on his first 100-day uh, actions on taking, taking responsibility for the federal side here, beginning with the heavy-duty truck rule, which we plan to issue by the end, finalize by the end of this year for the NOx side. And somebody mentioned this already, but it wasn't since 2001 was the last time we looked at criteria pollutions from heavy-duty trucks. So it's a term, too long of a time. So that is the most exciting rule. I think we could all recognize it will make the most amount of contribution to emission reductions throughout the states, uh, but particularly here in the Valley. We're also, as part of that overall plan, which we refer to as a clean trucks plan, is a light duty and medium duty uh, commercial vehicles beginning with model year 2027. And we're also going to issue a GHG heavy duty vehicle standards for model year 27, hopefully by the end of the next summer. And then beyond that for model years 30 and beyond, uh, hopefully by the end of next year. And so all of these different um, regulatory uh, actions need to be finalized and they're staggered, as I said, but they will all be finalized by July of 2024. And, of course, uh, much of that action, in, including the heavy-duty action, was through the leadership of CARB and you, the district, in doing many things and, and petitioning us as one of those. And, of course, I want to acknowledge the leadership as well of Senator Padilla, who requested a working group, and uh, we... You probably were already briefed on this by uh, Samir and others, but for over six months, CARB, South Coast, Bay Area, and, all, and San Joaquin met to discuss all of the efforts that we can work together on and particularly focus on the national standards. We talked a lot about the contingency measures issues, but also uh, two others, federal funding and locomotives. And so very excited to present... Uh, a copy for you, Madam Chair, and for you, Samir, um, our response to your petition. And let me just uh, read a little bit here because the two actions are, are, and it's literally, I think we're posting it right now on the website. So, um, and this is in response to your request for us to take federal action on locomotives. And I'll just say personally for those of you who haven't seen Samir or Chair Randolph in action, um, it was very impressive, and I know that that advocacy led to uh, this, um, this announcement. So what, it's two commitments, two very large commitments, that essentially set the, the framework and the foundation for rulemaking on this area. So EPA has formed a team to evaluate how best to address air, pollution, air pollutant emissions from the locomotive sector. This team will develop a set of options and recommendations for possible EPA regulatory actions addressing new locomotives and new locomotive engines. And it says a little bit more here, but essentially it's a first step to rulemaking on those engines. And secondly, we also intend to undertake a notice and comment rulemaking to consider, reconsider our existing locomotive preemption regulations to ensure they don't inappropriately limit California's and other states' authorities under the Clean Air Act, which, of course, will help CARB's uh, pending actions. So congratulations on your efforts, and I am very excited that we're finally going to take action on locomotives. Okay, less exciting is we have um, some guidance on contingency measures that will be coming out for a comment, um, and I think that we're looking hopefully before the end of the year on that. And then on to um, investments. So, of course, as you know, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, the American Rescue Plan, and now Inflation Reduction Act, 
the largest investment in air quality and greenhouse gas reductions that has ever passed in our nation. We're very excited about the opportunities that will be afforded to the Valley. Um, we have traditionally, through things like electric trucks, tier four locomotives, agricultural tractors, residential wood stoves, we've funded over 10,000 of those in the Valley, uh, have had over $100 million invested in the Valley uh, in the last 10 years. But really, those numbers are so small now compared to the numbers we're talking about from the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. As I mentioned last week, I was with Vito and Modesto where we announced the funding of uh, federal funding for eight of the electric uh, school buses there. Um, but that is a nationally a $5 billion program for clean buses. And of course, before that, the American Rescue Plan had a tremendous amount of monitoring funds. 375,000 of that went to the Central California Asthma Collaborative for school-based monitoring and 185,000 for uh, monitoring equipment throughout the Valley. But more importantly, the Inflation Reduction Act, and I'm just gonna read some of these larger pots of funding because they are in the process of uh, being developed on how they will be even competed for. And I know uh, that uh, you have already provided some input to this and we will, this is a partnering opportunity of how we can jointly propose the best use of these funds for the benefit of the Valley. Um, 27 billion for the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Tonight is one of the listening sessions, uh, but we are in, like I said, in the process of developing these strategies. That is the largest of the funds in the Inflation Reduction Act. There's a total of 41.5 billion. There's 3 billion in environmental justice grants. There's another uh, 3 billion in uh, ports funding, and we will talk about the opportunities even there. Uh, but the largest is the 27 uh, billion in uh, greenhouse gas reduction fund. And there is also uh, a heavy duty truck fund. Okay, so I know we'll, we'll get into, I think Jesse really summarized well the, um, the elements of, the, uh, uh, of what we need to really work together on with the 2012 PM 2.5 plan to get to an approval. And of course, as was mentioned, some of the new elements and want to really acknowledge that uh, it is new for all of us, in particular the Title V guidance that will be forthcoming. Um, and that it is not, I don't, I don't personally, nor have I said to anybody that the withdrawal is anywhere a step back, but an opportunity to partner with more time. So I look forward to that. And I know there were uh, quite a few issues that were raised um, that we can get into with the dialogue because I do want to address some of those and how we're, we plan to work through them uh, like the NRCS tractor rule. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me here. I'm really happy to be here to share um, some of the work we're doing at CARB. First of all, I want to thank uh, Martha for delivering the, the letter from EPA. Um, their commitment to move forward with uh, regulating locomotives and in particular that preemption issue that allows dirty locomotives to stay on the tracks for far too long and precludes our ability to step in and address them. The fact that EPA is committed to taking a look at that uh, regulation is so critical and so important. So thank you very much for, um, for bringing that um, commitment here today. Um, so we are in the midst of a really critical year um, at CARB. We are taking uh, a action that's really going to set the stage for decades of work. Um, we've been establishing critical regulations to drive um, the transition to zero emission cars and trucks. We are setting our strategy to meet the 70 PPB 2037 ozone standard. Um, which contains a suite of actions that are going to be critical for um, achieving that standard. And we are developing the state's, or updating the state's climate action plan to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045 or sooner. Um, and we know that it's absolutely critical for us to help deliver cleaner air for the San Joaquin Valley. 
And our mobile source reduction strategy is really aimed at providing those critical emissions reductions for the Valley. So our continued partnership in this area is so critical. Um, and I want to highlight, um, as, uh, as Martha mentioned and others have mentioned, the important partnership with, um, with uh, people in the Valley, community in the Valley, with agriculture, with industry. Um, as I think about the work with agriculture, the farmer program has invested over $240 million in implemented projects. That equates to 3,400 tractors and 2,500 UTVs, which represent an example of the push to decarbonize wherever possible. And, it, and it's a real strategy that, that um, farmers have really grabbed a hold of, which is, which is so great to see. And of course, the ag burning phase out um, is so critical. Um, it's just another area of partnership of working together, um, working to eliminate um, the open burning of waste by January 1st, 2025. And a critical piece of that has been the $180 million of state funding um, that we all work together to obtain to really make this transition. Um, and um, the establishment of the California Clean Biomass Collaborative to identify and evaluate alternatives to agriculture burning also provides a key forum for partnership as well. Um, and of course, state implementation plans. We've been working closely with the district um, to develop the SIP strategy for the 70 PPB standard. Um, and we continue to work together to reduce emissions from both CARB and district sources. Our recently adopted 2022 state SIP strategy outlines the drive to zero through new regulations and new measures. Um, light duty vehicles, of course, is a critical area we are continuing to achieve emissions reductions. Um, we adopted our advanced clean cars two regulation in August um, that lays out a step-by-step -step path to get to 100% uh, zero emission new light duty sales by 2035. Um, and that's really going to be need to be a key area of partnership, right? I mean, there's going to be a lot of challenges in terms of getting the infrastructure we need deployed, um, helping individuals uh, get access to these vehicles, bringing down those price points, um, and we're all going to be working together uh, to get that done. Cleaning up the medium and heavy duty sector is the next step. Um, we are building on the action that the board took in 2020 in advanced clean trucks, um, which is a first in the nation uh, zero emission manufacturing regulation. Um, we're building on that in our advanced clean fleets regulation. The board considered the first, um, had its first meeting to consider that rule uh, last week, the week before. Um, it was a very long hearing, lots of, lots of thoughts uh, along the way. Um, and again, another example where infrastructure is going to be really important, where um, uh, financial support from both federal and state government is going to be really important. Um, and so we are looking forward to uh, having our second hearing on that rule and adopting it in um, spring of next year. Um, so uh, we have a lot of uh, work and collaboration to do together. Um, as we have talked about already, um, we, we do need to um, address the 2012 SIP and how we can, uh, 2012 standard, the SIP for the 2012 standard, and how we can really work together um, to um, revise that SIP and, and uh, come up with a document that is approvable um, and as others have mentioned, that does not mean we are going to stop uh, implementing all the measures that have already been identified. We are still working hard on all of those. Um, so pleased with the partnership between CARB and the district um, and working with the EPA to come up with um, an approvable SIP. Lastly, um, I will mention um, the AB 617 program. As you all know, there are several communities here in the Valley that are part of AB 617. Um, and we are continuing, to, continuing to, to work on how we can really make that program very effective given um, the challenge of limited funding, 
um, and the challenge of, you know, each each community that gets approved sort of expands the, the, the universe of work we need to do, but the pie is not necessarily expanding. So how can we make that program effective in ways that we can um, build on strategies that have been developed as part of community emissions reductions programs and spread those benefits to communities that aren't necessarily selected as AB 617 communities? And how can we, um, as we are moving forward to updating the blueprint um, that, that guides the uh, community air protection program, what are some of the things we can think about in developing that blueprint and um, updating it and the strategies that will continue to make the AB 617 program effective? Um, lastly, uh, I just want to really highlight the incredible work that the governor and the legislature have done to bring um, funding to a lot of this work in the, in the state budget this year, really leaning into um, bringing our zero emission commitments to life, funding school buses, funding um, light duty vehicles, funding infrastructure to the tune of $10 billion. Um, so all of this work um, can really support making the transitions we need to make. And um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to share what we are doing and to have some dialogue about some of the challenges and issues you all are working on. And uh, thanks for having me. Questions from the board? Statements from the board? <laughs> Go ahead. You know, thank you so much um, to both of you for coming. I think that um, you know this is this is a really big um, step, and I just I really want to commend um, Samir um, and obviously you know ch the chair uh, Chair Randolph, but you know in in our context Samir for um, you know your ongoing and persistent advocacy at the federal level um, and. And willing to dialogue and 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 willing to just continue to be, um, you know, continue to try to solve the problems, um, because there could be so many other non-productive ways that we could deal with these issues that that are before us that would not yield cleaner air for us or for our children. And you continuing to stay in the dialogue is, you know, is what's going to pay off for us and in the end to continue to breathe cleaner air every day. And so I really thank you for that piece. Um, and um, Administrator, I know that um, there are a lot of um, programs and, and things that, that, you know, you mentioned the school buses that are, you know, that partnership. Um, can you speak to us a little bit more to those that maybe, you know, we have supervisors, you know, council members and the public, you know, what are some other things happening at the region that um, will also, you know, benefit us um, that we, that I'm sure we'd love to know about. Thank you, Tanya. Yes, the, um, the oldest program now relative to these three acts is the school bus program, which is very new. But um, there, I'll talk about two of the pots that are well, let me talk about three. There's the heavy duty pot, um, the uh, ports pot, which is going to be, I think, going to need some continued advocacy because it's very targeted to ocean ports. Um, but it does include the possibility for uh, corridors and uh, certainly the San Joaquin is that. And um, the $27 billion has uh, certain um, pillars. So, for example, there's a decarbonization one. And by the way, my a couple of my staff are here that might know the details. Meredith, Sarah, okay, and Sarah Sharp. You guys probably remember Sarah. She's my chief here, based out of Fresno. But I don't know all the big numbers. So that 27 billion is what's still being figured out in terms of how how it's going to be competed because it will be competed. But um, of the ports funding, for example, I think it's something like 755 of that, about a third of it needs to go to non-attainment areas. 
So that's an advantage for California um, and, and, and an opportunity. I think the bigger, the big piece here is that uh, how we can partner and what strategies you think are the best for you to be competitive. For example, non-attainment being a, a set aside or a prioritization, that's already, I think, on you know, the front line of our recommendations. And the question is really beyond that, you know, or what exactly are we asking for? Are we asking for half of the funding to go to non-attainment areas, 100% of it? Um, we have great precedent in California with the prioritization to disadvantaged communities where that's kind of built in already. Uh, so that's, that's really the, the opportunity for partnership is to really, in this next three months, to be really uh, communicative about how we want to both be pushing for the same um, recommendations to our folks in headquarters about how to prioritize those funds. And, and as Leanne mentioned, California has arguably even more funding available to the Valley. And I know that Leanne has already been advocating for some of those funds to equally be prioritized for non-attainment areas. And we've, we've certainly joined her with that advocacy. But that's an, that is another huge opportunity. Real quick, um, on that same note, well, first, just thank you, um, uh, Martha, for the uh, hand delivering the uh, response. I mean, that, just a reminder, that was 2016, I believe, that we um, submitted that uh, petition. CARB also, um, I think us and CARB were the only ones on rail, uh, on locomotives. And uh, there's actually a huge announcement for, for EPA to, to commit to looking at that and trying to support the, the regulatory framework. So. As, as a board here who's been working on this for a long time, definitely can just extend a lot of appreciation for that. One of the things that's really um, refreshing to hear um, and seeing Meredith here and um, knowing that there's a lot of, that Region 9 has a long history of working with us to come up with creative ways to prioritize non-attainment areas in the context of funding. Targeted Airshed is, is a big example of that. You know, we do really well in that program because of the projects, but also because we worked closely together to make sure when they wrote the guidelines that there was a lot of, of um, weight to give into areas that needed the funding the most. And now you've got this level of funding that's many orders of magnitude greater than, than, than those programs ever were. And so I think your comments around basically continuing that advocacy, I think, at Region 9 to, to develop the programs in a manner where, you know, it does funnel over into areas that need the funding the most. I think that's, that's a major opportunity. And I just wanted to to just let you know that we really appreciate that ongoing advocacy. It's going to be critical within, you know, EPA is national. There's a lot of other states, a lot of other folks that are probably going to be, you know, clamoring for some of these funds. So um, there isn't a more challenged area, as you all know, that, uh, that needs the funding the most. I just wanted to, that's an ongoing priority. I know there's an open request for comments on a couple of key programs right now, not only with EPA, but also with USDA. So we do intend on continuing to submit feedback on the importance of, of those uh, priorities coming our way. But whatever you can keep doing at, at Region 9, um, and obviously CARB is, is, is there with us as well, um, that, that's really critical, I think, within EPA for that message to also resonate. And I think that can yield, you know, hopefully a lot of return back. So um, we're going to be talking later about a lot of the opportunities, um, you know, that ex actually exist in the Valley for spending those funds. So I think it, you know, we would definitely want to couple the funding with what is a lot of innovation that's happening here in, in the region. And, um, this is actually the, I think the first time in our history as a board that we've actually had um, the heads of both CARB and EPA in person interacting with our board. So I also just wanted to, I also wanted to make sure that was recognized. It's really unique. We really appreciate you. Yeah, so. No, no. <laughs> Vice Mayor Fugazi. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I, I picked up on that as well and wanted to point that out and tell you how much I appreciate, we all appreciate you both being here. Uh, my grandmother always said, many hands make for light work. And knowing that we're not alone, this board is not alone, the work that we've been doing, coupled with the work that you guys are doing, is what's really going to help our communities. Here in the Central Valley, I mean, we literally feed the world here. 
and we have some of the most disadvantaged communities. And to think about meeting what's being asked of us by 2035 in my community when we don't have that infrastructure in place and asking people that, you know, this is what we are, are charged to do, no pun intended or pun intended. But the fact is that, that without your partnership working with us, we won't get there. And I don't want people out there thinking it's not that we don't want to, but we have to have this partnership. We have to work with each other in order to get there. So thank you so much uh, uh, for being here. Um, uh, you know, as Samir pointed out, it's my, my last meeting, and I just am glad to be here to witness it. And knowing that the work I've done on rail, too, with being able to get those locomotives and my school district that's been able to get the buses as well, I mean, it, it is promising to know that we're going to be able to do this as we move forward together. So thank you. Nobody else? Go ahead. You can flip your card up. <laughs> I, I let her off the hook because she, she's shorter than everybody else. <laughs> Uh, SB 617 was mentioned, and I just wanted to highlight uh, the, the leadership from this district and Samir and this board uh, to really make that a successful oversubscribed program. Uh, the challenges have been immense. It's a very different way of doing, doing our work, uh, but I think everybody's seen it's a very productive and good way to go about doing it. So I hope, I hope there will be more funding in the future. Uh, but again, saluting this staff for the work they've done to, uh, on the ground, and uh, particularly Samir and this board again for supporting that, that work. Thank you. Supervisor Peterson. Okay. Love Fest is over. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, uh, it's interesting to hear that, you know, EPA is considering, once again, um, lowering the standards. And, and we get that from the health standard, but um, as I think has been mentioned here before, there are determinants of health, and one of those is having, uh, being gainfully employed. When I look at, um, you know, what's occurred, I, I, and I look around the board, you know, me and Buddy, um, I've been here for eight years. This is my last year, and... and uh, um, you know, the, the blood, sweat, and tears that's went into the, the process of making sure that, um, you know, we're fair and that we don't weight um, any one segment of the population with regulatory um, burdens. And as you consider, you know, lowering, lowering the standards, um, when you look around California, um, I see a member of our food and ag, uh, Don Cameron back there, um, I see a transition, um, you know, in the agricultural industry. The, you know, the um, glorification of, of the family farmer is gone. And I, I give you all the credit um, on trying to create equity within agriculture and, and ownership, but quite frankly, it can't survive the death of a thousand cuts is is drowning um, the agricultural economy in California. When I see, and I, I stand before you as someone that was a third generation farmer that saw no way to comply with all of the regulatory requirements and ever continue to exist to feed this country, by the way. So you look at the standard, you look at the thousand cuts, the, the industries that are carrying the burdens of um, all of the regulatory environments, not just EPAs. And I'm just curious how you weigh that in to the decision-making process because, you know, again, you, you know, the glorification of the family farmer, the, the company that bought meat farms, farms 35,000 acres. There is no way. They have 10 staff attorneys. They, it's the only way that they, they can survive. The small farmer cannot survive, and they're leaving in droves. So 
you know, I'm just wondering how you weigh the impact of once again lowering the standard and coming back to the industries that have carried these burdens. And now the burdens are so much greater. You know, I mean, we're talking about the electrification. Well, there is no electrification yet for tractors. I mean, they're working on it, but it's, it's quite a ways off. Um, you know, Don's a cotton farmer. The average uh, cotton picker today is almost a million dollars. A small farmer can't, he can't do it. So, you know, I just encourage you to, to be open and listen to the, 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 I think, the travesty that's occurring uh, with those that, you know, provide one-third of the food that's consumed in this nation on a daily basis. And I do this as someone that comes this board with, you know, a love of agriculture and, and it had to leave my life because I, I didn't see a future. So I don't know any comments you have. Well, maybe I'll take a first crack, as I see you're referring to the potential lowering of the PM standard. And, um, of course, um, we have a structure where that is happening mostly out of our headquarters office on the rulemaking side, similar to this, um, to this locomotive decision. And... Um, my role in this uh, regional role is to provide a greater voice to the people in my region. And uh, certainly across all the rulemakings, but we do get more attention when it comes to air decisions because of our greater impact and in, both, in both senses, the economic transition that implicates and the health that that implicates. You know, I... Um, I often tell some of the staff or if I'm talking to young people about valuing their lived experiences. And of course, you as a board, that's the function that you serve, your own personal lived experiences and your representative experience as elected officials, many of you, to provide us that input. And I, I certainly have my own, and I do have my own in agriculture. I was very fortunate to um, have my master's in agricultural economics at Davis. I also worked for uh, five years for the United Farm Workers, and I worked on a farm for three years. And ironically, when I was working at a farm, we had um, to stop taking our, um, we, we took water from a stream and store it on farm. We had a little storage um, on farm, and we had to stop taking it for three years because of a concern with uh, coho because it was a coastal farm. And so, um, you know, I appreciate the decisions that we make have a larger, large, immense impact on people's lives, on sectors in our economy. And I think part of the commitment when this administration talks about equity is about making sure it's not regressive. And that's a hard thing to do. And, but I also think that's why we're seeing things come on the manufacturers. We want the mandate on the manufacturers, not the users. That's, an, that's a strategy to make sure these regulations are progressive. We want to see more investments and incentives as coupled with that regulation. You know, on the, on the side of the PM, I think, of course, the largest sector will be the transportation sector, and looking at how that imp impacts agriculture is a big part of that for uh, this state and, and for um, particularly this state. But other, other states have some districts that also have a large impact, a couple of districts in Arizona, for example. Um, but it is, it's something, of course, that, that we are, that I see as my direct role but structurally in headquarters, we also have an ag advisor, and I know that he spends a lot of time um, on these very issues as well. Um, and I'll, ju I'll just say um, a couple things. You articulated why I'm here today and why well, every time I come to the Valley, because unlike Martha, I don't have... Uh, experience in um, in the agriculture um, uh, world. And so I've spent the last 10, 11 years since I've been working uh, in state government, 
you know, trying to go out to other parts of the state and understand the challenges that folks have. Um, and so it's really important to me um, to go out and, and actually talk to people about, okay, you know, here's, you want me to have, um, uh, you know, an electric water pump instead of a diesel pump, but I can't get my electric pump interconnected because, you know, PG&E is like blowing me off. I mean, like these, this is the kind of information that we need to understand. Um, and at the same time, like Martha said, I mean, one of the ways we think about it is anytime we're doing this regulatory work, we're thinking about where is that burden? Um, who's going to bear the cost? Um, and how do we, you know, kind of have that cost borne more by the manufacturer rather than, than, than the user? Or is there financially a way we can support that transition through um, incentive fundings, incentive funding? Um, but also kind of at the end of the day, it's like, as, as Dr. Sheriffs mentioned, at the end of the day, it's, a, it's about public health and it's about climate change, which is circling around and having an impact, you know, in the same manner that, um, that regulations may have in the short term. Because as you look at our challenges with water, you look at our challenges with wildfire, I mean, these are direct um, uh, impacts that are getting exacerbated by climate change. And so trying to understand, can we um, address those challenges in a way that um, has less of an impact on the folks that are going to be subject to this, to these regulations. And um, so we think about it all the time um, and we try to do the best we can. Um, but the most important thing I think for us is to, is to, to get out there and to listen and to understand what the challenges are so then we can pick up the phone and, and say to some of our fellow regulators or other agencies, hey, we're seeing a problem over here. Let's work together and find a solution. Um, so that is something I try to, to spend um, as much time as I can on um, in the hopes that we can make all of this work and both protect public health and mitigate climate change and maintain a strong economy in all parts of the state. Because we know that there are some parts of the state that are benefiting more than others. And, and uh, really trying to understand what the challenges are in the, in the parts of the state that um, uh, are having a, a bit of a harder time really reaping the benefits of the fact that we are the fourth largest economy in the world. Um, so. One more thing to that, just to um, reinforce that I think unlike other sectors, like the oil and gas sector, agriculture is not going away. We want agriculture to stay in this state, and it will naturally. It's one of the few Mediterranean climates of the world. And so the way to, it's not, a, it's not like a sector where we're having to manage a phase out. Well, the hands really we had to face off. It's a sector where we're transitioning to different tools, and we're probably going to transition to different crops that are not as water dependent. You know, all, all these other transitions that you talked about. So it is a it is a necessary affirmation to make that distinction, which is we we are a state where agriculture will always be foundational to our economy and our society and our culture, and we need to figure out how to help it become more climate resilient for, our, for the benefit of all of us. And that's a really different thing, uh, unfortunately, than, than some of our other sectors. Yeah. Or fortunately for agriculture. Yeah. I'm going to ask for, oh, go ahead. I was going to ask for public comment, but Thank you for putting your sign up. You're next. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fairly new to this board, uh, kind of a city girl, moved to the country. Um, but I do have a heart for our farmers. And I hear from our farmers in, in the Los Banos area how uh, they find it difficult to keep up with all the regulation changes that go on. Um, when I, when I heard 
You mentioned that it had been since 1991 that the EPA uh, had not made any regulatory changes to the commercial truck uh, industry. And now, 2001? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, well, that's still like 20 some years. So what happens, I, I'll give you an example. In, in my city, they hadn't raised the water bill for quite a, quite a bit of, uh, a long time. And then all of a sudden, after some financial investigation, we had this massive raise in water bills, and you had your seniors on fixed income, you had people coming out very disgusted, and the city had to learn a hard lesson that you needed to make these changes incremental. And, and I think that's where I kind of draw the line on a lot of uh, the green, the climate change stuff, is that when we reach these goals, then there's always another one just like sitting on the cliff to throw out there and reach again. Rather than, you know, in my opinion, using a little bit of logic to do incremental changes so that it benefits everyone, not only the farmer, also the environmentalists who are concerned about the environment, but the consumers out there who pay the bigger price for all of this. Because people who manufacture things and um, have commodities that have to be purchased, they're not going to eat the burden of what state, federal government is imposing on them to make a change to something so that, you know, there's a benefit down the line. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I feel like a lot of it has been burdensome on, on some farmers. I, I hear from dairy farmers, I hear from agriculture producing farmers, and so they're, they're pretty, pretty disgusted at this particular time. And when I talk about some of the incentives that are out there to help them, they don't even want to hear it because they're so disgusted. So um, I, I guess for me, as just an everyday, average, ordinary person, um, we've always tried to work things out in this country where we work together and to try to do things incrementally. I don't, I don't want to eat food from some other country. I want to eat it from the United States. And all the other things that we can produce here and be our own self-surviving economic country. So uh, I know that these uh, regulations are going to come about and we'll deal with them as we go. But I think we would all benefit from it if, if it could be a, a, in a step uh, incremental process. Because this valley has done a lot. And I, I've talked to Samir, you know, you go to the Bay Area, there are cars all over the place. And, and when that wind blows, it blows from the west to the east. And we get whatever's over there into the valley. And we have to deal with whatever the Bay Area or other areas impose. And I think probably from Bakersfield, they may get stuff coming, you know, from the LA area. So we're in this basin where we get stuck with a lot of things that we are working hard as a San Joaquin um, Air Board to mitigate based on EPA and based on CARBs and what they want to do. So um, I, I appreciate your job, but I want to see our farmers live. And, and the small farmers, when they produce something, it's a conglomeration to, you know, make something big happen like the raisin farmers. We have a lot of small raisin farmers, as I understand, in the valley. And what, they, what they're able to raise goes to the bigger companies. So bigger companies are going to have to help them be able to accomplish some of the regulations that are coming down on them that they can't afford to do on their own. So I, I truly believe that it's a collaborative thing. It can't just be one, you know, one agency or another agency coming down hard. Uh, we have to work together. And the concerns of, of the farmers out there expressing what is affecting them, I, I really don't think it takes, you know, like 10, 15 years to get it done. With, with, with the uh, level of, uh, uh, what is it, um, trying to say here, technology we have in our country, it, it, it could be done a lot faster than what it's, it, the way it's been going of lately. So um, I give our board a lot of
kudos for the short time that I've been on here and trying to understand how this process works of what they've done and the money that's come in to help this valley, to help our farmers, and to help consumers with the things that, need, that they need help with, to change, to meet the regulation dates that are coming upon us. But I, I guess for me, I just want to encourage the CARBS Board and EPA at the state and the national level to consider you know, our, our country as a whole as to how we're going to accomplish these goals and move forward in a direction where everybody can, you know, meet, meet the task. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Supervisor. Thank you, Chair. And thank you both for being here. I'm great to see you again. I just want to say thank you to Supervisor Peterson. I mean, you know, he hit the nail right on the head. I think as supervisors, you know, we have a lot of the unincorporated areas, so we're dealing with a lot of the ag issues. I know for me, being in San Joaquin County, but you know, you mentioned, um, you know, we will always have ag or farm farming because of our climate. However, to um, Supervisor Peterson's point, I mean, you know, I believe you in the fact that, you know, we'll always have corporate, right? But what's being hit the most is our family farms. One thing we don't want to see is our family farmers who's been farming for generations having to sell their land to corporate entities because they can't afford to be in business and feed their family and do what generations have done before. And I think it's a, a huge loss, not to this valley, but to this country when you have the traditional farmers that we had for hundreds of years, no longer can be able to do what they have been done because of some of the regulations that are coming down from Washington or from the state of California. I just, you know, and it's, 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 it's funny to in a sense, in a sense that you know, we just got done with an election and it seems like every politician out there has a, a TV commercial with a farmer, you know, a local family farmer, right? Vote for me, I love farmers. But, you know, when it comes time to support these same folks, you know, we need people to stand up and do that. So that was just my statement. So thank you both again very much. Okay, um, I want to look uh, for public comment. Oh, you got another question? Yeah, I just, I didn't want to miss the opportunity just because both of you are, you know, uh, face um, issues of decarbonization, which are incredibly important for the state. And I think that, you know, as you saw kind of even on the drive here, right, not having cell reception, you know, we, we face unique, you know, uh, challenges here in the San Joaquin Valley. And I know Leanne's heard me say this, but I think it's important, you know, uh, we have people living out of hotels because their houses aren't done yet because the utilities won't be connected, right? Um, and so I think as, as you think about decarbonization, you know, when I, when I think about equity, I always think about how do I start with the least disadvantaged people, you know, and, and make the regulation from there. And I think that we really just, we can't keep sort of, you know, waving our hand over some of the challenges that the San Joaquin Valley has when thinking about our goals, which we want to be ambitious, but also like how do we also have help to ensure that, you know, it, we have accountability uh, from PG&E, or we actually have some of those prioritized infrastructure dollars materialized for us to, to do the infrastructure. And I think that's hugely important. And lastly, you know, I think there is an opportunity to do things differently. I don't think we need to keep doing the same thing where EPA sets these guidelines and then we're, you know, we're set up to, to in, in essence, fail. I think there's an opportunity for this process to be a little bit different, if I may be so bold, in that when the new standards come out from the EPA, that we also see new commitments from the EPA in terms of what they are going to be stepping up to help all of these places around the country that would now be out of compliance. And I think that would be hugely helpful in, in rather than, you know, figuring out how to deal with non-compliance and contingencies, like, you know, help set us up for success. Thank you. 
Mr. Bessinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I kind of want to address the unintended consequences that some regula regulations bring and ask that in your positions that you ask your staff what are the un unintended consequences. Like um, environmentalists curtailed uh, foresting in our forests. I was in D.C. three years ago and was having a conversation with a congressional staff member about hiring or creating vocational programs for loggers and fellers. And the look on his face was just total disdain. He could have cared less, but I was just totally full of it. And I wondered, and this was a cons congressional staff member from the state of California. And I wondered if he remembered that conversation when this county and this valley blew up and just burned for weeks, uh, which is the unintended consequence of not maintaining our forests. So I, I would hope, I, I, I went through a leadership course where it talked about Fortune 500 companies, the president would look to one staff member and say, I want you to tell me why this is a bad idea. And they would hear it out. And at the very least, if they went ahead with the program, they knew about the unintended consequences. But if you have someone that you that has a voice that does his or her work and says, these are the things that could happen, at the very least you'd go, ooh, we need to mitigate that. And I, I think that's important for us, especially here in the Valley, since you know, the, the, from an air quality standpoint, these fires are just devastating. Uh, and they're going to be devastating for a while, and then we're going to have to deal with mudslides potentially. So uh, it's one, the unintended consequence of not having trees. And then, then we'll have contaminated water because of the, the mud and the things from the fire. So if you could do that, that I, I think that would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, now I'll ask for public comment. There's Manuel. Good. See what a what a great what an example, Manuel. But, but hold it down to three minutes, please, because it runs. Yes, I will keep time. it shorter than that, buddy. Okay. Uh, first of all, buddy, and Samir Les Clark um, is unable to be here today and tomorrow. He has some various meetings, but he apologizes for not being here, and so he wanted me to forward that to you and the board. Uh, first, I want to thank Leanne, Chairwoman ARB, for the ag smoke, the funding. The $180 million has been tremendous, and we're learning a lot, especially with the uh, Cordon Vineyards. So thank you for that. Number two, the farmer program. It's been tremendous. ARB deserves the initiative efforts with uh, Jared Blumenfeld and Richard Corey and your entire team, uh, Len, um, Fort and Michael Benjamin, everybody. That has been very, very helpful to our farmers. And we see the farmers as we raise the rate. We've seen those farmers now going after tractors, but we have less farmers because of what's going to happen on the west side. But again, thank you for all of that. We look forward to working with your staff on the electrification issues with farmers, but I wanted to thank you. Number two, uh, Administrator Martha Guzman, thank you for being here very much. We appreciate that. Um, I have one thing, and that is agriculture will only stay if the farmers can survive. Uh, there only will be corporate farms if we don't change how California deals with regulations. And that's not your problem, but it is a federal that comes to the state. But the thing I would like to offer up to you in front of everybody is that agriculture has put its hand out there, and we've worked with ARB. We're putting our hand out to you to work through the issues that agriculture has, including Sigma, including the pesticides, but of all, NRCS. That is our agency. That is a true, honest agency. And our farmers have grateful from all the programs and practices that NRC has for us. So we look forward. Our hand is out there to, to uh, Meredith and her team and, and uh, Amy Miller. So, again, thank you for being here. Buddy, thank you. And Samir, but we look forward. But, again, Chair, thank you so much for everything you've done for us on helping us in Sacramento. So thank you. Okay, with that, I'm, 
I'm going to conclude this and thank you for coming. Uh, I know sometimes this isn't e easy and uh, I, I actually have to say I don't agree with you guys on, on almost anything, but uh, th <laughs> thanks for being here. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, we're going to be doing item nine. Do you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, introduce this item. I'm going to start the introductions with Tom Jordan, our senior policy advisor. He's going to lay out some of the real quick context on this. But before before moving into that, definitely wanted to acknowledge the um, the wonderful um, panel of folks that we have here. That uh, very very well respected, very well known partners of, of ours. Um, Tom's going to introduce them later. But we do have Carlos Suarez, the state conservationist with USDA NRCS, a great partner of ours for many, many years, big champion of all of our air quality efforts here. Dr. David Edwards uh, with uh, OE had the chief deputy director there who's going to help with um, laying out some of the information with a recent uh, report that, that came out last week and providing some context. We have Don Cameron, who's a, a well-respected and um, just another, just a, a Tremendous partner, as, as all these folks are, in working with us for so many years uh, on so many different opportunities. And then our federal consultant, um, Lynn Haquez, who is here. Oh, there she is. <laughs> You're right behind David. I was looking for you. <laughs> um, you know, we are so honored to have all of you here to share thoughts on climate initiatives and opportunities. And just want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here today. And um, hopefully you got one of these cookies. I hear they're, they're pretty good to help keep you fueled as we jump into this next item. So, Tom, take it away. Thanks. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Samir. And uh, as Jesse said earlier, um, the clean air journey really started back in the 1970s. And uh, with the passage of the first Federal Clean Air Act, and it was updated in 1990. And so for decades, uh, the Air District, the state, the federal government all worked on air quality. And what that meant for those years was criteria pollutants. So it was basically controlling ozone, particulate matter, air toxics. So it was the immediate public health uh, impacts that we were all addressing. Whoops. In California in 2006, um, that, that changed with the passage of AB 32. So when AB 32 passed, uh, California basically said air quality is, is those things, but we, it's, it's also climate change. And we're going to start dealing with criteria with, uh, with, with global warming and greenhouse gases. And they set, they set goals to basically control emissions uh, to 1990 levels by 2020. Um, since then, there's been SB 32, which uh, further increased those goals. So at that time, the Air District, whose uh, mission has always been to attain those Federal Clean Air Act standards and con control criteria pollutants, air toxics, the immediate public health issues, uh, the board went and looked and said, okay, in this, with this new requirement out there, how does that fit with, with, with our mission? Um, they are related things. Uh, a lot of the things that control uh, greenhouse gases also control uh, criteria pollutants and vice versa, but not always. Um, there are definitely times where uh, the two issues diverge. Um, one of the things we see often is the time frames are vastly different. Usually when you're looking at criteria pollutants, you're looking at a very immediate horizon, whereas with climate change, it's a longer horizon. So sometimes they, they, the, the policies may want to look for the perfect that they can get to in a number of years in lieu of the good, which we could get right away, which we need uh, to meet our goals. So um, when the board looked at uh, uh, our mission in conjunction with uh, AB 32 and other policies, uh, they, they came out with some policy statements, or you, got, you guys came out with some policy statements to help guide us as we move forward. And one of them was, um, with the advent of AB 32, there was a lot of funding available uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the cap-and-trade programs and others. And one of the things that's important to us, it, with mobile sources being such a big part of our problem and our limited authority, was to look for any place we could to find resources to help control emissions from mobile sources. 
So one of the pieces of our policy moving forward uh, was to continue to pursue wherever we could find it, funding for uh, mobile source emission reductions uh, and, and, and funding to help our disadvantaged communities as well. Additionally, as the state started developing policies to uh, control emissions from greenhouse ga ga gases, we basically said we're going to support those, those measures and, and look to prioritize those measures that also get criteria pollutant reductions. And where there's, there's measures that, you know, are maybe harmful to our, uh, to our uh, mission, we will, we will also let that be known as well and look for prioritizing um, those emissions as well. So what we wanted to do this afternoon is talk about uh, the, the current status of what's going on and, and highlight some of the initiatives that are ongoing right now uh, in the climate change world that overlap with, with what we're doing and, and prioritize some opportunities that we have, um, both on the funding side and then on the policy side. Uh, and so we, we just, at a very high level, a number of those things that are going on is CARB. Uh, every five years or so uh, updates a scoping plan to show what they're going to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And they're right in the middle of that process right now. So as CARB goes through and develops those measures, um, we're looking through and looking for opportunities to uh, further our mission as well as further th their mission of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Also, as I mentioned before, funding is a huge issue for us uh, on mobile sources and other things, and there's a huge amount of money available, uh, unprecedented amount of funding at both the state and federal level um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, coming out of the last two years state budgets, when the, when the, the state budget was, was pretty flush, uh, we basically are looking at a little over almost $54 billion over the next five to ten years uh, to fund technology advancement to control greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a lot of our funding, you, you've heard earlier about the Farmer Program, um, the Clean Cars for All Program. Um, a lot of that funding comes out of those pots of money, uh, funding for transitioning heavy-duty vehicles uh, to cleaner technologies, to zero emissions. That comes out of that as well. Um, so over, over the coming years, um, there are signi significant opportunities at the state level. And one of the things we're seeing for the first time at the federal level in this arena is a, a, a significant amount of funding as well. Um, you've seen two major pieces of legislation over the last year, the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, with huge amount of funding. Um, I think we're still unpacking, and everyone's still unpacking exactly what that's going to mean, um, but there are tremendous opportunities uh, to bring resources uh, to control greenhouse gases and uh, the co-benefits of criteria pollutant emission reductions as well. Um, also, there's the annual appropriations process. So we've been active for, for, for years uh, to both create programs, to um, look for any opportunities in that annual budgeting process uh, to bring funding for the Valley, and that, that continues to be an opportunity. And then finally, um, you know, they're go we're going into a farm bill cycle, so there's opportunities for the farm bill. There's already an ag sustainability initiative. There's funding in that. Um, and so we want to make sure we're working with our ag partners uh, and looking for any opportunity to, to bring resources to help, you know, make the ag industry more sustainable through incentives and through other funding sources as well. So as Samir mentioned, um, we brought a group of, uh, of experts here to talk about various topics. Um, we're going to go through w one at a time and then uh, do questions at the end that, if, if that works for everybody. Um, but So I'll introduce first Dave Edwards. Um, so Dave Edwards, as Samir mentioned, uh, is the Deputy Director at the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessments. And they've done a, a, a study basically looking at, you know, the impacts of climate um, uh, Dave uh, g goes back many years working with the district. He, he was at CARB for a long time. And whether issues are difficult or not, Dave has already, always understood the Valley's unique situation and has been a great partner to work with. And so I'll turn it over to you, Dave, for your comments. Great. Thanks. And, um, yeah, thanks, Samir, for the, the welcome. And um, great to sort of be here to talk a little bit about um, our climate change indicator report we just put, put out and sort of specifically really focus on what's going on in the valley. 
So, um, I guess I'll, oh, so at any rate, just to start, um, a little bit about OWEHA first for some of you that may not have, are super familiar with it. Um, we have about 150 uh, total employees, mostly toxicologists, epidemiologists, um, scientists, and a couple of medical doctors. We do a wide range of programs across the state. Um, one of these I'll be talking about today, our indicators report, but we also do um, fish advisories um, for recreational fisheries across the state, um, as well as implementing Proposition 65, the warning regulation, which um, many of you probably have seen warnings on different products. So with that, just wanted to go ahead and start. So last uh, Tuesday, the, the 1st of November, we put out our, our fourth edition of our Indicators of Climate Change in California report. What it does is it looks at indicators of climate change across the state um, and its drivers and impacts on California. And just to add a little context for kind of how this fits into that broader climate picture um, across the state, we're kind of, this report kind of has, goes at the retrospective analysis, or what has happened. Where when you're looking at the um, different assessments that come out, that's looking at maybe the what could happen. And when we hear about the scoping plan and different, the state adaptation strategies, those are really looking, about, looking at what we are doing about it. So on the left, it just shows the different categories of indicators that we have, everything from uh, climate change drivers, the changes in climate, physical systems, vegetation and wildlife impacts, um, human health impacts. Um, we have 41 total chapters or indicators in the report. Um, we have about six new ones uh, this year, and I'll get into a couple of those as well. Um, we've also added this year for the first time eight chapters from tribal representatives, looking at the tribal impacts um, of climate change and how that affects their livelihood across the state as well. And then we also have an emerging section that looks at issues that are not scientifically shown to be caused by climate change yet, but are likely to. And this sort of looks at um, coastal uh, valley fog, um, looking at different types of um, harmful algal blooms in freshwater systems, um, as well as um, blue tongue in livestock and bumblebee, bumblebee populations. So just to kind of set the stage a little bit, I think probably most of us have seen a curve looking like this in some way, form or another. Um, this shows the atmospheric uh, concentrations of CO2, methane, and N2O. And since the mid-1950s or so, there's been a steady increase of about 1.6 part per million. The last five years, we've seen an increase of about 2.4 part per million. And it's getting up around four, uh, above 400 parts per million. And this is... Um, higher than the uh, pre-industrial revolution concentrations of around 250 parts per million. So really now to start focusing on the, the San Joaquin Valley in particular, so what this shows is air temperatures from 1890, um, the sort of the percent increase in per century in average air temperatures since 1895. Um, the blue is showing the min, so those are the lows that we see at night. Um, and you can see for the for uh, San Joaquin Valley, that's increased about two and a half degrees over the last century, um, whereas the daytime highs have increased about 0.1 degree Fahrenheit um, over the last century, so much lower than many other parts of the state. Um, from a precipitation perspective, what we're looking at here on the right is um, annual precipitation since the early, um, since late 1800s. You can see the, the dotted line is sort of the average precipitation and then the, the vertical line show the amount of rain each year. And then the green line <clears throat> shows variability. And as you can sort of see within the last um, 30 to 40 years, the amount of variability has um, definitely increased. So this means there's many more highs of average precipitations above the average, but also um, precipitation amounts that are below the average. So just wanted to, to highlight that it's not so much the, the deviation from the average, but the variability. And then kind of focusing a little bit on three of our other indicator chapters. So each one of these has a chapter in the report. Um, the first one of these is winter chill. So this is basically um, counting the number of hours in the winter that's between 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. 
um, in order to have um, a productive uh, <clears throat> maturation cycle for fruit trees, the range is about 200 to 1500 hours of these, um, this winter chill is needed. And what the graph on the left is showing is um, basically since the 1950s, the decrease in chill hours per decade. So you can see the dark red is about a little over 80 hours, but most, as you can see, is yellow and orange, which is the 40 to about 80 hours less of the um, chill hours per decade. And what this does is that it um, really has an impact on the, the, the process for the, the seeding and the, the growing of different fruit trees. Um, the other thing that has sort of taken over time, uh, decreased over time, is the maturation time. Um, this is particularly seen in prunes, um, and you can see that over the last 40 years or so, there's been a decrease in about 15 days or so in the prune maturation time. So this affects different sizes of the fruit, um, as well as different pests that can um, attack it. And then also there's an, we have an indicator on navel orange worm abundance. And basically this is just being able to, um, over the time, it's actually uh, increased its life cycle. So there's more of that, um, the, the orange worm does impact um, more quickly uh, the different types of fruit. And this really does affect almonds, walnuts, and pistachios. Uh, a little bit on, on drought, there's um, basically the dark red is the ex, uh, exceptional drought, and you can sort of see that the, um, since 2000, the, um, it's the tw um, most driest period in the last thousand years that has been on record, um, and particularly the last couple of years are matching the dry period in 2012 to 2016. Um, another one is just looking at wildfire smoke. So this is number of wildfire smoke days by county. So this is where smoke is detected in the air above different counties. And you can see from two, 2010 to 14, we have about 12 years of data here. It was around zero to 30 days in 2010. And 2020 was an exceptional wildfire year, but um, every county in the state was at least covered by, with 46 days with wildfire smoke. And turning a little bit now to the um, human health side, when you look at um, workers' uh, compensation data and uh, heat-related illnesses um, due to the temperature increases, you can see that there's been um, about a three um, times increase in heat-related illnesses since 2000. Um, and there's also a big reduction in higher temperatures and working in productivity. It's been sort of shown that in, when the temperature hits about 91 degrees, there's about a 50% loss of productivity. Um, and um, at greater than 90 degrees, there's a 9% greater chance of injury. And greater at, at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it's about 10 to 15% increased chance of injury. The other um, item that we have been tracking in this report is valley fever. So this is caused by um, a fungus that's in the soil. Um, and it's particularly prevalent in Central Valley and Central Coast. And this has increased about five times since 2001. Um, and because of the drought and drier conditions, it disperses into the air more rapidly. So overall, what we've found is that there is a continuation and acceleration of these trends. Um, the events are much more episodic. There's a higher variability. Um, and they do compound on each other. And we are seeing more invasive pests as well. So with that, I'm hope I've set the stage to sort of see kind of what we've been seeing some, um, from the, the past 20 to 100 years or so, and I'll turn it back. All right. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so next up, we have Carlos Suarez, who, uh, is, who became the 11th state conservationist for California in 2013. Um, Carlos has been with NRCS since 1992 uh, and has, has you know, served a number of roles over those years. Um, and I just wanted to add that um, in, in the past 20 years, NRCS has been a great partner for air quality here in California. And I think a lot of the, the initiatives that NRCS has done in that area were developed with our ag stakeholders working with USDA and NRCS 
and Carlos has been a big part of that. So uh, Carlos is going to set the stage on things that we can do in ag to be uh, more sustainable and, and deal with climate issues. Good morning. Yeah, good afternoon. All right. It always happens. Um, yeah, I guess I raised my presentation here. Thankfully, it's there. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, allowing me the opportunity to be here today and, and speak uh, on behalf of NRCS on the 360 and counting employees that NRCS has uh, throughout the state. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know about the agency, let me just set the stage a little bit about what NRCS does and how we work in partnership with you, with San Joaquin Air Pollution Control District, with, uh, with ARB, uh, with EPA, and many other uh, state agencies in, in California. Not only state agencies, local agencies, but also, more importantly, as I, 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 think, I think it is, is working with the biggest partner, the farmers, the ranchers, the uh, forest stewards of our great state. Um, NRCS is an agency that's been on board for uh, over uh, close to 90 years now. Uh, started with the Dust Bowl of uh, 1935. We uh, were called or known as the Soil Erosion Service, then changed to Soil Conservation Service, which is, interestingly enough, I, I came towards the tail end of the Soil Conservation Service before we uh, transitioned to NRCS, which in, in reality shows more and it's, it's more inclusive of what we have been doing as an agency for over uh, close to 90 years. Um, we work, as I said, we work with partners, we work with farmers, with ranchers, forest stewards to put conservation on the ground. And I wanted to emphasize what I'm about to say on a voluntary basis. We're a non-regulatory agency. Let me repeat that. We are not a regulatory agency. Why is that so important? Why do you think I'm, I'm mentioning that? Because we work with, a far, with farmers, ranchers, forest stewards come into our our offices and into our 55 offices across the state, uh, uh, and we cover the whole the whole state. And I'm honored to serve as the servant leader for for my people and all of you. Um, they come in seeking help, seeking assistance to implement conservation on the ground, and we provide that assistance free of cost to the farmers, to the ranchers, to the forest stewards, and they decide whether to implement that practice or wait until they are ready to do that. That is the beauty of our agency. And how that intersect with regulatory agencies is that we work together. We have some common goals, protect the environment, protect the landscape. Different uh, objectives from the standpoint of whether it's regulatory or non-regulatory, but we sit down and look for ways that we can conduct that and help our common customer, the farmer, the rancher, for its user, and protect the landscape and protect the environment here in California. I want to, wanted to share that with you because what I want, want to focus is, is our priority, one of the priorities that the administration and our agency has set in protecting and continue providing that technical assistance to the technical and, farm and uh, financial assistance to farmers and ranchers. And that's why I, uh, I want to focus on climate smart uh, on our climate smart agriculture and forestry, which is our priority uh, as an agency right now in, in this uh, in the next few years, in protecting and providing that assistance to the farmers. <clears throat> as I said, producers play a key role in mitigating uh, climate uh, change in the, in the state. When I came back in California, actually I, sta I started as a, uh, in California in uh, 2005 as the deputy state conservationist under a great leader called uh, Ed Burton, who was very responsible for the work that we have been doing in air quality and working with partners here in the state. Um, <clears throat> and then re returning and going into the, the midst of uh, the middle of, a, of a, a drought. Some call it the mega drought, some call it, you know, the, the previous drought that is kind of continuing now <laughs> into the one that we have. And the discussion was on drought and drought and how, you know, drought this, drought that, and so forth. And my mom, who uh, is, uh, you know, I'm of, uh, you can tell by my, uh, so the, uh, my uh, New England accent, I'm from Puerto Rico. And 
I'm glad that I got a, a laugh out of that. Uh, but my, my mom is, uh, uh, my late mom is Cuban, and she always have a saying for everything. And I, when I was growing up, she said, Carlitos, there's no, no hay problemas, hay oportunidades. There's no problems, there are opportunities. And what I told the staff and what we worked on, on this was, folks, the drought is presenting an opportunity for us to change how we do things or improve how we do things, how we lay out practices and how we work closer with our farmers, with our ranchers and with forest stewards to get conservation on the ground, to protect the, the landscape, to protect the natural resources of the state. Let's take, let's size the opportunity. And by the way, let's change the narrative. Rather than saying we're in a drought, they say we're building climate resiliency. That's what we need to be doing. So to that effect, we're working with farmers and ranchers in that, in that role and, and forest stewards. We have an array of conservation practices that we have, quite honestly, we have, in the, we have been in the climate business and the climate protection or climate change business for almost 90 years. We just didn't call it that way. That's plain and simple. Uh, but our practices, who has been scientifically based, who are scientifically based, and I'm, I'm proud to call myself a, a scientist, my, uh, along with, my, with the great team that, that, that serve here, is we look, at, <clears throat> we look at those practices and utilize those practices to help protect, whether it's uh, we're working you know, overall and protecting natural resources, but building healthier soils with our type of practices, whether it's cover crops uh, practices that we utilize or uh, for crop rotation and so forth, but also se uh, sequestering carbon. And we have an initiative, a soil health initiative, that is part of, of how we do business. It's part of how we protect and build climate resiliency, climate change resiliency in the state. We're also focusing on, sequest on the sequestration, of, as I say, sequestering carbon, but also, also in addition to that, reducing gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, including carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. One of the practices, and I'll talk about the programs in a moment um, that we utilize, but one of the, the practices that, or, that we, or uh, one, one of the programs that has been very successful in California, and this precedes me, and uh, we, thankfully we have continued in this program, is the air quality program that we have in, in the state. Uh, and the success to that program, the success to that program in achieving those efforts is not only involving those farmers and ranchers and uh, forest uh, stewards in participating in the program, but also involving agencies, agencies working together, whether you're regulatory or non-regulatory, working together to achieve those, uh, those successes, to achieve those reductions in uh, greenhouse gases. That's why, uh, you know, as, uh, as Samir said, we have worked uh, extremely close with uh, San Joaquin Air Pollution Control District. We have worked very close with EPA and continue to work with EPA very close on this. And I, I see Meredith, I don't know if Marta's still here, but Meredith uh, has been uh, purpose from, uh, from EPA working with our team, working together and looking at ways that we can continue uh, working towards those goals, but also with ARB, who has been a strong partner. What are the areas that I have been focusing on uh, and that we'll continue to focus on? As I said, soil health, nitrogen stewardship, air quality achievements that we have to this date and will continue to do is, is critical. And I'll talk about funding in, in, in a moment and funding and, and how that funding relates to the successes. Conservation of uh, sensitive land. It's not just practices on uh, living landscapes, but also practices building, working on, with farmers and ranchers on easements, establishing easements to protect farm, uh, pristine or uh, prime farmland, but also restoring wetlands. Grazing and pasture lands who are very sensitive and, and uh, have over two or three million dollar, three million acres of uh, uh, a range in the state. And then working on private forest land restorations, especially with the wildfires that have occurred in the state continue to occur in the state. One thing that I want to mention this, I, uh, uh, a doctor was talking about the uh, fires and, and so forth. We no longer, climate change in the state and in the world, not only in the U.S. but in the world, but especially as it relates to California, we used to have a, a, fire, uh, a fire season. 
And some people talk about having fire season. We no longer have a fire season. Fire season is all, uh, every uh, year round. So we need to adapt to that, and we have been adapting to that with our practices, with our conservation practices, to make sure that those practices build more, more resiliency on forest land. So before I talk about IRA investments, and I want to focus on that in a moment, we have a farm bill programs that in California have been utilized to put conservation on the ground. Our main program, our main program, which doesn't necessarily sometimes get the credit that it deserves, is called CTA, Conservation Technical Assistance. That is the program that brings in a soil conservationist, a forester, a range conservationist, an engineer, uh, a biologist, uh, to, uh, and to, the, to, the off, to, the, to the farm, to the ranch, to provide that technical assistance free of charge to you to identify those resources and work with you identifying what are the best mechanisms to put conservation on the ground in your farm uh, on a voluntary basis. But then we have the tools to implement that conservation uh, planning, which is the Farm Bill programs. EQIP, which is our flagship program, we receive over $100 million a year in EQIP funds in California. Air quality of the $100 million that we receive in EQIP for a variety of conservation practices, a quarter of that goes directly to air quality, $25 million. Most of that $25 million gets here in the valley. It's invested here in the valley, invested working with farmers and ranchers. That's how critical, how important that is. Also working on conservation stewardship program, which is building uh, practices and enhancements to put conservation on the ground, and then our easement programs. So I wanted to give you that perspective because then you hear about IRA or the Inflation Reduction Act. I never thought in my 30 years career, and I just turned 30 a couple of weeks ago, uh, with the agency, folks. 30 years with the agency. Yeah, of course. I started, I started at five years old. 30, 30, 30, I turned 30 years with the agency two weeks ago. Uh, I never thought that we will see the historic investment in conservation that we are about to see in our agency. We are going to hit over $20 billion for the next five years. $20 billion. It's taken our agency. When I started with our agency, we were about six, $700 million. $700 million a year. And it kept going and going until recently that we were about four, four and a half billion dollars. Taking our agency doubled that investment. Eight and a half billion dollars for the next five years. Every year. That's historical. That is a reflection of the work that we all have been doing. This is not just NRCS. We all have been doing and putting conservation on the ground. So in that regards, as that investment comes in, it's going to support the existing Farm Bill programs that we already have. This is IRA or the Inflation Reduction Act. It's not a new program. It's actually funding to support the existing Farm Bill programs that we have. That is why that is so significant. And it's so significant because it's going to expand conservation practices. It's going to expand the investment in conservation in our state, in our nation. Why is that so critical? I, I, may, I keep saying that. It's because we cannot do this ourselves. As, as proud as I am of our agency, as proud as I am of the work that we do in California, we are going to need from everyone in this room and outside to work, continue working together to make sure that our farmers and ranchers, forest stewards in California, receive the assistance, whether it's financial assistance or technical assistance, to make that happen. Our, I have some. Uh, and so, what are the uh, current opportunities? As I said, we have some. I have some discretion, believe it or not, in how we do concert, those practices, those agricultural or climate smart agricultural and forestry practices, and that's where you come into play. I have a state technical committee that advised me and advised us in those practices and what is needed. And many of you have sat down on those uh, meetings and provide that feedback. I, I encourage you and, and urge you to continue doing that. 
those practices that we're focusing on has to reduce, have to be focused on reducing greenhouse gases and sequestering carbon on, in a quantifiable manner. And we are working on that to continue making that happen, to show that our practices that are scientifically based continue to deliver and show reduction in so, and show improvement in the air quality in our state. As I mentioned, those target, uh, those, uh, the funds are targeted for those practices. And as I mentioned earlier, IRA is above what we received for Farm Bill in, 2000, in, in California. As many of you have heard uh, saying, and, and that's uh, no different for us, the details are still being developed as to how IRA is going to be rolled out uh, to the agencies. Uh, we are not the only agency receiving funding. There are others, many others federal but we're still developing those details. What I can tell you is this. We are going to be doing a lot more, a lot more than what we have been doing for the environment, for our landscapes. And as I be here in front of you, I certainly want to emphasize that point and emphasize this, the partnership. Something that it does is reflected on this, but it's not written, but it's reflected on this is the partnership. It is key that we will continue working in partnership with all of you to make that happen. So with that, thank you so much. I'm sure that there will be questions later, but I'll be more than happy to when, when our turn comes to answer those. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, so next up, we have Don Cameron, who is the general manager of Terra Nova Ranch. Uh, Don has also served on the California Department of Food and Agriculture's Environment Farming uh, Act Science Advisory Panel, and he's been in a leadership role in a number of commodity groups, water districts, and other things, um, and is kind of a known leader in being innovative and in ways to, to make his ranch sustainable. So, Don. Thank you. Uh, really a pleasure to be here. Good to see some old friends. Schmier, thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, a little background uh, for those of you. I know some of you have toured our farm at uh, different times. Uh, but we farm about 30 miles southwest of Fresno, and we're a very diverse operation, 20 to 25 different crops. Um, we do organic production and conventional and a little biotech as well. So we have a real mixed operation. Um, our primary crop is processing tomatoes and you know, I was just reading the a report on the world tomato production, and we grow about 2,200 acres of processing tomatoes, both organic and conventional. And we, we produce about 130,000 tons of tomatoes per, in one year. And I was looking at France. The country of France produces 140,000 tons of tomatoes. So... On our one farm, we almost produce as much as they do in France, which is totally amazing, you know, and, and we're nothing special. There's larger tomato growers by far, but, you know, California produces 95% of the U.S. tomato production, cal uh, processing tomatoes, and one-third of the world's uh, processing tomatoes. So we do really have a treasure in the, uh, the Central Valley and the San Joaquin Valley and uh, I also live on the farm. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, we talk about, you know, we're a very critically disadvantaged region. Um, our internet consisted of, up until this, uh, earlier this year, was 15 megabits uh, download speed. So, and, and to get fiber to us, uh, we were quoted $780,000 from AT&T, and then four months later, they requoted it at $1.5 million. Wow. So it just shows you what rural living has and doesn't have, and the real disparity, and which really showed up during COVID uh, for many of our farm families that uh, work for us and their children trying to get an education. I know I'm getting off topic, so I'll get back to where I need to be, but uh, really... Uh, I actually love living out there, but that's another story. Which one, right? Okay, so um, we do a lot of innovative uh, projects on the ranch, as you as you heard. Um, 
Our partnership with the uh, Silicon Valley Air Board has been exceptional. Um, we started back, I think it was before 2010, replacing 55 natural gas engines with electric to uh, pump our water. Uh, we, we basically rely primarily on groundwater. Uh, and over the years, we have replaced over 40 tractors, uh, backhoes, forklifts, harvesters, uh, and, and gators, uh, which was one of the last. We had a visit from the governor back in, I think it was March or April, and we gave him a tour on an electric gator and uh, talked about the sustainability uh, projects that we had on going on the farm. But, uh, but uh, we, have, we have been all in on this uh, and really have appreciated uh, working together. Uh, we also have two megawatts of solar that's been in for about seven years now. Uh, since we have a high electric demand, we wanted to offset and stabilize our electric cost over the long-term period. And we felt it was a, the right thing to do. It, it's worked out great for us. Uh, Uh, we, you know, we use a lot of uh, compost and chicken manure uh, for our fertility program on farm, about 35,000 tons a year when we can get it. It's become a very uh, difficult thing to get at this point, uh, hard to believe, but, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we've switched in 2009. Uh, for all of our row crops over to subsurface drip irrigation for several reasons. One was to conserve water. The other was to deliver uh, our nutrients and so that we're not having any nitrates uh, uh, into the atmosphere. And our uniformity became much better. We, we saved about 30% uh, in our water needs and increased our yield by 25%. So it was a real win. It was hard for our guys to make the change. Uh, we've had all of our trees and vines on drip irrigation beginning in 1982. Um, at the end of the season, we pull the tape, we wind it up, send it to a recycler, or they turn it back into drip tape. Um, we, you know, for years we have we have implemented uh, integrated pest management on the farm. That is just a standard. Um, you know, we, we'd like to attract beneficial insects, and we have a very diverse crop rotation, as, you know, we talked about earlier. Um, we started uh, organic farming in 1993 with a small uh, piece of ground that uh, hadn't been farmed, put it into production. We now have about 900 acres in organic production, and uh, we rotate through various crops uh, on that ground as well. Um, in uh, 2010, we met with the chief from NRCS, David White, talked to him about uh, what we'd like to do on groundwater recharge on the farm. We put together, uh, shortly after that, a proposal for a conservation innovation grant with NRCS, and we're approved with for a, a 75000 grant, which we matched and uh, put about $200,000 into the project. And lo and behold, we had flood water show up uh, in 2011, and we had all the measurement equipment in field, ready to go. And we started a program uh, dealing with the, uh, the, the Phil that wrote our grant, who is a environmental engineer, uh, where we were going to put the water. And we discussed open fields, uh, bordering up different fields like a rice field, and uh, getting groundwater recharge going. And he said, well, you're going to have more water than that. Where else can we put it? And I said, we'll put it on the wine grapes. And he says, you'll kill them. And I said, no, you won't kill them. And so we started a program in 2011 of flooding wine grapes. And we were able to put 13 feet of water on several of our wine grape fields that raised our water table 40 feet below those grapes. Um, this had never been done in the state. And it uh, turns out that Department of Water Resources has picked up on this and is now as AGMAR and as part of FloodMAR, Management Aquifer Recharge, and uh, essentially started here on Terranova. 
uh, back in 2011. We repeated it in 2017 and 2019 when we had additional flood years. Uh, we flooded pistachios uh, and wine grapes, but uh, also almonds uh, without causing damage. Uh, and we kept water on these, uh, like say, get ahead of my smoke. We kept water on these grapes uh, all the way up until early July, pulled the quarter when the vines turned a bright yellow, shut the water off, and 10 days later they turned a dark green. We had our normal harvest in August. Um, our winery wasn't thrilled about this, but you know, this isn't Napa wine, so <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we also now have uh, three miles of uh, native, native pollinator hedgerows. The canals, uh, we also got a Department of Water Resources grant to build canals with an infrastructure to take flood water on farm. So what we did was along our levees, we have uh, we got a small grant from uh, the Healthy Soils Initiative, and we were only supposed to put a half mile of uh, pollinator plants in. We ended up putting them um, a mile and a half in, uh, and we have since added and now are up to three miles. Love to go to 10 miles is what I, my goal is. Um, but I, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little hesitant because they have now uh, have listed the uh, native, several native, native bumblebees as endangered species, and without a safe, without having a safe harbor provision, it's hard to want to go ahead with this project and put in something that's going to attract pollinators. And if I inadvertently kill one, I could be subject to a lot of trouble and a lot of fines. I still want to go ahead with it but I'm very cautious right now. You know, I met with the head of Xerces on the West Coast and discussed this issue, and hopefully they will get a safe harbor provision uh, in the legislation. We'll see. But uh, it's, it's difficult. You want to do the right thing, and then you've got uh, somebody else that, that's going to write you up for a violation. So it's, it's a tough call being, a, being in farming. Uh, we have also participated in the, uh, the Airboards program for whole orchard recycling, where we have taken uh, almond orchards out of production. We've chipped them, spread them on the land, and then incorporated it to a depth of over 12 inches uh, for carbon sequestration and to eliminate burning. We like the program. We appreciate what the Airboard has done. We've actually, at the Science Advisory Panel with CDFA, we've actually copied a lot of Carlos's programs and the airboard programs, and uh, because we know that these guys have it right, um, we've made you know been able to supplement and work together. One of his staff is on our panel as well and uh, gives us advice. So good relationship there. But yeah, we think this is great. You'll see around the uh, the countryside now. Unfortunately, because of the water situation, there are a lot of orchards that are being pushed out, um, up, you know, along the west side. Uh, that are going to be chipped, and you see piles of chips everywhere right now. So, great program. It beats burning. Um, I like clean air. I live here, and so do my grandkids. So, challenges. So, I heard this morning that there was a report out from Stanford that the number, I, these are numbers we actually collected at our farm, 125 different agencies that we have to deal with. We have kept track of it. And I heard that there's a report out now from Stanford that said that there are over 500 agencies that businesses in California have to deal with. I don't have that data, but um, believe me, we are extremely highly regulated in California mm -hmm. in farming. You know, with Sigma, uh, we, we deal with the Department of Water Resources and the Water Board. Um, you know, that's all about uh, groundwater uh, sustainability, and you know we, we now have new agencies, sustainable groundwater management. Just one, just wanted to just uh, uh, sorry, Don, Don over here. Um, quick, just a, if you could wrap it up in about a minute or so, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, we're just kind of running short on time, so nope, I just no apologies, problem. but yeah, yeah, I know. Thank you so much. Yeah, I didn't think I'd have enough to talk about. Appreciate. But, yeah. <laughs> 
these are the agencies, the main, some of the main agencies we work with. Uh, you know, on pesticide regulation, I've been on the Sustainable Pest Management Task Force for the last two years, developing a plan for the state. We're going to have our last meeting early December. It'll be compilated and put out probably right after the first of the year. What this does, um, you know, it gives additional costs and complexity to farming. You heard it earlier. Small farms, I don't know how they can survive. Um, you know, we're a larger farm, not the largest by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, we have to hire the attorneys, the experts to help deal with these regulations. Um, small farms are going away just the way the small dairies went away. Um, that ends the program. I'd just like to say our future, we're looking at bringing in a couple of electric tractors with federal money, uh, with grid tractor uh, that we've been working with for some time. Hopefully after the first year, we're going to meet this week or next week to determine a charging station. We also have a laser weeder that we have on farm currently so that we can eliminate weeds in a safer, more sustainable manner. Um, and we know we're going to be working with a lot of biologicals for pest management in the future, uh, hopefully as they are developed. So thank you very much. Sorry for going on. Yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing that we have too much to say about sustainability. It's just we have too much to talk about today, I think, is, is, is the challenge. So the, the last speaker on this panel is Lynn Haquez. Um, and Lynn Haquez is the principal at the law firm of C.J. Lake. Um, prior to uh, leaving Capitol Hill, she was the counsel for the House Judiciary Committee. And I, I, I just did that so I could say judiciary. It's hard to <laughs> <make it out>. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and she's represented us in, in Washington, D.C. for over a decade and has done that very uh, ably. So, Lynn? Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Delighted to be here. And I want to introduce my colleague, John Assini, who works with me back in D.C. And I figure uh, as I'm wrapping up here for you all, um, I think that our primary goal is to basically um, get Carlos the funding that he can give to Don in order to continue his incredible um, um, initiatives and that then helps ameliorate the indicia that David just shared with us earlier. So I have $2 trillion to do that for you all, and I brought my checkbook. Um, how about that? Um, so I'm just going to very briefly uh, talk about some of the climate investments. I'm not going to go through, rest assured, Samir, I'm not going to talk about all five pages of all of this funding. I do just want to give you, because we've sent this out many, many times, and there are many, um, you know, uh, and this is just page one. But I think I just want to, in an overview, let you know that, Tom mentioned um, two bills. I'm going to say three bills, and I don't want the, um, the the targeted amount of funding in those bills from the federal level is roughly a little bit over like $2.2 trillion. So um, there's a lot of money that is flowing, and I think it behooves us all to take advantage of it. The other thing I did want to point out is that it was the Air District that created the um, EQIP program in the 2008 Farm Bill with a set-aside, very meager set-aside initially of $17 million for the state of California that we're so happy to have grown um, over the last uh, several years. So uh, the air quality aspect of that equip. And now it's billions um, that, that we are seeing from this. But in any event, um, we've got uh, just a whole host of, of um, climate spending from the infrastructure bill. And I think what's really important to know, the infrastructure bill just celebrated its first year anniversary. And in, and in these programs, uh, which is the infrastructure bill, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, otherwise known as the other half of Build Back Better. And then the third bill that you all may not be as familiar with is the CHIPS bill. But without the CHIPS bill, which is the domestic manufacturing um, component to this that passed, we can't do <laughs> any of the programs that are in the previous two bills because we need the products, the components, and the production in order to be able to do it. So it's a very important component of the spending I just wanted to share with you. Um, and I think there are, there are basically four 
um, major funding sources that are contained in these various bills. There's formula dollars, which in the infrastructure bill primarily comes out through the Department of Transportation. Because it is existing under formula, it goes out to the states in a very regulated manner, and they could push those out the door very quickly, which they have done over the last year, understanding it's a five-year authorization. The second area is the competitive grant area. And that's, I'm going to focus a little bit more on that because I think that's where um, the next tranche of funding is going to be coming from. And we're all trying to get our ducks in a row in order to access that. The third area uh, is tax credits. And that was primarily of the $500 billion cost tag to the, infra uh, to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, $400 billion of that was in tax credit. Um, and so that's not as much of a topic, I don't think, necessarily for us as the Air District or local governmental entities, but certainly as private uh, um, entities, there's opportunity there on the production side and on, and on uh, purchase um, um, sides. And then the fourth area is in loan programs. And there's a huge amount, billions of dollars, that were put into the Department of Energy uh, loan programs. So those are kind of the four ways that, that the federal funding flows. And the, the things that I really want to um, focus on for you all is two areas that we really target for air district funding is, first of all, funding our stakeholders so that they can do fleet uh, turnover and other kinds of necessary um, activities that help us control those sources of emissions that we don't have direct control over, right? So a big, huge part of our, you know, um, attainment plans and implementation plans are sort of incentive-based programs. We can only get down to zero by so much and other sources we don't control. So we really focus on the transportation side of things, particularly in goods movement and the medium and heavy duty to vehicle space. So there's quite a bit of funding that has been put through uh, in the medium and heavy duty vehicle space to try to address this. A lot in the bus platform space, which is both transit operations for the LONO program and through the school bus program, the zero emission school bus program. And I think that it's important to understand that the school bus program is zero and um, it's not just, you know, it's electric, um, but it's ha whatever technology gets you to zero, which is hydrogen, possibly even propane, and some other kinds of things. So it's important to under understand that um, element to that. And so um, those programs, again, are pushed out a lot through uh, the formula dollars, which we've seen in the last year. The school bus program has come out through its um, traditional uh, funding of the voucher programs that they did, and now they're going to be turning to um, turning to, to competitive grant programs. There are five agencies that we go to with our hands out, and that is the Department of Transportation, the Department of Energy, the EPA, Treasury because of its tax credits, and USDA because of its agricultural sustainability programs. And so those are the general funding areas that, that, we, um, that we focus on. So I do want to get to um, on the, just very briefly back on the infrastructure program is that, again, as I said, a lot of the formula dollars have gone out the door and are going out the door. The competitive grant programs where they were existing already and had the relative criteria in place were easy to distribute and put the notice, what are called NOFAs, right? Notices of funding availability out there in an early fashion. The new programs, not so easy, and that's what's taken a little bit of time. The biggest issue um, that the biggest new programs that are coming and that impacts all of the transportation modes that are trying to go zero initially through battery electric and again possibly through hydrogen and other others is supporting infrastructure and so the federal highway administration is uh, in charge of no pun intended that's what we have to say right mm -hmm. but in charge of building out um, our goods movement and our corridor charging infrastructure and that's where the chips act money comes into play in order to give us those domestically produced products <laughs> that can be used for the installation of this necessary infrastructure, which has to be in place before we can put vehicles on the road uh, in order to do it. So we've got to build this, you know, true, true infrastructure. So we are going to be seeing, um, we had requirements for the states to develop their uh, transition plans, if you will, the transition to zero, 
All 50 states submitted those plans to the Department of Transportation, the Department of Energy, which was great news. So not a single state decided to sit out um, this, this transition, which I think they were they were very happy uh, happy for. But this is now um, going to start rolling out in a much more robust fashion this coming year. Um, in the IRA, now moving to, again, the um, Inflation Reduction Act, the bulk, as I said, of the provisions in that, in that bill were tax credit provisions. So $400 billion of that were tax credits, and $100 billion remains to come out. So what we are in the process of doing, and you can see these EPA programs here, all of these programs EPA put out earlier last week requests for information in how to go about administering these programs and getting this funding out the door. There are six what are called RFIs, requests for information, and then there are stakeholder listening sessions and other kinds of activities that are going to be happening. All of you, we on the behalf of the district are submitting responses to those technical questions. We really encourage all of you stakeholders to respond and give guidance to the agencies as to how they should do this. Um, and then really, I've already talked sort of about the transportation piece of it. The final um, element that's really not on here was the Farm Bill. And I just want to say that there were some significant programs, two, fun two programs sort of forward funded in the IRA that usually wait to the Farm Bill. We have a Farm Bill reauthorization coming up next year in 2023, and we are a little concerned as to whether there might be some clawback uh, from some of those programs because of the need to fund other kinds of programs. I do want to point out that the, Clarm the Climate Smart grants that were announced by USDA, what, last month, I think, maybe, um, were not from any of these bills. They were from the Commodity <laughs> Credit Corporation. And that's the way we love it at USDA. That's our slush fund, right? Um, and you can fund all kinds of things for it, no pejorative sense there. But um, there's uh, oversight that's coming on the expenditures of USDA in these kinds of programs. There's oversight coming for um, possible change in, and then, you know, there's a little thing called an election, you know, that went on, and so we're kind of tracking what that means in D.C., but we are anticipating um, some annual appropriations debate, uh, some oversight on how this money is going out, and then just want you to know that, um, you know, we are looking at every opportunity to send funds directly through targeted airsheds, through DERA, through other kinds of programs, equip to the district, but then also support you all and whatever you might be applying for. So with that, I'm happy to take the questions along with the rest of the group. Okay. Um, just even at the board level, some ground rules on asking questions. Be short and to the point. Don't bloviate. We're way over time. So, but you can't a ask a question. <laughs> Go ahead, Craig. Okay, just, just, a quick, just a quick suggestion. A round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> I mean, what a <laughs> be quick. So, uh, you know, when you think about California, you think about forests and, and uh, so much that's, uh, you know, occurred in the state. And I, I would subscribe that um, 250 miles of the valley floor, um, they're the healthiest forests on earth. And um, so we're talking about carbon sequestration, funding for carbon sequestration. Um, Carlos, to you, you know, our federal partners fail or refuse to recognize, um, you know, carbon sequestration on farm. I mean, they haven't, there's been no credits. Um, and, and I'm curious, they're actually now recognizing that that is a positive. They're providing funding for it. They're recognizing how positive it is. But yet, you know, when you're talking about um, working hand in hand with agencies and for the better of the, the world and, mm -hmm. and air quality, there's still no recognition, you know, of those those uh, positive attributes. So I'm just curious if there's any change. Okay. So thanks for thanks for the question. Um, we as a, as an agency, we recognize that the the practices uh, that we implement on the ground have significant impacts on a variety of uh, challenges that we have in not only in, in, in California but also in the nation. But also we know and, and scientifically that our practices, whether it is uh, you know do forest management, 
uh, cover crop um, and, and other uh, you know crop rotation and so forth do do indeed provide uh, you know carbon sequestration. How is that quantified and so forth? That's the, I guess that's where the the, the cross is, or what, that's where the challenge is from the standpoint of uh, whether the states or entities recognize, you, you know, use those practices and say, you know, if California, if NRCS or a farmer, let me put it this way, if a farmer uh, or forest tours develop or adapt a plan, a forest management plan or a conservation plan that shows, um, you know, quantifiable uh, sequestration and quantifiable measures, if they adapt, if they adopt that and say, well, we're going to take that, that's something that we don't necessarily have control over. You know, that's for regulatory agencies to, to, to decide whether that they will do that. With that said, we have been working with, you know, agencies like CDFA, the Department of Conservation, uh, CAL FIRE, and, and also, you know, Forest Service, in providing what we have done, and we actually use a comet, which is a comet planner, which is, comet planner is a tool to actually show Quantifiable information working with uh, Colorado State University in this in this effort. It's a national effort, uh, and California has been a lead in that effort in showing in the utilization of that planner to show hey, if we do this, this is what a farmer can show as far as he or she sequestering carbon on the ground. So it's starting to be adapted or adopted by 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 entities. We just need to see how widespread that uh, ad uh, adoption will be. But we'll certainly work in, in uh, that direction. Any other questions before I go to the public? Is there any public comment? Go ahead. Okay, we'll talk loud. I will. Well, I thank the, the panel. Um, I just want to just let everybody know I've known Don Cameron for many, many years, but he isn't here because of that. He's be here, here because of the great accomplishments he's done over the last 20 years. So, yeah. And one thing about uh, money, this is just the last observation. We're throwing trillions of dollars, monopoly money, that really does not exist at all this shit. And our ancestors, or our descendants, will be paying for it. Either paying for it by being in a permanent depression or actually telling the borrowers of this money that it's gone. But thank, but thank you for being here. Just uh, Mr. Chair, just a, a quick uh, time check. Um, we're running about 15 minutes late, and um, again, thank you to the, to the panel. Um, we kind of built a little bit of a, we, we thought we finished by about uh, 4.45. Um, it's probably gonna be closer to five. We have about, a, about an hour on the next and last um, item, so just an update on that. So plan on hopefully being okay with about a five o'clock finish. And we kind of assumed, my, something might stretch out a little bit during the day, so we were being ambitious, I think, with 4.45. So. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to John Classen to introduce um, this item. There's this bill called Sigma that you may or may not be aware of. You're probably aware of it, would be my guess. And um, quite a lot of uh, discussion today already about droughts and Sigma and water shortage and climate impacts. And so we're just gonna continue building on the conversation. We have some esteemed um, uh, colleagues and partners here who are going to be um, joining us for this conversation and I'm sure Hopefully we have a little bit more time at the end of this for more questions and discussion, but we'll see because we do have quite a robust uh, set of speakers here. I, I would just ask for the panel members, if you could kind of focus on the seven minutes of the seven to ten minute range, that might allow a little bit more time at the end. And so, um, 
we'll see what we could do with that. So thank you very much. And John, if you could introduce the item. And John, starting with you, if you could be really, really brief with your introduction. Um, uh, I have a little bit more control over that factor. <laughs> Uh, you know, so we can let the speakers uh, speak and for the board to have more time as well. So thank you very much and the public. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Samir, and good afternoon, everybody. I'll try to cut this down from 45 minutes down to uh, maybe 30 seconds. Minute, yeah. <laughs> so I'm uh, John Klassen, Director of Air Quality Science, and I'm happy to present this. I'll give a real brief overview, then turn it over to our, our panel here. As we know, we have an ongoing drought across California. We show a few images here on the right-hand side showing the western U.S., uh, the drought continues. You can see most of the western U.S. is affected by drought in some degree or another. Focusing on California, right down below there, you can see that the majority of California is in a more of a severe drought where the, most of the San Joaquin Valley is exceptional drought, which is the worst classification. And it's looked this, looked this way for quite some time. Uh, the Department of Water Resources, they did a report recently looking at the year 2021, the water year, and you can see in their images here that it was a very dry year for the state of, of California. Um, it was the second driest year on record. The water reservoir levels that they show on the right-hand side, we've heard that too, that they're at record low levels across the state. Uh, Lake Oroville up north hit its record low. San Luis Reservoir in our neighborhood hit its second lowest value, and we've been seeing this throughout this last year. Uh, a number of assessments are being done to understand the effects of the ongoing drought from an economic perspective. You, UC Merced continues to evaluate this, estimating that up to 700,000 acres of land have already been idled in the Central Valley compared to 2019, and this includes the Sacramento area to the north of us. $1.4 billion lost in ag production revenue, $3.5 billion lost in food processing revenues, and then thousands of jobs lost in the ag sector and food processing jobs. And, UC Merced continues to evaluate this. I won't say too much about this. I'll let the speakers talk from their expertise, but the SIGMA uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act enacted in 2014 to try to create more sustainable uh, water basins. And you can see the image on the right-hand side is highlighting the areas of which are called critically overdrafted basins. You can see most of the valley is in that, is in that, um, that scenario. A couple other issues that can come up as a land transitions is the Williamson Act which preserves farmland through contracts between landowners and government agencies, and the Endangered Species Act, which we heard a bit early, about earlier today, that could also play an impact as land, land is transitioned to uh, fallow land in the future. We'll be continuing to work on this as, as a district, uh, and this will take an effort between us here at the local level, the state level, the federal level, to figure out how to manage this. And we are doing work right now to understand the latest research on the, on the issue, what we can do to reduce potential PM increases from from file land and outreach and education is key, as well as getting funding to help support the transition and get some management practices out there for, for file land. So I'll stop there. I'll keep it real brief, and I'll turn it over first to Mark Hudson. And let me give a brief introduction to Mark as he comes up here. Mark Hudson is a walnut and almond farmer in Chowchilla, California, where he has farmed for over 40 years. He is an associate director of the Madera Chowchilla Resource Conservation District and a member of several organizations, including the American Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers. He serves on boards of directors for the East San Joaquin Water Quality Coalition and for the Chowchilla Nitrogen Management Zone, and he is a graduate of the California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo. So, Mark, thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you for having me, John. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, the topic... Uh, I'm kind of falling behind Don, who's the A team on recharge. I'm more like the C team. But uh, the question was, how can the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District help with Sigma? So that's what this talk's about. And uh, Brandon, you're over there. Can you hit that button? There you go. This is a 1997. You could turn the sound down, too. This is 1997 uh, picture of the flood of the San Joaquin River looking from Avenue 7 at the bypass east into farm ground. And as you can tell, uh, it went about a mile and a half to the east from that position. And, Brandon, you can go to the next slide and turn the sound up. This is why I do what I do. Those are bubbles in that area. This is direct recharge. And so when I was a younger man in 19... That's good, Brandon. Thank you. Uh, when I was a younger man in 1997, um, I remembered that and how violent and how loud that recharge was ongoing when that river flood. So that's why I say 
we need to reclaim the floodplains. And now with the farm grounds, the conveyances that we have, we can do that without the destruction of a flood. Uh, this is a previous drought in 2012. Um, I went across the, the uh, Tioga Pass in January. They were ice skating on Tenaya Lake because <laughs> there was no snow. And so I remember that. That's also when uh, Chris White from CCID came knocking at my door and said, you have a subsidence problem. But uh, that's another day. You can hit the button on that, Brandon. This is the east side bypass in 2017. There's probably 8,000 CFS going through there at that time. Thank you. I'll go back one. And that's the picture of the... Um, East, uh, the east side bypass where the Fresno River goes into it, uh, aerial picture, and that's the amount of water that we have coming through on a year like 2017, 2019, which doesn't happen all that much. So how do we recreate a floodplain? Well, we have these things called excavators, chippers. This is a whole orchestra recycling program, so those are the spreaders putting the chips in the ground, on the ground. And that's what it looks like. Um, it's kind of a hard thing because there's a lot of roots still, but it's, uh, there's a lot of organic material sitting there right now. So you bring out the rippers, and you can see the roots are being drawn up by the rippers, so it's, it's something you're going to have to clean up later. So when it's 110 degrees outside in the summertime, and you send your grandsons out there, they're not too happy with you. And they only lasted about 30 minutes, but I did get another older crew out there and we kind of worked through it. We had to quit at like 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning because it was so hot. Uh, I don't have any disking pictures. We did disk it four times and then we had the leveler come out. And so he's leveling that picture, that right now. And then we laid out the flood line. This is uh, the leveling was with the NRCS grant, equip. The, uh, the flood line was also NRCS grant for the flood line. Uh, and I'm also part of the NRCS program for on-farm recharge. So Wendy Rash was just out there this week testing the wells and doing that. So, so what are the positive outcomes for restoring the floodplains on farms? We have more diverse cropping, less monoculture. Uh, increasing the shallow water table, so there's less pumping, less subsidence. Better water quality, lower nitrate levels. Most of our old domestics are above the cork and clay in the shallow aquifer, unconfined aquifer. So the solution to pollution is sometimes just dilution. More water containing excess nitrogen can be pumped on the crops from those shallow aquifers. We have less salts pumped, as we were noticing as the water levels are decreasing, the salts in the water are increasing, which is bad for the crops. Uh, we also have increased areas for birds traveling the flyways and byways, and less energy needed to pump. On the well on my farm, I started out with a 40 horsepower well. Now it's a 75 horsepower motor on it, and I should have over 100 horsepower motor on it. So by lowering water levels, the greenhouse gases are going to be going up. The better water levels in the shallow aquifer, we're going to have, in my opinion, I'm not a scientist, better domestic well testing, less nitrates in the well. I live in the dairy land area. We're in that kind of hot zone in the Chatshaw management zone. Habitat will most likely increase, especially as generational shifts occur. And to the regulators, I'm an old geezer. My kids or the younger farmers are going to be less adverse to easements, conservation easements, than I am. But it's going to take a little time. Some of us guys are going to have to die off. Um, increases the organic matter in the soil. The water holding capacity is greatly increased, and the capture of rainfall is very high. So runoff is greatly minimized, even on the slopes. So Jeff Mitchell does a lot of work with this, and he's got some great slides where he puts a lot of water where there's high organic, he goes straight down. There's not organic matter in the soil, it runs right off. Here's a picture of 2017. It was kind of a wet year that year. And this is a picture of a neighboring farm. It's, I didn't do it very well, but there's a, basically a gully going across the road of runoff. He took his trees out, 
it uh, ran off. It just made a mess. Regional Water Board would have fun with him. This is the same field about a mile up the road where they incorporated the organic ch the chips yeah, back into the soil when they removed the almond trees. This is 2017. It rained like a son of a gun. There was no runoff even in the swale. So there's a lot of benefits to whole orchard recycling that, that, that aren't burning. Um, what are things that uh, deep base recharge is? Let me see if I got this right here. Okay. Recharge areas are not are deep basins. They are not. My trees will die. Um, our, my field is basically old school farming. Flood system, you have a level fall of a half a tenth per thousand, and you can put in, I'm going to be putting barley. So it's a, it could be a sacrificial crop if I have a big wet year. Uh, sometimes planting 100% of my ground. If you're a dairy guy, you want to plant 100% of your ground. If you're me, you want to plant 100% of your ground. I think we need to change that to where I'll leave out 5%, maybe 10, maybe 5. And it's a great help because that designated recharge area, you can have a cover crop, um, whatever, hedgerows, you can do something else. And I'll lose land value by leaving acres out. I'll lose income, but I'm hoping a project like this will help restore the unconfined aquifer, that upper aquifer. That would help lower pumping costs, well repair costs, improve the water quality for the crops, and help avoid drilling a new well. So I got this from uh, Rick Iger, Provost and Pritchard, uh, from the Kern Water Authority when he was working down there. And I want to circle that one right there. Pond depth, half a foot to a foot. This, this right here is your core conflay layer. That's, below that is your confined aquifer. Above that is your unconfined aquifer. So right there. What we're trying to do is bring, what I'm thinking of trying to do is bring back that unconfined aquifer. Bring it back. Okay, this is, it's not my field because I don't have it. Next week it'll be boarded. But this is a neighbor's field, and I just want you to look at the, the berms there. It's an alfalfa field. Mine's going to have checks in it, but that can be used as a recharge area. That's how deep they are. And this is in the red top area. This picture we're taking in the red top area. And uh, they had some good success there. So I see this with farmers, too. And you wonder, what do farmers think about when I talk to them and they think I'm nuts? Because they can't picture it. And there's something, I think someone said, if you want to do small things, change the way you do things. If you want to do big things, change the way you see things. And I basically wanted to show you a history lesson of why I see this differently from that 1997 flood to the red top area in 2012 when we started working on that. Uh, by increasing the number of farms that are set up for recharge, the water districts and GSAs that can supply water have more area on which to apply excess water. And I want to give the water districts some, you know, some shout outs because they are building recharge areas, big basins. But if you get the farmers engaged in this, they're going to have 20,000 acres instead of 200 acres of basins. It's, I mean, we move dirt and lay pipe. That's what we like to do. We like to move dirt and do projects. We just need a goal. Um, this would even include increasing recharge in areas around the disadvantaged communities that may need, in, need increasing groundwater supplies. In other words, if everybody's doing this and they have a limited supply of excess water in a year, they can target that to those, you know, communities like Fairmead or the Ranchos or Madera Valley Lakes, you know, those, those areas. This is 2012 picture of the subsidence in the Red Top area. That's the Sac Dam. Sac Dam was uh, subsiding. <laughs> that was not good for the exchange contractors. So they commissioned a study with Rick Iger and Ken Schmidt. And I think it cost $80,000. And they gave us specific goals. You guys need 1,000 acres of recharge. You guys need to import 10,000 acres of your surface water if it's available. This is 2021. 
the subsidence rate dropped from a half a foot a year to where it's like 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.0, whatever it is, it's went way down. That's just with having goals. My problem sometimes with regulators is they regulate, but they don't give us the goals. That's their sack dam there. Okay, what is the possible role? What's the ask? Okay, for the tree removal cost, it cost me about $40,000 to knock those trees over, grind them up, and stick them in a pile. That's money out. The whole orchard recycling program pretty well covered it. You know, John, thank you, wherever you are. Um, I was out $1,500. That's good. For the recharge, uh, the leveling the field, the flood valve pipeline, the meter, I still haven't done the return system. I'm out $20,000. So basically, I'm out $60,000. I grow 120 acres, 40 acres of open, 40 acres of almonds, 40 acres of walnuts. I am the only worker on there. I can't afford labor. Labor's too high. Fuel's too high. Chemicals are too high. Fertilizer's way too high. All those costs, you're just, you know, I'm, either I'm a, a big grower in the air district size, I'm a small grower in my eyes. So we need to remember these systems I might be able to use these for excess water once every five to seven years. So the recharge amount, I'd like more money. Pardon? I'd like more money. And air district, <laughs> I'd like either the NRCS or the air district or both to look at the removal of the trees, the knocking them down and chipping them up. Because I'd be happy, and this is just me, so don't print this anywhere. I'd be happy as a grower to leave it out of production for a couple of years if that $40,000 I don't have to pay for. You know, if you do the math, if I don't plant for two years, and let's say I plant trees again, I've saved one acre foot, two acre foot, three acre foot. I've saved about, in four years, I've saved six acre feet of water just doing that. There's 60,000 acre, or 60,000 acres of walnut, or almonds being taken out this year. If you do the math, that's a lot of acre feet. So um, we're asking managers to make a major management and operational change. They need help to make that change. This is a scary thing to do. Leave out a field. Don't plant it. You dairy guys, you know, you want to turn it right around and plant it. But if I could get help, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even harvest it. I dry land farm it which means I'd still be farming. Um, I still need to return, uh, build a return system on this, so that's going to be another $25,000. There's a, no way pg e is going to bring me electricity for a 10-horsepower return pump as far as it is. I'm going to have to use the PTO or generator or something like that. And uh, I really feel that the NRCS has a great opportunity here just to do what they did in the 1935 with the Dust Bowl to change things in the Central Valley. I mean, NRCS is great to work for. You call them up, they answer you. They're out there to help. Wendy Rash from Sacramento was out there the other day measuring. Uh, the two guys from the office were there. They're there. They're helpful. Thank you. You have a good tree. Uh, anyway, circle that. That's another problem. In the white areas where there's no water district, they want to get rid of almonds, which is okay. What's a grower going to do? Is he going to spend thousand dollars an acre? Is he going to leave them out there just because he can't farm them anymore? How, how do you justify that expense? So this is what it looks like if you don't do anything after you knock the trees over. You're not being docked for sigma. Your allocation's not being docked, but you have a mess on your hands. This is what it looks like in my neighbor's field where he took the trees out and didn't do anything. Kind of rangeland. This is what you want, I think. So assisting farmers in the wide areas to remove trees that's on land that's coming out of production, and that will be fallow for a number of years. Uh, assist farmers in the water districts to afford the cost to redesign their fields for recharge, recreating the floodplains. And uh, either by direct end to farm, direct grants to farmers, like in the whole orchard recycling program or NRCS programs, help them get the trees down. It's expensive. 
we've been talking about the small farmer. I'm a small farmer. I don't know if I'm going to make it. You know, I've, the two expenses are too high. And literally, I'm, I'm looking at my wife going, you know, this might not be happening now. So I just put these up for fun. Uh, one of the trees had a little nest in there, and I went to go see what was in it. And it's this guy. He had four eggs in it. I go, oh, man. So I have to leave these trees here. So those are the trees we left. Yeah, right there. There were uh, three fledglings that I saw out of those four eggs, so I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. This is a recharge area. You get a lot of birds, flyways and byways. I know the fish get a lot of press, but we got to remember the birds and the baby birds. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for that overview. Very interesting. Appreciate it. Next, we'll have Dr. Andrew Ayers come up and give his overview. Dr. Andrew Ayers is a research fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California Water Policy Center. He is an, an environmental and natural resource economist focused on questions re related to the design, development, and effectiveness of legal and economic institutions for managing the, envir the environment. He holds a Ph.D. in economics and environmental science from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a B.A. in economics from Pomona College. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ayers. Go ahead and give us an overview. Thanks, John. Um, so I'm going to try to keep it quick also. Um, this is going to be a joint work uh, with Jamin Kwan, who's the, back there in the back from Fresno State, um, where we looked at the potential air quality impacts of the land transitions that folks have been teasing in their presentations up until now that are going to come about as a result of SIGMA. This is part of a larger overarching project on climate smart land transitions in the San Joaquin Valley that we're undertaking at PPIC um, that's funded by uh, research dollars from the uh, Strategic Growth Council, California Strategic Growth Council. Um, so to get started, let's talk about SIGMA for a couple slides here. First, this is a, a suite of legislation adopted in 2014 that foresees sustainable groundwater management by 2040 in the state's critically overdrafted basins, of which there are many in, in the San Joaquin Valley. This goal is going to be managed and met by groundwater sustainability agencies, so public agencies formed at the local level uh, in critically overdrafted basins and other basins subject to SIGMA that are going to be, well, have already put together groundwater sustainability plans that are going to lay out how they're going to reach sustainable management. One of the first things that GSAs had to do in putting together these plans was get a handle on how much overdraft they have in their groundwater aquifer. So you'll see in the map that we have on this slide, our recalculation from the amounts reported in the plans of how much overdraft there is in, in basins throughout the valley. Um, so what's shown here is just the, the values for the critically overdrafted basins. That's about 1.7 or 1.75 million acre feet on average annual overdraft. Uh, if you add in, since then we've gotten numbers from the other basins, if you add those in, it looks like it's more like one point. 1.85, a little bit, a little bit more, annual average overdraft there, and this is going to have a big balancing. This groundwater equation is going to have a big, a big impact on the valley. The groundwater sustainability agency's task is to avoid undesirable results of this overdraft, but in practice, what that's really going to mean is solving the groundwater math problem, either through increasing recharge, as has been talked about a little bit today, or reducing pumping, oftentimes probably through fallowing land. The, their toolkit, as I mentioned, is going to involve recharge, permitting wells, trading, potentially, of, of water, which we'll talk about in a moment. But in general, our expectation is that water scarcity will increase. And we've done some work to estimate how many acres might come out of production as a result of this. Valley-wide, it could be 500,000 acres or more, which could represent roughly 10% of the irrigated footprint in the valley. So... We talked a little bit about recharge today. When you add up all of the numbers that are in the groundwater sustainability plans today, our interpretation is that these plans are overestimating the amount of recharge that is going to be available moving forward. In order to balance the groundwater basins in the San Joaquin Valley, they're foreseeing roughly 75% recharge, increasing supplies, and 25% 
reductions in pumping, typically through fallowing land. Our estimation using fairly representative and in some cases generous estimates of how much water could be available for recharge is essentially the inverse, more like 75% fallowing and 25% uh, recharge moving forward. With that much land coming out of production, folks are going to be interested in water trading to help limit the costs, take the lower, the lower value or less productive lands out of production instead of the more productive lands. And this is going to potentially shift fallowing. So what you see in this map on this slide is a map of uh, how much surface water folks have available for irrigation on their lands throughout the valley. And one thing, key takeaway is that it's very unequal. This is sort of one of the first images that you might want to look at if you were trying to get an idea of where's fallowing going to be a big problem in the valley. But this map might change a lot depending on how much people are able to trade surface water and potentially in the future trade groundwater once groundwater markets are set up. I'll return to this a little bit more later. What's important for the Air District is that as if, if these lands are not managed appropriately, they can become nuisances, so sources of pests, weeds, but importantly also dust that can pose a health risk for local communities. Landscape dust from agricultural operations and from, from open fields, so fugitive dust, already is a large source of valley horse particulate matter, and there's a risk that this could increase as this land is taken out of production. In a recent report that I mentioned a moment ago, we identified some priorities for coordinated action. I'll tease those right now. First are, is to clarify responsibilities of what landowners need to do to address the dust that could be coming off of these lands that they take out of production. The second is to identify potential hotspots in the valley where a combination of soil characteristics and other factors and, and the amount of expected fallowing could lend itself to a, a, a potential hotspot or a big problem area. And then the final is to provide funding support to help landowners and groundwater sustainability agencies address this problem up front. So in doing our work on this report, one of the first things we did was look to other experiences from California and elsewhere in the West to understand how agricultural land transitions like this have managed dust, dust risks or dust problems effectively and in some cases ineffectively uh, in the past. So we looked at uh, cases from Imperial, Imperial Valley, Imperial Irrigation District, their program to fallow water to make available, uh, sorry, excuse me, fallow land to make water available for salt and sea mitigation, Antelope Valley, which had uh, very acute and problematic uh, dust issues arise after about 40,000 acres of, of land was taken out of production and grazed intensively. And then also in eastern Washington where new techniques were developed to help manage weeds without rendering the land more susceptible to dust generation. Just to keep things quick, some of our key takeaways from these lessons from elsewhere were the importance of sustained funding to help coordinate action at, at a larger level, like a groundwater sustainability agency type level, and also to compensate landowners for undertaking efforts on their land to suppress dust that otherwise might not pay for themselves. The second was monitoring to understand where you're having success and where you're not. The third was innovation to come up with new tools like those trialed in, in eastern Washington to help make this cheaper and make it make economic sense. And also in some cases, just some luck. Sometimes if it rains, you can establish vegetative cover, and that can be your best friend for suppressing dust. After looking at these cases, we drilled down a little bit closer on the valley and asked, what might this look like here? One of the key takeaways from looking at those cases before also was that they were all relatively small. We're talking perhaps dozens of thousands of acres, not the 500,000 or more that we expect might come out of irrigated production in the valley. Um, so one of the key questions that we got from stakeholders was, what's likely to be the net effect if you're taking land out of agri agricultural production right now that might be generating dust for a number of reasons, uh, and you, if you were to just leave it fallow, what would be the net effect? The answer that we came up with after doing some, some uh, analysis of particulate matter and land, land cover uh, data in the valley was that this really depends on what kind of agricultural um, land use you have prior to idling and what time of year. So just to give an example, almond orchards during a period of harvest tend to give off a lot of dust because the harvest procedure requires dropping the almonds on the ground and oftentimes picking them right up off. During that time, you might actually be better off. But in general, taking land out of production, especially out of row crops or some other sort of uh, vegetative cover, 
presents a risk for local communities in terms of new coarse particulate matter generation. Another big takeaway was that rural areas are more likely to be exposed and that the problem could get worse moving forward with climate change as an increasingly arid climate is likely to compound these risks by making soils, reducing soil moisture and making them more likely to be mobilized by wind processes and carried farther, thus exposing uh, uh, additional communities. Some communities in the valley are likely to face heightened risk relative to others, and this is something we can map. So in these two side-by-side -side maps on this side, on this slide you'll see on the left, community water systems within the valley, which is uh, sort of a, a, a point that we use to, put, to identify small communities throughout the valley, colored by their dust risk, by, by their level of dust risk. And so this is based on a composite indicator that depends on the local soil types as well as the pre-existing particulate matter concentrations in the region. So among the several hundred community water systems that we identified in the valley, roughly 40 or 45 percent of those are high risk according to the procedure that we applied here. And among those, 75 percent of them are expected to see at least some level of fallowing under sigma in nearby within about a mile or a mile and a half of the location of the community water system. And you can see that on the right-hand side map. So the right-hand side map is those same community water systems located throughout the valley, but colored now by the amount of following that might be expected under sigma if there's no water trading. So one of the key takeaways here is not just there are risks for valley communities, but also if water trading shifts around who's able to continue irrigating under sigma, that might have uh, significant implications for which communities are at risk. Um, what can we do about these risks? So reducing risks, okay, just a couple minutes, all right, requires action on these idled lands. One of the takeaways from our, from our report was that maintaining vegetative cover is one of the simplest and most cost-effective approaches for reducing dust risk on these lands. These cheapest options can sometimes run 10 to $30 per acre, acre to establish vegetative cover like hedgerows, uh, but that depends a lot on the spatial extent of the project and what techniques are used. There are other uh, alternative methods like covering the ground with, ground with mulch or gravel. There's a more costly, longer term benefits. Um, probably not going to be an economically viable option for most landowners. Almond shells though are emerging as a low cost option. And there's residual left over from removing trees potentially as part of the whole uh, orchard recycling program Mark talked about. Those can be used to spread over uh, potentially risky areas. And one of the key uh, concerns or challenges here is going to be that these lands are coming out of production because there's no water left to irrigate them. Vegetative cover establishment may require that. In another report released by PPIC uh, last year, we showed that Water-limited farming or agriculture might be possible on these lands with as little as four to eight inches of supplemental irrigation, much less than is currently being used. So that's an opportunity moving forward. Um, I'll skip over this. Um, just taking a moment to mention here that the Conservation uh, Management Pro Practice Program uh, managed by the district under Rule 4550 has helped the Valley attained PM standards in the past and revisions and updates to that plan that bring in opportunities and, and options for farmers to control and uh, dust on lands that are coming out of production can potentially be really important in terms of getting out ahead of this problem. And more to the point, how can Valley communities and the Air District get out ahead of this problem? First, improve understanding of dust risk in these rural areas. One of the key takeaways from our report is that we don't have enough monitoring and information to really understand the nature of the risk. There need to be more tools to identify these emissions risks and identify hotspots where fouling could lead to problems. The second is clarify GSA and landowner responsibilities. Who needs to do what on these lands um, and who needs to pay for it? Again, I, I mentioned the CMP update a moment ago. That can be a key uh, forum for this. And finally, leverage existing funding programs and develop new ones. So two things to mention here are USD and NRCS through the EQIP program has been mentioned quite a few times even just in the last 30 minutes I've been here. Under EQIP there's a cover cropping initiative that can be can provide a good option opportunity for farmers to get money to help uh, cover the cost of cover cropping moving forward. And finally the California Department of Conservation also has uh, a multi-benefit land repurposing program 
that initially had $50 million allocated to it. That $50 million was all spent. Just recently, an additional $40 million has been put into that pot to help support solutions for lands coming out of production due to Sigma that can help provide public benefits like dust suppression, uh, suppressing dust. Uh, and just one last slide to note that as part of this broader project, we had this report come out on air quality. There are two companion r reports on water-limited agriculture and the opportunity for solar development on some of these lands coming out of production. We have an upcoming policy brief that's going to expand on and update our following estimates. Uh, so the 500,000 or so acres coming out of production, what is that going to look like with better information that we have available to us today? That will be released early next year. And finally, there will be a synthesis report tying this all together and laying out a pathway for climate smart land transitions uh, also coming out in spring 2023. And with that, I'll stop and you can go to the next speaker. Thanks, Andrew, for that overview of your research. Really appreciate it. Next, we'll have Carlos Suarez, California NRCS. We've already introduced Carlos, so yeah. I won't do that again. So, right. thank you, thank you, Carlos. Come on up. I'm here. I'm putting my timer. So it's seven minutes. <laughs> well, the time police will get you. No, I only have two slides, folks. Uh, but. A lot, of, a lot of what I was going to say is actually had been said already, which is good. Uh, I just want to basically, <clears throat> I just want to basically share with you, as an agency, what are we doing with farmers how are, uh, and other entities and, and partners to support Sigma, to so Sigma efforts and support farmers and communities uh, comply with Sigma. With Sigma. <clears throat> so... We are going to continue working, you know, with the, our current existing programs and uh, and practices to help our landowners address segment-related land following. And what we have been doing in that regard is uh, looking at our existing practices and conservation practices uh, that we currently have. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, cover crop. That's definitely one of the practices that we we are working with, and I'll, I'll mention it in, in the following slide. Uh, but there are other practices as we work with farmers and ranchers um, and also with uh, our uh, partners, uh, like Resource Conservation Districts uh, and others, the CDFA, Department of Conservation, and other entities, uh, to identify those practices and how those, the practices that we have in existence can support uh, the work that is being done under SIGMA. But also looking at, uh, at opportunities where we may have to adopt practices or use practices as a pilot. And uh, I think Don, Don may have left already, but uh, we'll talk about, uh, in the next slide, I will talk about our efforts on recharge that we have been doing and what Mark alluded to. Uh, we have a pilot uh, program or pilot practice to help with that. But as it relates to, again, as it relates to Sigma, what are the resource concerns that we have to identify as an agency to address that and utilize our conservation practices. Uh, that, and that includes soil erosion. You know, if we leave follow land, one of the concerns that have been expressed by many is as land will be followed or is left, left follow, how do you contain or maintain the soil erosion or eliminate or reduce soil erosion, uh, whether it's through wind or uh, uh, what we call classic erosion and the, and the soil. Also runoff as occurs from, uh, from rain and precipitation, also water quality and water quantity. That does have an impact on not only in the water quantity, but also in the water quality of the, of, of the water that we, uh, we have going into the, uh, into the ground and, surf and water available for irrigation and other sources. Wildlife habitat, it's, it's sometimes it's not mentioned as much, but it, it is as equally important as we had a lot of uh, species that are being threatened and endangered in, in the state. As a case in point, and this is something, uh, an example of collaboration where we uh, we have worked, uh, not necessarily in Sigma, but it can be definitely expanded through Sigma, is the work that we have done in tri tricolor blackbird and the protection of tricolor blackbird, working with dairy producers, with NRCS, Audubon Society, and other entities to do that. So health and other factors that definitely are key. <clears throat> We're going to be continuing working with key partners to develop conservation plan that address um, land following and potential for soil and land 
uh, degradation as appropriate. Who are those partners? And many of you, if, if not all of you, at, at some point are touched by that, but also other partners uh, at the local level, area level, regional level within the state. Some, uh, there's this saying, and which I, <laughs> I learned moving into the mainland, you know, all politics are local. Well, all conservation is local too. And what you utilize in conservation, say, in Northern California may not necessarily apply in San Joaquin or Central Coast and so forth. So you have to adapt your practices. You have to adapt the management that you utilize to protect the resources. So what are some of the practices that are currently underway uh, for uh, in, in support of Sigma or supporting farmers obtain Sigma? We want to show three practices, micro-irrigation being one of them, you know, improving the irrigation systems uh, and how you apply that water, the timing, the amount of water, and the timing that is applied. Also, irrigation water management. And there's this fallacy sometimes that flooding is, you know, using flooding is bad uh, for, uh, for irrigation. Flooding, as with any other irrigation practice, if done appropriately and timely and contained, can actually benefit groundwater recharge on, on, on the farm. So that's something that we have learned through, through this process and implementing the practices. And as you mentioned earlier, cover crop. Cover crop is something that is, is uh, something that is, is a practice that continues to pick up in California. It's not as popular as, say, in the Midwest or other states, but far, through, again, through partnership, working with the UC system, working with, uh, uh, Mark, you mentioned Jeff Mitchell, who has been a paramount on that, but many others working with uh, the districts, working on est establishing uh, I, uh, what I call it pilot projects uh, to show the benefits of cover crop. It's picking up and it's definitely showing the benefits of applying it on the ground. What mentioned Michael in the pilot interim practice, uh, we have a groundwater recharge. Don Cameron has been a pioneer on this and many other partners in identifying the benefits of doing groundwater recharge. We established a, an interim practice as a result of those studies and those uh, uh, practices that had, were tested in uh, Madeira and Tulare. One of them is on farm recharge basin and the other one on farm flooding. What is the purpose of that? Is not only test utilizing that with our financial assistance uh, funding through EQUIP to fund those practices, what Mark, that's what Mark was uh, alluding to, but the target is to actually expand it throughout the state so that more farmers, more ranchers can take benefit of that practice. Uh, an example also through the uh, Regional Conservation Partnership Program, uh, we have the uh, Racing City and McMillan area, who is actually take, taking recharge and using that program and funding to uh, establish recharge in the area. And also, I want to end up by uh, talking about the, our partner agency, the Bureau of Reclamation and the Water Smart Partnerships, where it works with irrigation districts, irrigation uh, throughout the state that receive funding through the Water Smart program to improve their, uh, their times for me to, to end. Uh, that work through the <laughs> Water Smart Partnership is uh, work to irrigation systems to improve the conveyance of those uh, uh, those entities, and in turn, those farmers that are uh, receiving water from those irrigation districts can then participate and receive funding in EQIP. So therefore, it's a partnership effort, not only from the entity side, but also from the uh, farmer side as well. So with that, I'll end up here, and uh, I guess we'll, we'll have some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. So last but certainly not least, we have Ryan Jacobson, who is the CEO of Fresno County Farm Bureau. He currently serves as president of the Fresno Irrigation District Board of Directors, vice chair of the Kingswater River Water Association, chair of Fresno County Ag Land Conservation Committee, and serves on the boards of California Farmland Trust and the Rotary Club of Fresno Foundation. So thanks, Ryan, for being here. Appreciate it. So apparently I'm the only thing standing between you guys and dinner right now, right? Yeah, I see lots of head nodding. So I don't even have a PowerPoint. I want to make this simplistic. So uh, Yeah, but you're so, a TV personality. So well, yeah, well, something like one. that. 
I feel like I should be tag teaming this with my supervisor buddy, but uh, because he knows more and, than I ever will know. So, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Let me begin with a very simplistic statement: Food grows where water flows. I hope all of you have heard that saying before, and I say it very explicitly in the sense of. Obviously, the spigots have been shut off. We have had some extraordinarily difficult times when it comes to water. But let's talk about what this region does mean. I mean, this region is food. We produce, California produces somewhere in the neighborhood of two-thirds of the nation's fruits, one-third of the nation's vegetables. How many of you have seen those uh, lettuce prices recently? Um, you know, it's things like that. When California suffers somewhere, the nation's fleet suffers. Uh, but then you take the eight San Joaquin Valley counties that's represented by this room, that would be the number two state behind California as a whole if you put the ag value of that. The ag value of those eight counties represents about 75% of the total ag value for the state of California. So I say all this in the sense that every single American is taking a bite out of our region on a daily basis. It is very likely they are eating something that originated from our backyard here. And yet I think that the nation hasn't come to realize the significance of what this region plays in that role. Um, I heard earlier Don mentioned the uh, 100 agencies. I think Manuel and I stopped at like 70. I didn't know it's up to 100 now. But 100 agencies that a farmer and rancher may come into contact with. Um, ask Buddy, ask any farmer in this room, anybody, any farmer you know in contact, and it's been kind of a death by a 1,000 cuts the last two decades. But the water issues we're talking about is the sword cut. It's the sword to the head. Uh, for so many farmers and ranchers throughout this region, this is going to be their their final, their final thing. I mean, this is something that is very real. It's the thing that keeps folks up at night. It is the issue that pretty much I talk about only on a day-to-day -day basis. I used to have a whole list of issues when I started 18 years ago with the Farm Bureau of all the issues we work on. And today that issue is basically, I mean, that, that, that slide is basically two, and it's water and other. The other is very important, but water kind of drives so much of what we're doing here. But don't be, let it be confused. Don't get caught up in the buzzwords. You're going to hear so much about Sigma, but it's not Sigma that got us here where we are today. There's a whole host of water issues that got us here where we are today. It's obviously we're in the middle of the midst of a Mother Nature drought. We have the man-made drought, the ESA issues, delta pumping restrictions, river restoration, fishery management programs, lack of infrastructure, water quality, on and on and on. That the totality of all these got us to the situation that we find ourselves in. California's water system does not work the way it was designed and operated to. It functions much differently today, which has led us to these um, environmental restrictions that's put us in real jeopardy. When you talk about basically the crosshairs of the drought, the crosshairs of everything happening, it's right here, arguably in Buddy's district. I'm just going to say the west side of Fresno County because we've been seeing it now for almost a decade and a half, or approximately 15 years. You go back in water allocations on the west side, 45%, 80%, 40%, 20%, 0%, 0 100%, 50 75 20 0, 0 Those zeros, those tens, those 20s, those are all livelihoods that are being jeopardized. And we've been seeing this over the course of over a decade now. And going forward, it's going to be exacerbated. It's going to get worse. We know it's going to be significant. We know the impacts. You know, thank you for the numbers. It means you guys have seen other PPIC reports. You've seen the, uh, hopefully most of you in this room have seen the blueprint report that talks about the lost, you know, jobs. You know, realistically, we probably are talking more like a million acres that potentially is going to be fallowed with all of the water restrictions we see. Um, 85,000 potential, you know, direct, indirect jobs. Um, the numbers from UC Merced, you know, those are a great starter point, but I would actually argue those are probably much on the lower side of what realistically is happening out there on the farm. Um, so the sincerity of, you know, I'm coming here to basically talk about the human impact and the effect that it's having on the farmers and ranchers in our areas, um, it is going to be devastating. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. The timeline is realistically in the next five to ten years we're going to see the greatest impacts. Um, you know, there may be the potential for that to be expediated if the state was to stop, uh, step in sooner and try to expedite some of these timelines. And so realistically, we know that there are going to be broken communities. There's going to be broken um, uh, farms. There's going to be a lot of issues that need to be dealt with here. I know that the parts, you know, the issue with this one was talking about some of the uh, ramifications on the farm and what that means, dust being one of them. I think one of the things I want to leave the district with is, you know, obviously when we talk about the importance of these farmers, I mean, they are losing ground that has, you know, currently be productivity. I'm, I probably like Buddy, Manuel, and other folks in this room hope that someday that there is going to be a realization that what was lost here needs to be brought back into production because we have to grow, feed a growing population. Uh, the last number, I just looked it up, 7.98 billion stomachs on planet Earth. Between the years 2010 and 2050, so a 40-year period, we're tw you know, 12 years into that, but that 40-year period, we have to grow more food than all the previous mankind combined. And so there will come a time we have to grow food, more food here, and just find a way to figure out the water situation. 
So when we start talking about some of the solutions, first and foremost, recognizing some of this may be temporary, some of this may be longer living, but also recognizing that these farmers and ranchers are having their livelihoods, uh, livelihoods impacted, and so additional cost and burdens need to be figured out and compensated and um, obviously, you know, fixed and, and resolved with those farmers, but also things that need to be considered. I mean, when you talk about uncultivated land out on the west side, you, for those of you who know anything about, you know, the historical practices of the valley, uncultivated, uncultivated land could lead to ESA issues and some other things. You heard Don mentioning it about trying to put more hedgerows in and trying to do more with uh, habitat, um, but there are unintended consequences that come with that. And so farmers and ranchers don't want to leave that land untilled for too long because of the situations that may be caused from that. You know, fire, uh, fire risk, um, you know, the, I, I mentioned the potential to return to agriculture. There's a lot of things that need to be thought of as we go through this process because there are going to be major, major situations that are going to, that we're not thinking about now. Some of them we're thinking about, you know, maybe more intensely. Other things are going to arise. But overall, the impacts that we're looking at for the water situation here in the valley is going to be very significant, and it is going to take more than just the Air District. It's going to take some partnerships. I mean, thank you, thank you, Carlos, for being here today, but it's going to be federal, state, local, everybody coming to the table, trying to resolve these issues, and most importantly, like I said, I'll leave here today with the understanding that we need just to find solutions to these water issues because that helps to resolve all these other things that I'm talking about. And with that, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Thank you. That was, that was a great panel, a lot of, a lot of good information. I, I just want to conclude with a couple of things that I don't think were said, you know, on, um, um, on farm and groundwater, you know, uh, um, uh, when we use flood water to recharge. Flood water has a season. Okay, this is a it's a time factor deal. Some years it can start in January. Some years it don't start until March and April. But by G uh, July first, it's about done. So you have to do, be able to do on farm recharge, and not just have recharge in ponding basins. And I'll use what. FID and, and uh, consolidated have a large ponding system and can do a lot of ponding type uh, field. But you have to have on farm because it's a seasonal deal. It comes quick. It's a time factor. The other deal is I'm going to switch gears on Sigma itself. Sigma was, they tried to mirror Sigma from the adjudicated basins in Southern California. But that was really a bad concept because those adjudicated basins are separated by mountain ranges in a lot of places. Where the valley, everybody's interconnected. It's symbiotic. There's no barriers underground to keep the, keep the water from going from one basin to another. So they're together. Another problem is DWR and the State Water Board are starting to look at 2040 and 2025. They want to use the intent of the law that says 2040. They want to implement it in 2025 or earlier. So th there's a... I've had people actually tell me that they think we'd be better off if we fired all the engineers and went and hired lawyers, just lawyer, lawyered up. And let me tell you, I've worked on in Sigma for eight years now. I think I've seen everything. And it's just getting worse every day. But thank you for your, we really don't have time for a lot of questions. And uh, you guys are a great panel. It was a lot of great information. Because we cannot run it through our filters. They'll plug up in oh, 10 seconds. I know that. Seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so we need the flood systems. We need the return systems. We need the ability to do that. And that's where we need help to do it. You need NRCS help, Airboard help, a lot of people's help. 
because your problem is going to be our problem. I kind of follow your line of thinking. There's a lot of studies being done, but the people that are actually going to do the work are the guys like me. Exactly. So the studies, I mean, how long do you study something? Right. We're get, we are going to get stuck trying to take care of this. Because I still farm 1,800 acres. So I know, I know where you're going. I'm a small guy, too. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I make yeah, a, a closing announcement here? So um, we are going to wrap up uh, day one activities here. I um, wanted to thank everybody again on behalf of the team here. There are some themes here that resonate. I'm just going to say a few key words. Engagement, and this particularly um, discuss with the agencies, but also PPAC and others that are doing this really good work. I think the more we engage, and this is a, a forum for that, I really hope that we can, we can learn from this. <laughs> Research, innovation, time sensitivity, and funding, funding, funding. And I think that we, you know, th we just barely got scratching on the surface here today on, on the issue. So I, I see a lot of follow-up in the region that we're, we're happy to help look for ways to facilitate some more conversation on this. And I'm looking to, to Carlos, and I'm looking at actually everybody here to, to see if we can find a way to actually build on what we talked about today and not miss the moment when it comes to the budget discussions, the IRA and everything else to really try to bring uh, some of that together. So there's some, definitely some themes that I try to extract from everybody's comments. Um, if you guys um, wouldn't mind hanging around a little bit afterwards, there's a lot of stakeholders here who probably have a lot of, you know, maybe some questions, maybe want to chat with uh, different individuals here. Um, once we wrap up here, not maybe in the form of public commenting, but right. just going to ask folks to maybe hang around for a little bit longer just to have some of those conversations if possible afterwards, and I'll turn it back to you, I think. Oh, Jamie, anything on... Um, any details on, on dinner or anything else you wanted to mention? Yes. Uh, so dinner is here. Some of our staff has headed back uh, to the office um, and home, but those members of the public, our speakers, we'd love for you to stay. Um, there will be some fellowship time, no host style here opening in about 20 minutes. Um, and you will have enough food, so if you're a stakeholder member of the public here, you'd like to say you're more than welcome. And just real quick, because I know so many of you know and love him and I like him very so. Hey, Jamie, what time is dinner? When will be ready? Uh, half the hour is yeah, going to be starting, hopefully, here in just a few minutes. Dinner's at 6. If you have a room, I encourage you to check into your room because some of them are a little bit of a walk. Most of the board and the uh, some of the exec team, they're kind of right over here. So uh, it, you can't drive over there. So maybe find out where your room is, check in, and then make your way back here. Okay, so we're adjourned until tomorrow morning. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I got cover. I don't need to bring it to, to uh, you know, a full-blown back to order. So we're just continuing from where we started. That's great. <clears throat> so we'll move to the next uh, next item. Do you want to key it in? Or? Yeah, let's introduce Item 15. Item 15, I'd like to introduce uh, Jessica Olson, who's our Director of Community Strategies and Resources. Her and her, her team, but most importantly across the district, um, her role is to really help the district um, continue to expand its work in connecting communities to the, the work that we do, our public health mission, and get them more involved in the various <laughs> aspects of our operations. And so Jessica is going to provide an update on some of those efforts and some of the, the next steps and recommendations in terms of that that overall effort. So with that, Jess? Absolutely. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Right, before you get started, too, just for the record, I want to call out that his role taking yesterday was clear. Council Mayor Preciado was going to be Thank you, Annette, and thank you, Chair. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jessica Olson, Director of Community Strategies and Resources, as Samir said. And I'm here today to walk us through the district's community engagement efforts and talk about some enhancements we think we can make um, to the overall efforts and certainly on the community strategies and resources team. 
Um, so your board has always prioritized providing space for meaningful community engagement across all of the district's air quality strategies. Um, as an example of some of that priority that you've placed in 2007, your board adopted the district's environmental justice strategy um, to help support these efforts. And in recent years, your board has been really involved in implementation of AB 617 or the Community Air Protection Program, which is certainly a, a part of community engagement and establishing community-driven strategies here at the district. Um, expanding community focused staffing resources has really happened under the establishment of the district's community strategies and resources team, um, which has been led by the deputy APCO of community programs and enforcement, and of course, um, under my new role as the director of community strategies and resources. So today, I'm just going to walk us through many of the efforts that we've done to lead and engage communities that have been disproportionately impacted by economic and environmental equities, inequities, rather, and how to forge new partnerships and maybe identify new opportunities to engage new groups of folks um, in all of the great work that we do here at the district. So really to support a lot of the efforts that the community strategies and resources team have done, we've been following a set of established principles of meaningful community engagement. So um, some of those principles include proactive community involvement, which really means actively seeking out community input, making sure we're in the communities, um, really seek, speaking the language um, of the folks in that community, and trying to um, get their input in some of these effective cleaner solutions. Um, equitable, equitable community access is a really important principle. Again, and that's not just the, the language access, but providing access and, and seeking times and venues that make sense to engage community members and making sure we're reaching the right community folks and the people we need to be reaching. And then community-focused outreach, making sure we're intentionally reaching the communities um, and the populations that need it the most. And a lot of those are really grounded in the environmental justice principles that we'll outline today and that really have guided the work, again, through the establishment of the EJ strategy that your board adopted um, over a decade ago. So I'm just going to highlight sort of five areas of focus that we've um, really, with your board's leadership, been um, driving towards in effective community engagement really for the past several years. The first is community-focused outreach. Um, this is providing um, materials in, in Spanish and maybe other languages, um, making sure we have accessible educational opportunities, participating in health fairs, going into the communities, and talking um, with the residents within those communities, and providing real-time information. So um, what we mean by this is presenting key information not only to community groups and residents, but also to municipalities, to cities and counties, um, to boards, to folks that we know are working within the communities themselves that can also help disseminate that information. And so our team, um, even before the establishment of, of the community strategies team, have been working on these efforts um, for many, many years. And you can just see here on the right, this is an example of one of those efforts in Stockton, working with some great community folks, some community members, some business leaders, um, all working together to reach out to the community. Another um, effort and something that we'll discuss really in more detail in the next item, of course, is AB 617. That is essentially established in statute as a community-driven program. And of course, a lot of the efforts um, on our team to implement the program is one of the main components of what we do day to day. So that's actually running the CSC meetings and engaging with folks. And that's an example you can see primarily virtually within the past few years here on the left. Um, but we also do it in person, and that's something that we'll talk about a little later in the presentation of how we continue um, as we emerge from the pandemic um, to respond to communities, to engage directly with residents and really reach the communities in need in most. And as I mentioned, um, kind of the efforts ongoing here and kind of progress that we've been making will be our next item. Um, the third piece, and really um, something that's kind of an overarching piece of the kind of five main efforts I'm going to talk about today is supporting air quality programs. Of course, the two that I just mentioned are also air quality programs. But really what we mean here is how do we get community engaged in really like the bread and butter of what the district does? So the planning efforts, the rulemaking efforts, how are we actively seeking input from folks? And so a lot of what our team does is reach out to community members to let them know about rulemaking processes, especially those that we understand and, and know affect them the most. How do we get them involved? How are we responsive in some of our other core programs like enforcement um, and providing quick and professional responsiveness? Um, how do we engage with other agency partners? And when we hear about multi-jurisdictional issues, which we often do when we do community work, and making sure that our agency partners are helping respond in the same manner that we are. And then finally, how do we take in, um, to account some of the established 
uh, groups and perspectives. And what I mean by that is our Citizens Advisory Committee and our environment, uh, Environmental Justice um, advisory group. How do we take those perspectives in and making sure that we're taking everything really through the lens of all of the different folks we have to advise us um, in some of this work. All of this is grounded in environmental justice and so this is kind of the fourth um, effort that we've been working on in, as I mentioned many, many times, understanding the community need, but also working with some of the environmental justice groups, um, some of the residents, and then again, a lot of you um, through your direction in evaluating the accessibility and the reach that our programs have. And then of course, here on the bottom right hand um, side, you can see back when we were in person, that's our environmental justice advisory group. And here on the left, this is us meeting with Stockton residents and really getting an understanding, I know, um, as Vice Mayor Fugazi knows, an understanding from these community leaders of what they want before we even establish programs. We go in there with now an understanding of what um, folks have been looking for, why they want to engage with us, and what we can do to help them. So that's really a driving principle of a lot of what our team does. And then finally, and, and something that's so important, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do in these communities if we didn't have a strong culture here at the district. And we're going to talk a lot more um, today about our star work culture, but something that's embedded within that work culture is really our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, continuing to advance and cultivate that culture um, really allows us as a team, not just on my small team, but really across the district, to make sure we're engaging with these community members in a meaningful way that really connects with them. Um, and we're just so grateful to have that opportunity and to have this really embedded in our work culture. These are actually examples, and we'll talk a little bit more, I think, later today, um, of some of the um, cultural celebrations that we've had here at the district that, I, again, I think have really helped ground us and drive us in a lot of our efforts and work. Uh, you know, it's not just across the district that community focus is really important and that environmental justice is at the head of everything that's being done. Um, there are a lot of growing community engagement focus efforts um, across the nation. And so the first that I'm mentioning here is, of course, at EPA. Um, just a couple of months ago, they created the new Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights and finalized their EJ Action Plan um, the California Air Resources Board, of course, is at the head of AB 617, um, but they've also um, continued to evaluate opportunities across all of their programs to enhance environmental justice efforts. OEHA, who we heard from yesterday, um, has really been at the forefront more on the research and tools side in developing tools. One of um, many that you have heard of and that we talk about often is the Cal Enviro Screen Tool, which is, allows us to evaluate um, across the state, but certainly in our region, um, the communities that need um, sort of intervention or uh, environmental justice support the most. And then, of course, other air districts. Other air districts are implementing AB 617 um, and building their community strategies and resources groups similar to ours to support these outreach and engagement efforts. So what I really wanted today to do not only was to focus on all of the great work that we've been doing under your board's leadership, um, but also look for opportunities for enhancement. I've already mentioned a couple um, that we think could just really um, help us provide, I think, just more meaningful community engagement. And the first is really meeting face-to-face. -face. Um, we mentioned here CSCs, so we are speaking a little bit to AB 617, but really across the board, as we're coming out of the pandemic, and I think as we all know, it's not just Zoom fatigue, but we realized that the meaningful and maybe more focused and perhaps even more respectful conversations happen when you're in person. And we just think that's so important and something that we want to start to increase and we want to build capacity to be able to do once again. We also want to increase community level engagement, not just with the community groups and residents that have already been with us, but reaching new folks. What are the community groups that you all work with um, that we all know about or maybe residents want to help us connect with that haven't yet heard about the district. There are there's still plenty out there, right? We've done a lot of work, but there are a lot of other people that we need to connect with. And how do we take um, our ability to do this type of work and spread it kind of more broadly across the district? We also want to work in new communities. That's sort of related to that second bullet, but really, um, even if it's with community groups we already know and residents we're already aware of, we know that the four communities selected for AB 617 aren't our only EJ communities, and there are obviously communities all across our district that need our support and our help. Um, so how do we work and move forward? I, I mentioned just a few here as examples of 
um, directly from community residents and community advocates, some communities that we know we want to focus on, um, but there are many more than just the three examples that are listed here. And then finally, and something that um, uh, I really want to hit on, it's something that Supervisor um, uh, uh, Peterson said yesterday during our house schools item was, how do we make sure we're getting the word out there about the progress that we're making and all of these best practices? And that's something we feel that the community strategies and resources team can be really poised to do and find opportunities to connect with residents, maybe local um, and regional and national agency leadership, um, media partners, maybe grassroots community organizations, and really share all of the good work, share in the progress that we're making um, and, and try to just engage just a little bit better. Um, and so with that, I'm actually going to, um, Brandon's going to share a video really quickly that we think is just a really good example um, highlighting how this in-person community engagement interaction can really be, really be beneficial for all. Today we're in the South Central Fresno community, which is part of AB 617. As a part of this AB 617 effort, one of the measures to help clean air quality is to exchange gas-powered lawnmowers for electric mowers. This is an example of where, listening to the community, we hear what they need and work with them to provide brand new electric lawnmowers, scrapping old high-polluting lawnmowers, and bringing those air pollution reductions right into the home, right at the community level where it matters the most. There's folks that were lined up here before the event. They, they know that the Air District puts on really good events that are beneficial to them personally, beneficial to the environment. This is a great opportunity to show that small changes with the, with the help and collaboration of government and private entities can yield public health results. Councilmember Bessinger and Dr. Pacheco Warner for coming out to that event. That was just a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, please. I want to thank Samir. He was loading several lawnmowers and cars. Um, but again, of course, that was an AB 617 effort, but that doesn't just have to be an AB 617 effort. We want to start doing more work like that in these communities. Um, and so if we can just go back to the presentation. Um, we are proposing some staffing enhancements to the community strategies and resources team, which again, as I mentioned before, that team is really leading um, these efforts and providing guidance in support of all of these community level strategies um, policies. We're proposing to add one senior air quality specialist um, and one air quality specialist really to meet your board's expectations with respect to these valley wide um, community engagement efforts and the proposed enhancements that I've discussed today. Um, and this really is um, supported by available state grant funding that we already have in the budget. Um, and you can see the fiscal impact listed here on the slide. So with that, I'm happy to turn it back over to the chair and I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, so, Mr. Chair, uh, board, board members, just a couple of quick closing comments on this one. First, just thanks to Jess for a great presentation. Her and her team uh, do work very, very hard to um, really support our efforts. I think it's a mic. Let me, there, is that? A little better. Thank you, Mr. Cunha. I just wanted to thank Jess and her team. They do a really good job of looking for innovative ways to keep expanding community engagement. As we all know, um, there's a wealth of information that is becoming available. We talk a lot about that in, in, in the context of air quality tools. There's our school efforts. There's AB 617. There's so many different issues that come up throughout the year. We're a huge basin, eight counties, 60 cities, over 4 million residents. And so there are a lot of opportunities, in our opinion, to connect with many of the organizations, civic organizations, community organizations that are on the ground doing work that also present opportunities for getting them involved in different grant programs and learning about the air quality progress that's being made and where to, where to best get information, for example. And so we 
we think that there is some pretty low hanging fruit in this space and that's where the recommendations are coming from. Um, Jess currently has one senior and one specialist working in her team, but obviously they support the district as a whole. They've actually embedded themselves in every single aspect of what we do so that when we think about you know, some of these new and emerging issues, we can take advantage of the best practices and lessons that we've learned in that process. And just one, one quick example of where we really saw this payoff when the Arvin Lamont Community Mission Reduction Program went to the CAR board just several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the, many of the board members there on the CAR board, and th good morning, I want to acknowledge Dr. Pacheco Warner um, being here as well right now, um, uh, called it the best uh, program, the best community engagement process they've ever seen in the history of the 617 program. And it was just a total positive engagement. I think we have about 70, 75 residents that are involved in, in the steering committee at, the, at that level. <laughs> and we actually have a great supervisor who's uh, dedicated his, uh, his time and his staff's time to, to help with that process as well. Um, so <laughs> and by the way, also a, a great planning director at Kern County who's also been uh, very, <laughs> very helpful. The list is long, the list is long. But the two, the two key folks here are definitely the supervisor and Dr. Pacheco Werner uh, being on the card board when that went to, to them as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge um, that there is, a, there is a, a good payoff in terms of community support for what we do when we engage effectively and, and really um, put energy in, into that effort. And with that, I'll turn it back to the board okay. for discussion. That is a recommendation before you. It's one of the few votes, I believe, that's on the agenda for the right. this. This is action and action item. So, mm -hmm. And I'm going to turn it over to Vice Mayor Bogas. Thank you. Um, I know that this work is so incredibly important, and it's not enough just to get the information out there because there are people that think that there's some catch, that this is a scam, that this is, you know, you're gonna, they're going to get out there and then it's going to be like, oh, by the way, you have to bring us $100. Mm -hmm. um, and removing the barriers. I mean, I'm interested to know, did you run out of lawnmowers that day? I mean, did you get through the inventory? Did everybody that brought one, got one? Yep, everyone that came. And we even had folks that came and waited hours because they didn't pre-sign up that were still able to take one away. Folks were very interested and are still interested. Yes, and I can't wait for that to happen in Stockton. In, yes. <laughs> um, because it, it's something that I think we've all brought up is removing those barriers because it was a voucher. You know, we're going to give you a voucher, then you got to go yep. to this vendor, and we're only going to give you up to this amount of money. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It didn't happen. For a lot of people I spoke to, they were like, uh, I'll just keep using my gas-powered mow mower. Yeah. But setting that up, and like I said, removing all those barriers, just pull up, give us yours, and we'll give you one. Take one, give one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, it, it showed to be very prosperous and a successful uh, effort. And I look forward to more of those because in our community, people are skeptical mm -hmm. um, as to, you know, what is this, who's in charge, and how is it going to negatively affect me? And we've said... You know, even with the um, uh, tune in, tune up, and drive clean the San Joaquin, or clean cars for all, or whatever, that people are like, mm, I don't know, I don't know if I can trust this, and you're asking a lot of me in order for me to participate in this program. So I love seeing that. Thank you so much. Thank you for being involved in, in our communities, and I would say the AB 617 uh, process, getting those uh, uh, members of the community that touch the people mm -hmm. of our diverse community is so important. So thank you for your efforts. Okay, that was a good quote too. Did you hear that one, Jamie? Which if, one? if you brought one, you yeah. got one. That was brilliant. I love it. Who's next? We should, go ahead. Great question. We actually have a third party facilitator that is a neutral party. They are there to intervene and help run the meetings. Um, and they were actually selected with um, like a, an open process by community members. So they're really well respected by the community and have really built a relationship alongside us with those community members. We actually, honestly, um, you know, there's the occasional comments or, or something that we work with the facilitators to make sure is addressed. 
Um, but for the, by and large, these meetings have been really have really come a long way. I'll say in the past two years. That doesn't mean that we don't still see a value in going face to face, though. And we do think that those Zoom meetings, to your point, not only just through the screen is maybe people feel like there's a barrier. Or, or some sort of shield, but also the chat and some other opportunities for folks to, to maybe go off, off course a little bit. Um, but yeah, no, for the most part, that third party facilitation team and really the relationship building with these members has really come a long way. Mr. Chair, just add another quick um, point on that. Uh, one of the values that we see out of the efforts, and there, obviously there's a recommendation in front of you as well, just, but it's a, it's a larger point, is that we do believe that establishing relationships with or organizations. And, and to me, I think face-to-face -face is, is a critical mm -hmm. element of that. Um, you know, Zoom just doesn't replace an ability to, you know, to meet people, you know, in their community, and, you know, be across the table, mm -hmm. actually do some work together. Um, one of th that is a critical element of what we're talking about in terms of community engagement. I think building trust, as um, Vice Mayor Fugazi had talked about, and, and building real relationships requires an ongoing engagement. and examples of where, you know, we, we truly listen, uh, are able to convey, you know, sort of our recommendations, are able to listen sincerely to recommendations that come to us, and then deliver on on, um, on actions in, in response. And I think that's sort of, as, as we keep, you know, looking at opportunities for here, that, that's what we're talking about here is trying to build even more relationships with, you know, there's a lot of good work going on across the valley, and I think a lot of um, opportunity for us to be able to, to build that, that level of relationship. But, it's only going to get harder as we keep talking about on the air quality challenge front. And I think those relationships are going to be key to, to make sure that we can really truly listen to the community and, and uh, get them involved. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think it's important for us to kind of remember that we've increased the, the support of the staff. So, you know, the, the proposal that's in front of us is like proposals that we've seen in the budget and you know seen in the past, and they've paid off. They really have. And I'm glad, Samir, that you bragged on your staff because I came from, I was in, trying to be incognito in the back eating breakfast late. Sorry, guys. Um, uh, and, you know, but I had to come, you know, brag because I, you know, this is, this is tremendous for us to be in this place. You know, this is an extremely difficult program, as we all know. And, for um, the state to recognize that the process that our district has implemented is now the star, the model, right, is, a, is huge, you know. We don't always get that credit. And so I just, you know, but I, but I feel like that's come with those real investments that, you know, that, that just hasn't happened. You know, I mean, everyone's so fantastic, but it really has been building up that team that has paid off. and. Uh, I'm glad. I do have a question in terms of the, the positions. <clears throat> in terms of um, the, the senior air quality specialist and air quality specialist, would some of the work that you envision them doing, um, dealing with um, the community air monitoring data that, um, that has been collected, or, or if you can speak to sort of, you know, some of the community engagement that's planned around that particular piece. Thank you. I'll take a quick stab at that, and Jess, feel free to, to add to this. Um, yeah, so these positions would, um, as specialist, professional level, specialist level positions would certainly be um, helpful in, in helping to unpack um, things that are happening, including, say, air monitoring, mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, convey that information uh, so internally, but also help convey that to, to communities. Now we do have uh, scientists in our air quality analysis uh, team uh, and, and other you know, technical service teams that are, in some way, depending on what's going on, um, evaluating that. You know, that it, so we have other resources that are also um, uh, at play there in terms of being able to analyze data and report out. Yeah, but these special, these positions would, would be helpful in helping to you know build even more connection and communicate you know what's actually going on. 
Jessica, you have anything to add? I was, I, what you just, communicate what's going on. I think that's the key. And one of the things with technical information, like um, air monitoring data, one of the things that my team has really taken on is taking that information from our scientific team and trying to make sure we're working with community members to make sure it's understandable. It's really complicated. A lot of the components we're talking about, it's not just PM 2.5, it's toxic data. What does that mean? How do we communicate out? Um, the oftentimes good news, the progress without making sure, you know, making sure people believe us, they trust us when we're doing that. And a lot of that comes through this team. So really about the communication aspect of the data is what we see for these positions. Supervisor Peterson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a question with respect to, um, I, I, I love the strategy. I, I love how we're positioned. Just curious how that uh, merges into our media um, portion of that because you know the 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 true whole picture that I got in that short video you know I mean you guys do a great job at trying to identify us as board members and you know it's a love-hate relationship out there our friends give us hell and write or draw mustaches on us and <laughs> <laughs> on the uh, the billboards but but I think the the real opportunity there is that the folks that we're identifying in the community, um, you know, it's not about us, it's about them. And uh, however we can do to merge that that um, association uh, into our media campaign, I think is gonna pay dividends as well because you see recognizable leaders in the, in the uh, videos. Mm -hmm. Some people know who we are, some people don't, but in their community, they know their, their residents and, and within our counties, you know, we know who those folks are. And, and uh, I think if we're not going to have our message hijacked, those are the kind of things that we have to do to um, maintain that standing in the community. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to, to observe that um, one of, the, one of the, the, the most fruitful opportunities I think that we've seen so far is exactly what you're talking about, um, Supervisor. We've, uh, it, it's really been, interesting and, and exciting to see the the reception that the work that we're doing such as the, the event there that was actually in, in the media and we were able to um uh and now we're looking at our winter um campaign to see if we can actually highlight some of the same type of work in our in our messaging uh, this winter one of the that's one of the, one of the closest partnerships and lowest hanging fruit that we have is actually connecting the work that jess is doing with jamie's team the media side um jess is now actively involved in practically every press release that we do. Um, we're issuing press releases on so many of the programs that are that are happening at the community level, and 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 there's and it, and it, it, it there's hits on that. I mean, it, it, it's the kind of thing that you know I think media throughout the valley are, are really interested in. Now, sometimes something may happen in Kern that isn't as you know as covered in, in the north, or something happens in the north that isn't as, as well covered. In the, so there's different markets and different um, opportunities depending on kind of where things are going on. But yeah, the, everything from the air filtration program um, that we ran this, this last summer um, for, for providing air purifiers to 617 to uh, even the small, the small grower incentives. And you know, Jess and her team are actively involved in, that comes up often in the community, right? What's there for us as a small farmer to help us with our, you know, whether it's equipment or the ag burning phase out or whatever it might be. There's connections actually into, into practically everything that we do. And so we're actually looking for those opportunities and ramping up the media campaign based on the real good work that's going on. So I, I want to acknowledge that and I'm glad you pointed that out because um, we didn't put, hit on that as much in the presentation, but it's a huge opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Councilwoman Lewis, report that we're doing all right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have a quick question. It, it sounds like maybe we're going to have a new mantra, bring one, get one, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, but the question I have is for the smaller communities, um, can it be set up to have a similar kind of thing where if, I know in our town in Los Santos we have an aid fair, but we also have another large commercial um, business, Baker Supply, that uh, sells um, all of the, the top end equipment for, for landscaping. Uh, can we set up something like that in our smaller communities throughout our counties to be able to have the staff come out 
and get the word out that people can bring one and get one um, rather than, you know, just the larger cities? Or is it just relegated to the larger cities right now? No, I mean, the short answer is yes. And I think what we can do is um, we're, we're really excited by the, the, the model. There's actually a couple of recent models that Jess and Jamie and the teams have created that are replicable you know, across the valley. And in fact, you're going to hear a little bit later about um, some other kind of community-driven but valley-wide uh, recommendations in just a bit with the next item. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the short answer is yes. <coughs> and so it's something that we'll, we'll certainly be um, talking some more to the board about. But if there is interest, if you ha have a specific lead, as you do, where you think that we can work with a local partner to do some, some kind of an event, a similar event, you know, certainly We'll jot that down, but, and that goes out to, to all the other board members. I, th I think um, with a program like this, there's a lot of, it's going to be a scale and timing you know, sort of situation, so we definitely have money in the budget to do more electric uh, lawnmower type, type programs. So I think what we can figure out is, okay, how do we, you know, how many do we do per county? Can we, can we find a local partner the way that we did, you know, this particular case? So if anybody has any ideas, feel free to, to shoot them over, and we've got yours down on, on the list. Okay. Council thank, member. Thank you very much. Are we encouraging folks to turn off their engines as they're idling in line? Like school? Seriously? Yeah. I mean, we have the signs up and stuff, or something the, that. Yeah, I think I think we're going to keep looking at that, right? Um, you know, but now that the line is so efficient that so that, that it's literally it's it, you actually don't the vehicle practically doesn't stop. Right. You know, yeah. being there observing a couple of these events, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's 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 so efficient the, mm -hmm. the whole process, but. While we're there, though, we are talking to them about, hey, we have funding available for, for vehicles. We have funding available. For, so there, there is a huge opportunity for doing other outreach while you have. Uh, and there, there are some high-polluting vehicles that, that uh, show up these events. So, um, <coughs> yes. Oh, do you want to talk again? Oh, you, I know that's a... I will allow you just to raise your hand if you want. <laughs> um, before we go to um, public comment, real quick. Now, this is a um, so it's some of this the support for more personnel. Is it one-time money, or or is it a combination of what you get for doing six seventeen plus? You get a one-time grant. Yeah, no, we've been funded um, every year for for the past. Uh, it's been uh, what, five, six years now. It, uh, yeah. there, there's actually not only do we have this year's allocation, but it's also in the new budget as well. Yeah. So we, we have. A, so this is ongoing funding, and it's actually from a couple of different state funding sources. Just to be right. clear, this is fully covered by by state funding. We have funding under the. You're going to hear about the next program, the community air protection. Mm -hmm. Grant program has administrative resources, but we also have direct 617 okay. implementation funds as well. So there's a variety of funding sources. Right, that state. was a house and they're ongoing house yeah. clearing question. Yeah. Here. Um, so I'm going to open it up to public comment. Is there any public comment? I, I, we're, we're changing it up. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I'm Christine Zimmerman. I'm with the Western States Petroleum Association. I also serve on um, your Citizens Advisory Committee. I just wanted to point out an opportunity that my colleagues saw and I saw in uh, the 617 program and this wonderful video that you shared and this work that you do. So we've spent quite a lot of time looking at, um, through our participation on the AB 617 consultation group, on the way SERPs are developed and how certain measures are captured and how you're able to track those by measurable, you know, through metrics and actually take credit for those things. A program like this, the number of hours you actually spend in the field, your hours of public engagement, that seems like something there should be a way under the blueprint to track and capture as, a, as something that you've accomplished. So we just thought we would make that suggestion. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you again, everybody. Board, Manuel Cunha and Nisei Farmers. I think uh, I just commend the board today who's here and all the great programs you're doing for 617 plus the other programs, even the tractor program, the tractor crushing. I mean, the tremendous pile. I wish we could have put them in the back of a pickup like uh, Samira was doing with the lawnmowers, you know. 
that I think our pile was about 10 times the size of this building. But I do want to commend, and I think reaching out in some different areas for communication is great. And I know that the ag industry has various meetings and conferences and all of that. But one thing we do tie into is the chambers. We've done stuff with our chambers when we have a, like a sexual harassment training or a, um, a heat illness training. We'll have three or 400 farm labor contractors come to our meetings. And they'll come from about four or five counties. So if we can be of help in doing some of those things as another mechanism for outreach of getting the word to the communities, even if it's in Avenel, we have some stuff out there at, at Delena that we do. So if we can help to be a part of that, but you've done one tremendous job on 617 and the meetings that you've had, even in Irvin, I mean, uh, Arvin in those areas, um, I think communication is the greatest. I'm saddened though not to see anybody here from that community at all. I really am because you're doing this for the people of those communities and the representatives should be here to help pass those on to those communities and they're not. But I know the ag industry is here to help the board, to help the staff, to help Jamie or whatever. We're here, Samir. So if you need our help as well to, to have these lawnmower giveaways, get one free and get one or take one, whatever the logo is, uh, it'll work. Uh, but again, we're there to help you, and I want to thank you. You've done one heck of a job uh, with the program, and I was surprised to see you with a hat on. Uh, that was impressive. <laughs> Okay, so I'll entertain a motion. Okay, thank you. And I have a second. Okay, thank you. And that we can do this with a voice vote. So all in favor, signify saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing silence, the motion passes. So we'll move on to what, item 17, or 16. Mr. Chair and board members, again, I'd like to introduce uh, a couple of folks that are going to be uh, presenting on this next item. Uh, there's going to be some uh, some good information to share and um, recommendation as well on, on, on this one, um, starting with Stephanie Ng, who is one of those folks in the huge community strategies and resources department of currently of, of uh, two staff, uh, now four, with, with your board's approval. Um, she's been doing a lot of tremendous work in this program. A lot of what Jess had shared with you earlier, Stephanie has been involved in, in implementing and, and coordinating with various communities throughout the Valley. So I'm really excited to have her share some of the updates on, on the progress that's being made and leading to Todd DeYoung, our director of the grants program, who's going to share with you where we are with our community air protection funds and some ideas for how to use some of those funds. So with that, Stephanie, go for it. Thank you so much, Samir, and hi, everyone, um, and good morning, board members. My name is Stephanie Ng again, and I'm a senior air quality specialist in the Community Strategies and Resources Department. Um, and today, Todd and I are going to be providing an update on the implementation of AB 617, as well as discussing new incentive programs to benefit Valley communities. And as your board is aware, the implementation of AB 617 has been ongoing for several years now. The very first communities selected to participate in this program in the San Joaquin Valley were South Central Fresno and Shafter. And those Community Emissions, Re Emissions Reduction Programs, or SERPs, were approved in February of 2020. Stockton was selected as a Year 2 community, and their SERP was approved by CARB in last July. And finally, our most recently selected community of Arvin Lamont in the South Kern area just had their SERP approved by CARB last month. Um, and across these SERPs, there are over 150 different clean air measures that reduce significant emissions across these four communities. The California Air Resources Board, or CARB, Blue AB 617 guidance document, or blueprint, requires air districts to prepare annual emission, annual progress reports summarizing SERP implementation. Okay, sounds good. 
so the CARB blueprint does require um, air districts to prepare annual progress reports summarizing SERP implementation and to submit these reports to CARB. Um, the district did provide draft copies in both English and Spanish um, to the CSCs ahead of our October CSC meetings. Um, and we then solicited feedback and reviewed these annual progress reports with the CSCs in both the October and November meetings, as well as taking comments via phone and email. Um, and these reports are presented to the Air District Governing Boards prior to submittal to CARB, and they'll continue to be updated on an annual basis to provide descriptions of the most up-to-date actions to further SERP implementation. So this slide represents just a variety of ways in which we engage with AB 617 community members, including partnerships with schools and community residents, um, as we saw in the last presentation, providing incentives directly to residents that live within our AB 617 boundaries, and then also engaging in practices and providing resources to build capacity within communities to do this kind of work. And all of the SERPs include a variety of different community investments. Some of these projects are already approved under Com Community Air Protection or CAP funding guidelines, meaning once SERPs are approved, these projects are able to be funded immediately. There are also a number of projects that are community identified that require the air districts to work with CSCs and CARB to submit project plans for approval. And so that second column lists all the different projects that went through this process of project plan approval and are currently approved and available to be funded. And that third column represents projects that are submitted to CARB currently, um, and these plans are awaiting approval. And the last column just lists the last few uh, different projects in which the Air District is working with CSC members and CARB to develop project plans to be submitted for approval. And with all of these different incentive projects, this slide shows the overall SERP incentive budget with over $140 million invested in these four, four communities. Um, and then that number that's just on the right there represents that, which is just under $122 million, um, represents the funds that are remaining in all the communities. And this slide shows an in-depth breakdown of SERP funding progress in the three communities that really have been in the implementation phase. And so that first dark green bar represents funds that are obligated, and so these funds are already spent within our communities. Um, that next lighter green funding and progress bar represents funds that are really close to being contracted or that are actively open for applications. And that latest green bar at the end represents funds that are within programs in which we're still working with CARB and CSC members to submit project plans for approval. And as you saw on that last slide, there is a lot of ongoing progress across all measures. Um, we began truck reroute study efforts in multiple communities. As you saw in the, in the last presentation, we've held several lawnmower exchange events in which we've distributed free electric lawnmowers to community residents. Um, and in addition to these incentive-based measures, we've also made a lot of progress on our different regulatory and enforcement and outreach measures, which is summarized there in the middle. Um, this includes nine district rules amended, over 1,500 stationary source inspections, and 465 outreach and media events. And in addition to our 8617 communities, there are focused resources for clean air efforts in communities all throughout the whole valley. To date, there are over 200 million in cap and match funds invested in valley disadvantaged communities, reducing over 6,000 tons of NOx, 546 tons of PM 2.5, and five, excuse me, 782 tons of VOC. Um, these cap funds have replaced various types of older polluting equipment for newer, cleaner units, including things like electric school buses, off-road vehicles such as tractors, and electric lawnmowers, which you can see summarized on the right there. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Todd to discuss new incentive programs to benefit Valley communities. Thank you, Stephanie, and good morning. Once again, uh, Todd DeYoung, Director of Grants and Incentives here at the Air District. Um, and, and thank you, Stephanie, for um, giving us a great summary of, of the exciting things that have been happening um, within the AB 617 communities, um, as well as valley-wide um, utilizing this critical uh, community air protection funding. I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about some of the mechanics of the funding, um, some of the funding deadlines, and then some ideas to really move the ball forward with this funding. Um, not only to continue to work within uh, the Valley's uh, AB 617 communities, but really to use this money Valley-wide um, um, to provide those benefits um, under which the funding was actually intended. Um, this was intended to um, do several things. 
um, including obviously um, to support the, the work in the SERPs in each one of these communities, but then really to provide that, um, that benefit valley-wide uh, in disadvantaged and low-income communities. Um, so for the past three years, um, the state has provided this community air protection funding program. Um, it's been a, a budget, um, it's been part of the budget each year for the past three years. We're anticipating the fourth year coming up. Um, with that, uh, with that funding, um, as you know, you know, no, no funding is just wide open. It all comes with guidelines and, and um, restrictions on how you can utilize this funding. Uh, and the CAP funding or Community Air Protection funding is no different. Um, per the state guidelines, we can use uh, this CAP funding in, in just a couple of different areas. Number one is obviously to support the work in the SERPs, to support the incentive-based measures that are included within those SERPs, those measures that were identified by the communities, prioritized by the communities, and included and memorialized within those SERPs. Um, the second um, is, is um, projects valley-wide that are included in some of the um, the perennial air quality programs in the state, the Carl Moyer program that you're all, I'm sure, familiar with, the Proposition 1B program, which was focused on goods movement throughout the valley, um, and some of these uh, some of these other programs um, that have been slightly enhanced by CAP funding. Um, in some cases, uh, Carl Moyer program funds um, have uh, additional higher funding levels associated with them through the CAP program. Um, but they're really they're really kind of based in these in these uh, air quality programs that have been around for years. Um, there were some pre-approved categories that were included in the CAP guidelines that were not in the Carl Moyer program. Um, those include um, specific uh, project types such as chrome platers, um, some school air, uh, some school programs including air filtration, school buses, and things like that. Um, and then uh, there are some stationary source projects that were included in the CAP guidelines. Um, those are those are things that we need to work through with CARB um, if we're to fund those, but those are eligible to be funded under this program, um, under the CAP guidelines. Um, so each year, um, within the legislation that approves the funding, there's also statutory liquidation deadlines. Those are the deadlines that we have to meet uh, or we risk having to return that uh, funding back to the state, which is something obviously we don't want to do. Um, and so it, it's up to all of us to make sure that we're meeting those deadlines. It's up to us as an, air, an agency. It's up to CARB to make sure that they're doing their part to assist us in things like approving project plans uh, quickly, making sure that we have, we have the resources that we need um, from, from CARB's perspective to make sure that these things happen. And it also is, is incumbent upon the community, or, uh, the, the community groups um, within these communities to make sure that they're doing their work to and it is a lot of work that these communities are putting in to prioritize these uh, um, these measures and to, to make sure that that they're getting the word out that that you know in the community that they're generating the interest in these programs. So it's really incumbent upon all of us um, to make sure that we're going to hit these liquidation deadlines into the future. Um, and we've been working obviously through the past three years. We've been working through a global pandemic and global supply chain shortages and things like that, which have, which have admittedly slowed the process down in some areas. Uh, it's hard to get equipment. It's hard to get things, uh, you know, in progress. So we've been working with the state to make sure that those liquidation deadlines are reasonable and that we, we can actually meet those. So this is just a, a, a table that shows kind of where we are with the, with the three existing uh, years of funding that we have, uh, year four and five, um, we're expecting to get probably early next year. Um, and so you can see year one, uh, AB 134 funds, um, we're pretty close to liquidating all of those. Um, we've got a liquidation deadline in the far right there. This is the liquidation deadlines. Um, it's basically June 30th of each of the next four years that we have to have this funding liquidated. So um, we need to keep moving, um, and we need to meet, keep moving quickly to get these funds liquidated. On time, and, and, and we're doing. I, I think we're doing just fine at this point. But we, you know, we just we're always keeping our eye on that to make sure that um, there's no chance of, of running into a situation where we would have to return those funds to the state. Um, so, based on um, some of the information that Stephanie shared with you earlier, she gave you that total that total list of obligations under the under the four SERPs. Um, we have the funding available right now to to completely meet our obligations under those four. Um, under those four approved community um, SERPs. Um, and so um, to continue to make sure that this funding is being utilized um, in the intent that it was um, 
that it was originally intended. Um, we're looking at we're looking at areas that we can um, provide this funding in a valley-wide fashion to some valley-wide programs um, that can provide um, a real benefit to disadvantaged and low-income communities throughout throughout the district. And we've come up with two that we can implement almost immediately, and that'll be part of the recommendations for today. One of them is, is heavy-duty fueling and charging infrastructure, um, and the other one is the locomotive replacement program. And I'll go through each one of those in a little bit more detail in the following slides. Um, so first, the heavy-duty charging uh, and fueling infrastructure. Um, we're proposing up to $20 million in the existing CAP funds to go to this uh, solicitation. Um, and it's really just to support the, the needed transition to advanced technology, near zero and zero emission vehicles. As you've heard over the past couple of days, our SIP commitment includes a huge reduction in mobile source emissions. Um, and, and this effort would really go to support that. Obviously, you can't have a transition to cleaner vehicles without the necessary fueling and charging infrastructure to support that. Um, the program is consistent with the existing CAP guidelines. It fits right in with, with uh, the existing guidelines, so there's no, no modifications that are necessary, um, so they could immediately be implemented. Um, and again, these are, these are funds that would be available district-wide, so we'd open up that solicitation. Um, as long as the um, infrastructure supports projects that have a direct benefit to disadvantaged or low-income communities throughout the valley, they would be eligible to apply. Um, eligible participants, I'll go through some of this a little bit quickly because it's, it's getting into some of the details. Um, public and private entities are eligible to apply. That includes um, uh, state, um, cities, counties, multi-county districts. Uh, school districts, uh, universities, and federal agencies are all eligible to apply. Private entities are also eligible. Um, it includes uh, corporations. Um, Out-of-state applicants are eligible, provided that that infrastructure, again, is located within the, within the district, of, <coughs> excuse me, within California. Um, the types of projects that are eligible, um, again, they have to provide a, a direct benefit to uh, low-income and disadvantaged communities throughout the valley. Um, and include battery charging stations. These are electric vehicle charging stations for heavy-duty vehicles uh, and buses. Um, it includes workplace charging, DC fast chargers, um, and then uh, long-term uh, destination or corridor charging. Um, also eligible is alternative fuel fueling stations. This includes uh, uh, existing or expansion to existing uh, hydrogen and natural gas fueling stations. Uh, minimum and maximum project lives there. That's really for reporting purposes and the calculation of, of the benefit there. Um, so the eligible costs are basically the, the design and engineering costs, the, obviously the cost of equipment, the cost of installation, um, any meters and data loggers that are necessary for reporting, um, and then any on-site power generation system. Um, which includes solar and wind power generation. And I'll go through a little bit of that um, in the next slide that shows the, um, the eligible incentive amounts. Um, so basically, we start at 60%. That's sort of a base funding. So 60% of the eligible costs can be paid for in this program, and it goes up from there. So if your project is publicly accessible, you get 70%. You get a little bit more if your project includes solar and wind systems. Um, and then from there, if it's publicly accessible and includes solar and wind, it gets up to 95%. Um, public school buses, charging infrastructure, 100% paid for in this program. So there's no out-of-pocket cost. Um, all of the eligible costs are paid for um, for public school charging systems. Um, and again, the, the project life is between 3 and 15 years, depending on the type of project um, that's proposed. And obviously, there will be reporting and inspection requirements that are um, that are part of the project that, that they would report to the district for a number of years and then we would be actually inspecting those projects to ensure that they're complete. Um, the next program type that we identified that we could that we can launch fairly quickly is a locomotive replacement program. Um, again, this would be open district wide and it would not be supplanting any funds that are that are part of an existing SERP. Um, it includes line haul locomotives, rail car switchers, switcher locomotives. Um, and again, it's consistent with the, with the CAP guidelines. Um, we're proposing $15 million in existing CAP funds going to this program. Um, because it's eligible under the CAP guidelines, this could be opened uh, very, very quickly, and we could be soliciting projects um, 
um, in a very expedited manner. Um, again, some of the, the participants in technology that are eligible, uh, line haul passenger switcher locomotives uh, that operate in and benefit uh, the valleys disadvantaged and low income communities. Um, there's engine technology. They basically, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but essentially they have to have the appropriate CARB and EPA certification and verification technology. Um, have to be a minimum of Tier 4 or cleaner um, technology. And Tier 4 is, is about 95% cleaner um, than a lot of the locomotives that we're replacing. In fact, those two pictures right there, um, that, that locomotive was 95% cleaner than the locomotive that it replaced. That one was in Exeter, I believe. Correct. Yeah, exactly. The, from the and, and that's the problem is locomotives last forever. I mean, the, you know, some of the ones that we've replaced have been from the 40s and 50s, um, and they will they will run forever if they're properly maintained. So, um, making those changes a, is a huge huge benefit to emission reductions. Um, incentive amounts: uh, we pay up to 85 percent for line haul locomotives and 95 percent for passenger and switcher locomotives. Um, so there's a, a minimal out-of-pocket expense for uh, the operator. Um, project life is is dependent on the type of locomotive that we're replacing. Um, it's between three and 15 years. Um, we do require, as in all of our programs or most of our programs, that the the old piece of equipment be completely destroyed. However, um, with locomotives, uh, the chassis, they can strip everything off of the chassis and reuse the chassis because, again, um, if properly maintained, these chassis will, um, will last and there's, there's value there. So we do allow them to keep the chassis, completely scrap the engine, and then, and then rebuild that locomotive uh, on that existing chassis. Um, and so those are, those are the two that we've identified that can be almost immediately implemented. Um, we're also looking at, at other areas in which we can, um, you know, identify um, other types of projects and other programs um, that we can really um, benefit the entire valley, the disadvantaged and low-income communities throughout the entire valley um, that, are, that are within the CAP guidelines. Um, the couple that we've identified that we're actually actively researching right now are small off-road construction fleet equipment replacement projects. Um, the way they intersect with the off-road regulation makes small construction fleets still eligible in some cases. Um, so we're looking into that right now. Um, as well as some stationary source projects. I talked earlier that the CAP guidelines included some stationary source type projects. Um, and we're really looking into those right now. It's something that's a little bit new for us. Um, we don't, we, you know, we normally focus on mobile sources, cars, trucks, tractors, things like that. So stationary sources is something that we're looking into right now and, and are eligible under the CAP guidelines. Um, one example of those may be standby generators at a, uh, a public facility. We're looking at, you know, a, a city or a county um, has standby generators that they use um, and can sometimes be old and high polluting, maybe looking at replacing those with, with zero and near zero emission technology. Um, and if we find that these are viable program opportunities, we'll certainly bring those back to your board um, at the appropriate time for approval. So with that, I would uh, direct you to your recommendations that are within your packet and um, bring it back to the board for questions and comments. Go ahead, Mr. Passenger. Thank you. <coughs> Of our community 
Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for this. I have a couple of questions here in terms of the, the proposal. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the heavy duty, um, when you're talking about the consistent with existing CAP guidelines, I know that one of the um, one of the concerns has been, you know, if these are going to directly identify, you know, benefit the AB 617 communities, um, how are the communities themselves sort of involved in this process and, and really making sure that, you know, this, um, you know, the, the benefit, right, we, we know the benefit has to be at the emissions reductions. But there's also the idea of, you know, certain players in the community being good stewards back to those communities themselves, you know, which is like how we landed in this place in the first place. Right. Right. So, so what's the what's the role of community in this piece? And then also in terms of the infrastructure piece, can you say a little bit more about what opportunities you see for the technical assistance? I've I've heard of organizations and, and even, you know, um, places that would like to have infrastructure, but the technicalities and how to navigate that, right, especially in these communities, like I think about South Central Fresno, like the, the businesses, you know, and everybody that would benefit, the, the business owners themselves don't have all the wherewithal about how to navigate this process. So, you know, what's the outreach and wherewithal? What are the opportunities there that we could see? You know, even, you know, using some of this funding, I guess, to, to do that, to get them sort of across the finish line um, and, and help them even identify loans for that other 5%, if that 5% is cost prohibitive within itself, you know? Um, so just wanting to see a little bit more about, you know, what enhancements could be done to this. Sure. No, those are those are great concepts for sure. Uh, your your first question talks about the role of the community and and um, uh, making sure that um, you know the the benefit also comes with those other benefits, like talking about being good stewards and being good neighbors. So th the program that we're outlining today is is really sort of a valley wide program, not specifically for the six seventeen communities. Although in each one of the SERPs there are or in the majority of the SERPs, there are um, infrastructure um, measures that are included within those SERPs. Now, within those processes, within those specific SERPs and those specific communities, there is a massive amount of engagement going on to that point exactly. Understanding that, you know, it, it's it's what the community wants to see and where they want to see it. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of engagement with the community on choosing or recommending those specific uh, infrastructure projects that are within those 617 communities. This one is more of a, a valley-wide program um, as long as it benefits a disadvantaged or low-income communities throughout the valley. Um, right. And so I think, you the know... The problem is still with the disadvantaged communities that are like the 617, right? Mm -hmm. So how... Yeah, and, and so the way we've looked at it in the past is, you know, we look at, you know, like we'll even go down to, to mapping truck routes and mapping where this, you know, obviously where the infrastructure is going to be located. But where are those, yeah, where are those trucks going to be operating? Where are those school buses going to be operating? Are they within those disadvantaged communities? How much time do they spend in those disadvantaged communities? 
Um, and we, we, we get down to that level to ensure that there is benefit to those communities um, before we're approving a project. That's one of the critical components is they have to show, they have to demonstrate what that benefit is going to be as part of that solicitation. Um, so to, to ensure that, you know, the, the vehicles that are utilizing that infrastructure are actually operating within those communities. Is there any, is there anything around, like, the need for this? You know, I mean, I, I, I'm sure, like, you know, Amazon doesn't need any of this <laughs> money, right? And, or I, would I, we be giving it to the Amazons of the <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, that's a good question, and I think, you know, potentially if there's benefit, you know, if there's an Amazon uh, warehouse sited in a disadvantaged community and there would be a, a marked benefit um, to electrifying their fleet um, or providing natural gas fueling infrastructure, um, you know, potentially that would be an eligible project. Yeah, and just to add a little bit to that, I mean, if, if, if it's already required for some reason, yeah, and there's going to be issues, you know, we're not going to fund something that may be required through a, another legally binding, you know, maybe commitment or, but there is no specific, I mean, unless the board were to choose to do that, I'm not sure the guidelines would allow it, but if you had a specific restriction to any particular company, we can generate that list here, but I, I don't even know if that would be a possibility under under the guidelines, so this is open right. to public and like, private entities. Is there like an identified need guideline that would be, a, that would be there, there, No, there, well, there's, the way these programs work is basically, if you want to build a near zero or zero emission infrastructure, you're going from a situation, yeah, where you don't have those vehicles currently out on, on the 99 corridor, for example. For a lot of these projects, I think the benefit will be up and down, you know, a, a big chunk of the valley, if not the entire valley. The, you know, the need is basically the fact that you don't have the project there. The funds would allow that project to happen. Um, so there isn't any sort of needs assessment built into the guidelines. But again, if that's something that the board is interested in, either specific companies or certain type of companies looking at profit margins or whatever else. No. I, can t I can tell you that the, the guidelines would not, would not support that right now. And to get to your, your second question about technical assistance, um, what we've seen historically is um, there are uh, organizations that will come in um, if, if you're a, a business and you want to, you know, you don't know where to start to potentially, you know, start building out some, some charging infrastructure or, or fueling infrastructure, there are organizations that will come in and basically walk you through that process. Um, we can assist, um, you know, in terms of making sure that whatever project you're proposing, you know, meets the guidelines. And, and so, you know, we have staff available um, to assist in that process, but there are organizations um, that, that that's what they do. You know, they, they consult with, with businesses um, you know, sometimes it's the it's the the manufacturer of the equipment even um, that can come in and provide that um, that assistance and sort of help help the businesses navigate that process. And again, we're you know we're always available on our side um, to ensure that the proposal that they're putting in you know would meet the guidelines and would be um, would be eligible. Okay, Doctor Sheriff, just one. Just one thing about the program, too. I think that these are going to be evol evolving over time, too. You know, I think there's different moments in, in the journey here going to new technology where I think you're still looking to get as much early adoption on, you know, zero emission infrastructure and all that. And I think over time, I would imagine both the, the state and us would want to keep an eye on, on those issues to kind of see, okay, where where the real opportunities as you see more infrastructure. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's really my point is that, you know, like the, the Amazons of the world, because of all of the other rules coming down, all of the other things, like they're going to get funding and they're going to be able to do this, right? I'm thinking about like the the places like going back to um, Council Member Bessinger's comment, you know, like the, um, the, I forgot what the appropriate name is, but you know, the, the Punjabi based, you know, truck stops that, you know, um, would not have the wherewithal otherwise. Like, how do we, you know, they're not going to, you know, be tied to those rules and do, so how yeah. can we benefit, like, those types of things that that's, are, like, that's a the heart, the, yeah. the, the high-hanging fruit. How can we use this for the high-hanging fruit? Yeah. I think this is the outreaching, and, the, you know, I think what, we'll, we'll definitely take that comment back in terms of, you know, how do we make sure that we're really focusing on, on those areas where, you know, like not the 
the obvious sort of um, you know projects, but but the ones that actually can can make more of a difference in the areas where there's more difficulty, right? So we can certainly look for ways to do that. I think to Council members point in your suggestion as well. That's something from an outreaching perspective that we'll certainly take a look at for sure. And technical assistance as well. Go ahead, Doctor. Yeah, thank you for those comments, Dr. Warner. Um, yeah, so many positives to this program and really, again, appreciative, as I said yesterday, in terms of board support and the staff work on this to, to, to make it a more effective program. Um, and it continues to evolve, evolve and improve and appreciate uh, the work to do that. One, one, uh, one question, uh, you know, this, this board is always looking to, to, for value, <laughs> for maximizing, um, you know, the reductions we get in criteria pollutants for, for the dollar. Um, and certainly a basic component of the program is impact on criteria pollutants doing very rough pencil numbers. It looks like the kind of numbers we're getting for tons per dollar. Um, they're more than, but you know, not, not way out of line from what we usually expect from programs. And um, plus, <laughs> plus we're getting all the, the local pollutant benefits in terms of, you know, this is in a sense another version of hotspots because these are the communities that uh, pollution does not weigh equally on communities. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a magnifier of, of inequity. So, you know, all the other benefits that we see from this in terms of building community capacity, building engagement with communities, building partnerships in communities to enhance our work going forward uh, outside of 617 activities. Um, but any, any thoughts in terms of that uh, dollars per ton, how, we're, how, how, that, how that looks? Yeah, yeah. No, very good question. And we always have our eye on, on cost effectiveness and, and dollars per ton of, of emissions reduced. Um, interestingly, um, locomotives is one of the most cost effective projects that you can do with a like heavy duty diesel because those, those engines are so large and oftentimes so old and high polluting that any reductions that you can that you can make in those areas is extremely cost effective. Um, probably one of the best other than you know some of the tractor type projects that we do replacing old tractors for the same reasons. Um, but but yeah these the, the benefit to these types of projects is 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 huge. Well, and again, I think that highlights the outreach that communities might not think about that. Because right. um, right. it is a little hard to wrap our heads around For a sure. locomotive. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. If, uh, do we have any uh, public comment? Or? Most of these people are employees of the district, just so you all know. These two tables kind of on the side. Oh, okay, this is an action item. So I'll need a motion for the recommendation. Okay, thank you. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, say saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. The motion carried. <laughs> So uh, this is actually item 12, or, or is it 11? Oh, the 11, sorry. I was one off. So, I'd like so to anyway, go ahead and tee it in. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to introduce John Klassen again, who's got a panel of, of esteemed uh, uh, presenters who are going to be talking to us about wildfires from a couple of different perspectives. Everybody here knows how much of an issue this is. There's a lot of money and goals that are tied to wildfire forest management type activities. So it is, it is actually really hard to keep up. There's so much going on in, the, in this space and the board has, has always had a really strong policy position on this, a lot of interest on, on everything from funding to policy to how we can all work together to better manage our forests. So we actually have a few different speakers. I'll turn it over to John to introduce them and to first kind of set the table with a little bit of context and then 
manage this in a way where um, we've asked the speakers to <laughs> to keep um, comments um, to in the I think the seven to ten minute range to still hopefully allow for some time for some comments towards the end. So I would I would just um, urge John to do some some good management so we can all sort of get our get our questions and, and uh, discussion here going. And with that, John. Yeah, you heard him, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, he made it clear. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'll give a brief overview here of the item, then I'll turn it over to our speakers. I want to give them plenty of time to say some things and have some discussion here. We'll have some perspective from a research perspective, from the state perspective, and a federal perspective. But just to go over a few slides here, as we know, uh, emissions from wildfires can be extreme, excessive, can overwhelm all of our control measures, can lead to excessively high particulate matter and ozone concentrations in the valley when this occurs. As we know, in past seasons, wildfire seasons have become even more intense. Uh, due to a number of, of issues, one of those being the decades-long fire suppression policies, the, the fuel buildup has been excessive, excessive over the decades, and drought conditions, tree mortality has also played a role in that. We've seen more intense wildfires over the past uh, number of years. At the district, we do a number of things to support fuel reduction efforts. We've done this for a long time. We've long supported these sorts of efforts. Uh, one of those being prescribed burning, having enhanced flexibility with our land managers to be able to provide them the windows to be able to do their burn projects, try to get as much of these done as we can throughout the year. Uh, we work closely with our land management agencies and different collaborative meetings. We issue air quality advisories when we have wildfire issues, air quality impacts, getting the word out to the public. Um, as has been uh, discussed with your board, we have uh, local, commercial, and residential air filtration grant programs, which, has been, which have been very successful over the past year. And we use social media to get outreach out there, partnerships with Valley County Public Health Officers and other types of media to get the word out. Just to say a few points here from the, the state perspective for the California Department of Forestry and Fire, or CAL FIRE, they, had, uh, they published their Wildfire and Forest Resilience Action Plan in January 2021, and that discussed some of their statewide goals for fuel reduction, where they have a goal of 1 million acres being treated uh, per year by the year 2025, and that's split up between CAL FIRE goal of 500,000 and then the U.S. Forest Service in California doing 500,000. And the plan does include increased prescribed burning as a tool to get to those, those goals by the year 2025 for, for, for both the CAL FIRE and the, and the Forest Service. And from the federal perspective, there are also goals that the Forest Service and the National Park Service have. The Forest Service in California, part of that 1 million acre per year goal for California, 500,000 of that is a goal for the U.S. Forest Service. And the U.S. Forest Service also published in their uh, confront, Confronting the Wildfire Crisis Report a long-term strategy over the next 10 years. What are their overall goals to reduce fuel across the nation? The Park Service also has a similar planning document that covers a four-year period there, 2020 through 2024, called their Wildland Fire Strategic Plan, which outlines some of their strategies for fuel reduction across the lands that they manage. We talked about this a bit yesterday, about the funding that, that's out there, but just specifically for wildfire reduction and prevention. In the 2022-23 state budget, there's about $670 million set aside in resources to help support wildfire response and fuel reduction efforts. And we talked about the Inflation Reduction Act quite a bit yesterday, and within that, there's $5 billion set aside uh, to protect communities from wildfires to combat climate crisis and through climate smart forestry. Within that $5 billion, just over $2 billion is set aside specifically for wildfire mitigation in federal forests, reducing the severity of wildfires and using prescribed burning as a tool to try to ramp that up more to reduce fuel across the forests. So I'll stop there with my brief introduction, and I'll introduce uh, the first speaker on our panel, which will be Dr. Ricardo Cisneros from UC Merced. Really happy to have him here this morning. Dr. Ricardo Cisneros is a professor of environmental public health. He received a PhD from the University of California at Merced in environmental systems. His research interests are the effects of air pollution on public health and the environment, and the use of GIS and spatial analysis and exposure assessment in environmental epidemiology. He has conducted several environmental research studies, including determining the impacts of forest fires on air quality. So Dr. Cisneros, thanks for being here and come on up. Okay, I'll, I'll keep to my 10 minutes. I'll go quickly. 
so we started looking at this uh, type of uh, data from our air pollution a long time ago. And we started looking first at what particularly matters in, up in the mountains in the Central Valley. So we recognized that, you know, and this is for the years 2006 and seven, but till now, let me use my glasses here. And, and it's a long time ago, but still the patterns probably uh, are similar to where the burn, uh, burning windows are, and you can see 2008 was a big fire year. You know, it was a long time ago. Um, but what we recognize is that actually PM is a lot, uh, PM's concentration is a lot lower when you go up in elevation in mountains. So people who live in the mountains have a lower exposure to PM 2.5. Uh, another of our studies that we did a long time ago is combining also remote sensing data with ground level data, because a lot of the times you get remote sensing data and it's not quite correct. But combining that with uh, with ground level data give us a much more power to actually answer questions like exceedances and things like that that could be actually um, uh, corrected for, for forest fires. So here is a look at the, uh, the 98 percentile of data, for example, in Fresno, you can see that for Is that press here? For it's going to point out there, but in 2008, in the, the red, the red excludes fire, the, the black includes fire. But in 2008, you can see the press that was impacted by the smoke from for, uh, Northern California forest fire, whereas uh, in Florida, it was more, you know, more pronounced. And if you look at Yosemite or Iceland, which uh, to me is up in the mountains, they were really impacted by smoke. And then also uh, we looked at uh, some of, uh, uh, we did a book chapter looking at climate change and some work looking at air, uh, forest fires. And we noticed that, you know, we have adapted ecosystem for fires. And at one point, and I don't know if it's still the case, we really um, compare forest fires as deaths, right? And I think that involved being in the media, recognizing that fires are, are needed. Uh, we look at this uh, also looking at some case studies, looking at what we used to call managed fire. I don't know what the, the title is, but ecological beneficial fires, where there's uh, good, good work doing this fire back to the landscape. And, and we recognize that, uh, that also another option, same loca uh, similar location, you make, uh, this is 2002, Magnolia Fire, where you, know, you basically nuke the whole forest. So there's two things that you can have, why, big wildfires versus some better uh, outcomes. And when you look at the exposure, uh, this is for, this is the good, uh, this is what we call the good fire index. And, and that one, you can see the exposure was a lot less. Usually the air quality was an unhealthy for sensitive groups, only five days. And for the wildfire, it was made, you know, usually for the rest unhealthy. And this is data was collected at uh, uh, Kernville. So different outcomes. Uh, then we also did some work where we put all the uh, forest fires in the Sierra Nevada together, most of the fires we can find uh, for about uh, seven years. And we look at that there's different outcomes. And here you can see that uh, you have, you look at fire intensity and burn rate, and you look at the outcome and exposure uh, for the different fires. And even though that, yeah, pyrologists will tell you there's a lot more into that, uh, but this will really give you an outcome of what's happening. And we look at the rate burning fire intensity where actually the drivers for a smoke exposure relative to a person per day per hectare. Um, and we, we put one on the rate burn prescribed fire, right? Because, you know, we don't know the rate burn there as long as you're lighted up. And when we combine this uh, with all the uh, uh, case studies here, we find out that it's true, that you have a high intensity, uh, high burn rate, that you're going to expect more exposure to humans. And we put prescribed fire in the bottom, be, but, but don't be confused because there could be a prescribed fire if you have a lot of uh, burn intensity and, and burn rate that you would expose a lot of, uh, of, a lot of people in the population. So we actually have another case study where we, we, uh, we looked at uh, the, they called the Lion Fire 2017. It was uh, a managed fire, I believe, or 
it was uh, happened naturally, but at that one point there was uh, uh, there was a need to manage it. And that's what we looked at all the sites for this study. And this, this is all this published stuff that you guys can look at it later or we can discuss it later. And we compare those. So you can see that uh, 2011, I was on the right side, 2017 on the left side, next to each other. And what we found out that uh, when we really burn a lot of acres per day, and we kind of knew that, so fire intensity, and the rate you expose, you, your smoke exposure goes up. Uh, this location is in Kernville again because that's where we have the uh, data available. Uh, when we look at other case studies, this is the Rim Fire 2013, uh, looking at what, what the impacts are. And you, you remember that, right? And so we study all the sites. We look at the impacts, and the, the outcome is very simple. The fire impacts closer to the fire are downwind of the fire. So Fresno, the area in Central Valley was not impacted that we can see, obviously. But uh, sites closer to the fire and right downwind of the fire were the ones the most impacted, and as well as east side locations because they're downwind of the fire. And the, the most recent one, which is not so recent, right, because seven years, but I have not been doing much smoke anymore. I've been <laughs> focusing on other work. But uh, 2015, we look at the fire, and uh, this is a lower elevation uh, fire. So I, when I started looking at this, I expected to see more impacts. There were some, right? So this is uh, Clovis, uh, Fresno, Madera, and, and Merced. And there's a couple of days that were, you know, they reached uh, the unhealthy maybe a day, but it was um, it, it was elevated above you know normal. And this is for uh, Hanford Visalia. Visalia probably was reaching the unhealthy, so the, the area which is, makes sense closer to that fire. And this is uh, Prather, North Fork. So uh, Tremors are really uh, centers up in the mountains. Again, they were closer to the fire, so they got uh, also um, much more impa impacted. They reached the unhealthy and very unhealthy. And on the east, on the east side, uh, on Wishon, actually closer to Teeter, which actually these are the closer ones to the fire, you reach the hazard that which kind of makes sense, right? The story continues to be the same. Closer to the fire, that one of the fire, that's where we see the impact. Uh, this is uh, uh, Cam Nelson. Again, we, we see similar patterns. And this is Bishop and Devil's Pulse file. The east side also got impacted, so because that's downwind of the fire, she uh, blows that direction. So when we look at that, okay, so if you look at the bold parts here, this is uh, asthma for, we only did it for Fresno, given uh, the availability of data. So before the fire, there was a connection between PN 2.5 and asthma visits. But during the fire, we didn't see any, any associations there. So, you know, and, and I, I don't know. There's, there's, we can discuss more why, why we didn't see that. You know, I'm, I'm still puzzled by that as well. Uh, but there's... Uh, Studies, you know, that have found association between PN2.5 and asthma done in California. Um, and there's some, I, I don't list them here, they didn't find the association for asthma. I know, remember, I'm only uh, comparing asthma. We also look at other respiratory disease, but we didn't see that. But uh, this one is specific for asthma. So, you know, I can summarize that when we have fires in the Sierra Nevada, they the impacted sites are lower to the location and, and downwind, which even uh, some of the smoke happens to the valley, it, it happens rarely. Different with Northern California, of course. Uh, there's other tools that we have actually used, a way of looking at smoke impacts. I know you guys are looking at how we're going to manage the smoke. And actually, okay. 
So we, you guys can look at this. We have look at a way of, of managing this. Perhaps you can use it. Uh, more, more IP needs to be funded. So it answers the different question. Not in California versus other locations, fires. But thank you. Great. Thanks, Ricardo. Appreciate that perspective and some of the work that you're doing. Next, we'll have a perspective from the federal perspective, Sequoia National Forest. We have Angel Prieto, who has a lot of experience working on fuel reduction projects in Sequoia. Excited to have him here and provide some of his thoughts on what they're working on and, and uh, some work going forward. So, Angel, come on up. Uh, thank you, John. <clears throat> uh, yeah, my name is Angel Prieto. I'm the Fire and Fuels Planner for the Sequoia National Forest. I've uh, been on the Sequoia since 1998. Um, spent my entire career on there. Um, I apologize, I don't have a PowerPoint for you guys today, but uh, some current and future goals for the Sequoia National Forest. Um, as was mentioned, the forest, we've got a ton of fuel buildup. Um, and so one of the best ways for us to treat that is to remove the fuels from the forest, uh, get prescribed fire back into the forest at a more large landscape, uh, type of uh, um, prescribed burning. Um, how do we do that? Uh, we're going to continue working with our partners. So um, currently um, we've got some initial conversation going on with CAL FIRE Tulare unit um, to hopefully get a large landscape type um, project going between Mountain Home and the Sequoia National Forest. And so that's just in the uh, infant stages of the talk right now, but hopefully we can build that up uh, into a larger project. Um, currently, what projects do we have planned? Um, so we've got the Big Stump prescribed, excuse me, Big Stump Redwood Mountain Restoration Burn. Uh, that's 3,078 acres. Uh, encompasses the Big Stump Grove and the Redwood Mountain Grove. Um, again, it's a restoration project, so the intent is for us to get fire back into the Sequoia uh, Groves. Um, We've got the giant Sequoia emergency response. Um, that was something initiated this, uh, this past August. And so what that did was that declared an emergency for, the, for a few of the uh, giant Sequoia groves across uh, the Hewn Lake Ranger District and the Western Divide Ranger District. That allowed us to immediately get into the groves, start doing some fuel reduction in there with the hopes of uh, getting some pile burning done and then continuing on with a larger landscape burn, um, hopefully getting that completed by 2024. Uh, to date in that project, we've been, able, we've been able to move fuels from around some of the large giant sequoias, about 3,900 different giant sequoias. Uh, we've created over 6,500 piles um, that should be burned within the next year or two. Um, we've, we treated uh, the Bearskin Grove, the Indian Basin Grove, Landslide Grove, uh, Grant Grove, the Forest Service side, uh, Abbott Creek Grove. Um, and then on the Western Divide, we treated in the Alder Grove, the Burrow Creek Grove, uh, Silver Creek, and Black Mountain Grove. Um, another aspect to that, having uh, declared an emergency, we're able to get um, equipment uh, contracted to get in there and remove some of the fuels because um, that's a key part to our groves. There's so, such a, a tremendous amount of fuel buildup. We have to be able to remove some of that fuel before we can get in there and burn. Um, and then across all three districts on the Sequoia National Forest, uh, we have uh, different pile burning outside of the groves that, that will continue. Uh, recent successes and upcoming challenges. Um, Big Stump was a success. Last year was our first... Uh, um, first burn that we were able to, to, to initiate in that 3,078 acres, we did about 700 acres, uh, all understory. Um, it was successful, and again, that was a first entry burn. Um, so what that means is there, there wasn't any history of prescribed burn in that area. So we had, and not a lot of uh, fuel reduction done in that area, so we had a heavy, a tremendous amount of fuel buildup. Um, so to, even to get in there with that 700 acres was a huge success for us. Uh, the GSER, I mentioned some of the numbers, you know, the amount of piles we're able to create, the fact that we're um, able to get so many resources committed to doing uh, projects in those groves was a huge success. 
Uh, we've been successful the last couple of years across the forest with power burning. Um, and then uh, grant funding, uh, being able within the last few years to se secure grant funding uh, to treat different projects across the forest, along with uh, getting national funding from, um, from the region and from the Washington office to, to help with our fuel reduction projects. Some of the challenges, uh, burn windows, <clears throat> those are always tricky. Um, you know, especially with the last couple of years, the amount of high fire activity that we've had. Uh, we just haven't had the windows during this time of year um, or the resources to get in there and do any kind of prescribed burning. Um, obviously, the drought that we continue to be in. Um, and then um, the, the Sequoia National Forest, um, the terrain it makes it difficult sometimes. We've got a lot of steep terrain that's not always easy to, to do any fuel reduction in or even prescribed burning. Um, <clears throat> so, as most of you may know, we did have a 90-day pause um, this past year. Um, so... Some of the, the, the intent behind that was for us to take that pause to really kind of do an overview nationally of our prescribed fire program. Um, that required us to review all our prescribed fire plans and then get them reapproved. Um, there's a national template that all uh, agencies within uh, NWCG have to use to uh, to. Uh, to create a burn plan, the Forest Service added some specific elements to that. So that was something else that came out of it. Um, and then it required us to have more involvement with our agency administrators and our line officers. And so um, that's not to say that there wasn't involvement in before. It's just getting them in there earlier, having those discussions uh, early on before getting the plan approved. And then uh, all the forests across the um, United States had to have, before we can continue burning, had to have what we called an engagement session. And so that's where we addressed some of the issues that came out of that 90-day pause review um, and then um, talked about some local things that we can do moving forward uh, to get that uh, implemented. Uh, some more resource needs uh, uh, for us to continue with the fuel reduction. Um, Designated fuel crews, um, you know, one of the other challenges that we have, the same people that are fighting fire throughout the summer uh, are the same ones that are going to be doing the burning in the, uh, when we have our burn windows. And so that takes a heavy toll uh, on the folks. Um, and then, obviously, continued cooperation with our airboards, which I feel like we have. Uh, current foreign forest conditions, so again, uh, we still do have quite a lot of uh, fuel buildup across the forest. Um, we, we still are currently in a drought. Um, you know, this last weather's helped, but again, you know, we've had sustained drought for, for a number of years. Um, and then climate change, and, and one of the, the things that we have going is our, our forest plan is actually being revised currently. It's pretty close to being complete. Um, and we added uh, um, more specific components in there to help us um, monitor that climate change involved with tree mortality and, and uh, having us have a way to actually document that. So that'll be something that we continue to move forward with. Um, that's, that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you, Angel. So the last speaker on this panel will be Brian Garabedian, captain with CAL FIRE, who has a lot of experience working on the lands, fuel management uh, in the area that uh, CAL FIRE operates and manages. So Brian, feel free to come up and make your comments, and we have your presentation. Yep. Good morning, everybody. My name is Brian Garabedian. Um, I started on the Sequoia National Forest 2001. Um, so I've also spent my whole career here as well. So I put together a little PowerPoint for you guys with some pictures and just it kind of tells a story of what we've been doing in Fresno, uh, fuel reduction wise, and then it goes into some success stories. So um, we'll go over some prescribed fire, wildfire prevention, successes and challenges in the slides. So this is kind of our prescribed burning or we call it BMP program. The unit, it's a unified vegetation management program. It's a diverse set of projects developed 
for rangeland improvement, fuel reduction, training, tree mortality mitigation, and environmental protection. All Fresno King's fuel reduction projects are consistent with the unit priorities described in our fire plan. Currently, the Fresno King's unit has 26,862 approved VMP acres, and those are contained within seven different projects um, across our unit. These are some pictures of our Edison VMP that we did up in Shaver, um, talking about large-scale burning. That's what the direction that came down from executive staff has been, um, bigger burns. This is an 8,283-acre 8, VMP project. This was about 78 acres of that, right? So it's a low-intensity burning in the timber, um, heavy fuel loading. So we're just taking bites of it, um, trying to get bigger ones as the years go on. That was a successful burn. This is a prescribed fire and brush. Okay, this is the Vanguard VMP. This is a almost, you know, a little over 4,000 acre VMP. This one in particular was eight, I believe 1,300 acres this day, one day. Um, and this is a brush, this is a fuel conversion type. So we're trying to remove the brush, kill the brush, turn it back to grass. Okay, this is, it not, not only helps the landowners, but it also helps us when it comes time to fight the fire. Our resources, our, our air tankers, our air resources are much more effective in the grass fuel model than they are in the brush fuel model. So it lets us pick up fires much more quickly. All right, so we'll kind of move on now into some wildfire prevention. Um, projects were selected as a high priority by unit personnel because of their strategic locations throughout the unit's very high fire hazard severity zones and provide essential fuel breaks in the adjacent in and adjacent to communities in the high fire severity zones within the Fresno Kings unit. These fuel breaks will reduce the impacts of, wild, of a wildfire to communities, critical infrastructure, and provide safe ingress and egress for the residents and first responders. So this takes a coordinated effort by multiple agencies, as well as the full support of the unit executive staff and the unit resources to implement these kinds of fuel reduction projects. So we have a very good relationship with our partners, our federal partners. Um, we have contractors that we utilize for these, okay? Um, not only do our staff that have been working these fires all summer long, and now they're expected to work all winter long on these projects, so there is that burnout um, p potential to what we've done in Fresno and across the state. They've created what we call Task Force Rattlesnake. So we're using National Guard soldiers with CAL FIRE captains and leadership. Um, and those are more directed towards fuels management. So all your, we may use them to fight fires in the summertime, and we do. But their main focus is fuel reduction all year long. And they've proven to be a major benefit um, here in Fresno. So this is one project that they've worked on, we've been working on here in the unit for quite some time. Um, this is the Cressman fuel break. It's in Shaver on the top of the four lanes. And you can see on the left, that's before what it looked like, and that's after, so quite a difference. Um, same fuel break, different photo point. Um, and there's kind of a uh, drone footage of now, you can see how we've broken up the landscape, um, removed the dead trees, pile burning, and that's what it's all about. It's kind of some drone footage of when we were doing the pile burning. Um, so this here is the Comstock VMP. Uh, this is in the community of Albury. It's 151 acres, all right? This was a major fuel break, and it's been used several times on smaller fires. Not only um, we use it for major contingency lines on the Creek Fire. This is just a picture of some pile burning. You can see the canyon to the top above it, right? So that's what this fuel break's all about. We're gonna be in there in 
there's fire down in that drainage, this fuel break gives us an opportunity to protect those communities, Albury, Prather, all of those. That's another area of area of work. So you can just see how, how far that drainage goes down before that whole ridge had that same hill type consistency. Overgrown, completely overgrown. This is a Shaver Springs fill break. Okay, it's in the community of Toll House, 81 acres. We did this along with the Forest Service under the Good Neighbor Agreement. Um, before, this is all from the same deck. Okay, that's during the burn, pile burning, and then that's after. That's what it looked like after. So that was a major success. Um, I have some more slides that will show. We use that one in the creek fire as well. But you can just see that has fuel going right up to that whole community, just to the right under their deck. This is the music fuel break. This is in Alder Springs, 394 acres before and after. Rush Creek, which is in the Shaver area, kind of behind the old, the uh, Op Opadon communities. A lot of fuel reduction back there, uh, the Blue Canyon area. Old Brett's, same area, 51 acres. You've got before and after. The piles still need to get burned, but we're working on that this winter. Uh, so some of our successes, all right? So during the Creek Fire, 2020, fuel reduction proved to be an effective, to be effective in controlling wildfire. Following slides are some documented successes. All right, so we have in the Bill fuel break, um, incident was the Creek Fire. So this shaded fuel break was used to create a fire line that protected the communities of Albury, Toll House, and Prather. Fire line creation was done quickly because of the ex existing fuel break. What would have taken a few days only took a few hours to complete. All right, so that was essential. Through rush. Three pieces of this fuel break connected with existing fuel breaks. Two sections are under transmission lines. Fire line creation was done quickly because of the fire existing fuel break. What would have taken a few days only took a few hours to complete. Two sections stopped the forward spread of the fire and the easternmost, se and the easternmost section had no impact. Another crucial fuel break. This one is in the Blue Canyon area and the Shaver area as well. Music, fuel break disrupted fire behavior and slowed the progression of the fire because of the, because of the disruption in the fire behavior forward progress of the fire was stopped by firefighters and another existing fuel break after burning through the music fuel break we have the rush creek expanded and, and cleared to create contingency lines shaver springs this was key to saving about 70 homes in the shaver springs subdivision used as an anchor point to backfire from the subdivision. This is essentially where we stopped it on uh, that side of the fire. Um, some challenges and resource issues, okay, so equipment and resources, right? We have, we have some issues with um, being able to get on these large-scale VMPs, like side-by-sides, side-by-sides kind of utility vehicles. We're running into some issues there. We're kind of overcoming it with pickup trucks. It's just a little harder to get in places. Um, those are some issues we're trying to overcome. And then you have the, the, the fatigue issue, and, and it's real. After long fire seasons, um, and these guys are out there. We've got heavy fuel loading. Forests are dead. we got weather trying to burn with the weather. Um, it's a timing issue. Picture of Shaver, right? That's the 3,000 foot line. This is how we made all of our projects. Okay, there they are. That's that's all the projects we had along with the Forest Service in the Shaver area. And then there's the Creek Fire. So that's essentially where they stopped. Where it stopped. Um, kind of a summary. These are all the numbers from about 2019 till now. Fuel reduction numbers and burn rent numbers. That's all I got. If you have any questions. Any questions?
questions from the board? I think you were all overwhelmed there. That was a good presentation. Go ahead, Doctor. I just have a quick question for Angel. Um, you talked about a burn window. Could you define that for me, just so that we understand? I understand a little bit more. What What are the conditions? What does that mean to have a burn window? So that's dependent on. Uh, so we have the prescribed fire plan that allows us to to, to burn, um, and inside there, there's uh, a standard set of. Uh, they call, we call them prescriptions, and so it's based on weather, uh, fuel moistures, um, uh, wind, uh, relative humidity. Uh, there's a, a number of different things inside there that all have to align um, for us to be able to achieve the objectives for that prescribed fire. And so a lot of times when we have a burn window, not only do we have to meet the prescriptions, but we got to have the resources available. And uh, a lot of times that could be in the summer, but the way fire seasons have been, we just haven't had the resources available. Um, sometimes it'll coincide with what we have called uh, LOPs or limited operating uh, periods. And so that's where wildlife, for example, the fishers endangered on the Sequoia National Forest, we may have some good burn windows, um, but it's, it's overlapping with that LOP, so we can't get in there to do stuff. So. Um, specifically, burn window will just speak to whatever is in the prescribed fire plan um, and whatever prescription is in there for us to be able to burn. Okay. Doctor, I kind of get my doctor straight. I looked at you and said doctor, and Dr. Pacheco is oh. <laughs> my, my hand's longer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for those uh, presentations. Um, you know, this, this kind of information is huge for the district in terms of, you know, how do we be a good partner in this? How do we, because there are obviously lots of conflicts in terms of, well, we have to create smoke to prevent smoke. And, you know, how do we do that? And it's obviously in, in, in a big sense, although fire science, it's really impressive what, what, what you're building on. But you're building on um, getting smarter with every fire. Um, in terms of understanding fire behavior and how what we have done to alter the environment has changed the fire behavior. Um, but, yeah, we, we, we really need this kind of data to be a good, uh, a good partner in, 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 in doing this. So it's really important. But we clearly need more data, and particularly the presentation from Dr. Cisneros for the health information. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions on the health information. You know, if you could help us unpack, um, you know, the tables about PM exposure and uh, the association of emergency department visits a little bit. Because um, on the face of it, the uh, looking at the 2003 Southern California fire, not a big change in terms of asthma in the emergency room, but a significant change. And... You know, from what you see in data, is, is asthma really the best measure? Um, are cardiovascular disease is a better measure? What, are we looking at the right health measures um, to understand uh, this? And then the other issue is, um, well, if it's 5%, 5% of whom? Who are the vulnerable populations? And then what do we, we learn interpreting that data about, well, how do people protect themselves? Um, so that they're not part of that bad statistic. Um, and, a, and, a, and a reminder, a small question for uh, Mr. Michaels and Mr. Prieto. Uh, boy, a huge job to create these fire breaks, these conversions of, you know, from brush to grasslands. Uh, maintenance. Maintenance. <laughs> um, these, these things grow back very quickly. Um, you look at clearing uh, some places, and wow, a year later, look at all the undergrowth that's come back. Um, so, thoughts about the maintenance and then the funding issue of maintenance. Yeah, it's all a lot there, but that you gave you gave us a lot, so there you get it back. All righty, thank you, Supervisor Couch. Sort of along that line, I was gonna. I wanted to ask you, what's the biggest um, impediment 
for either or either of your agencies to prescribe burning and maintenance? Is it funding? Is it and, and sort of tie into how do we help? Maybe that's for you too, Samir. But what what can we do? And maybe what shouldn't we do? Hey, hello, I'm uh, Joe Gonzalez. I'm the Forest Fire Chief on the Sequoia National Forest, and thank you for the question. So I will start off with, uh, first of all, giving, giving thanks to, to everybody being here and, and for the invite for us coming here and, and participating. This is a big, big part of our jobs as well, and uh, we live in the local community as well, so this is uh, pretty important for us to be here. And there's checks and balances for everything, right? So uh, there's all these prescribed burn projects that, that – uh, Chief uh, Pietro and Chief Garabedian got up and spoke about we can't pull those off on our own. So there's partnerships that are created, and we can't do this without the Air Board, right? So there's coordination with the APCD. So I can tell you in my stint as the Forest Chief here that I have had uh, no issues with getting our burn days and being able to pull off our, our prescribed understory burns and our pile burns as we move forward. So some of the uh, – and, and we appreciate that. Uh, you no, know, we've – had some fees that got lowered, et cetera, and we're able to put that money back into the into the projects. And so we, we definitely appreciate that and hope that that can continue moving forward. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, we recognize that there is a lot of fuel loading, and, and it just takes uh, a lot of time to get these areas uh, treated because they haven't been treated in so long. There's no fire history in any of them. So it takes us a little bit of time to actually get the first entry done and uh, we do, that is the plan, is to have a, a you know, five-year plan after we, we put fire into one of the groves or whatever that, that project may be, is to keep that uh, on the books. And so the next entry, we, we recognize it's going to be uh, multiple entries to get the site class change that we're, that we're truly looking for. We're not going to get it um, the first burn. It's not going to happen. There's just too much fuel loading. And so we've got to be careful with when we do put uh, prescribed fire in, into the into the landscape, so we don't have bad outcomes. So a lot of it is just taking our time and making sure that uh, you know the first entry we're removing some of the fuel. We give it time to grow back, and we go in with the second, third entry with the thought process that each entry that we go into should be uh, easier, take less resources, and be more cost effective. And uh, you know, we are working with uh, we've we've got we've got funding now. You know, that was an issue for for the agency, and uh, f lots of funding has come in. So, um, you know, we right now at this point we can take funding off the table. It's not a matter of funding, but uh, resources. So, so uh, having the employees to to do the work, and so now we're looking at uh, getting contracts out and in place to get some external partners to come in and give us a hand with uh, the tremendous amount of fuel loading that we're trying to treat so if we're looking at trying to do this just internally with with the Sequoia National Forest employees only that, that that's never going to happen you know we, we've got to reach out and we've got to get contracts going and working with our partners across boundaries and, and not look at these projects as uh, there's the Sequoia National Forest or a federal project you know these projects are, are we got to start looking at them across boundaries and not have boundaries be be the uh, the tipping point on why something can't get done. So that good neighbor authority. Well, I think we would probably do this anyway, but I would encourage you if you need legislative advocacy partners in that to ask us. Okay. Um, I know I'd like to be involved in that. Absolutely. Thank okay. You. Yep. We will take you up on that. Okay. And then I'll close out with uh, – so we did. We do have authority now to uh, bring resources, some of uh, Forest Service resources, in from you know other regions, you know other parts of, of the country that maybe they're out of fire season and they have resources available. So got mechanisms to, to bring in some of those folks uh, to give us a hand as well. So okay. again, thank you. And Mr. Chair, board members, want to thank you for those comments. I want to recognize the um, the board's position on this that. Uh, We've been using to, and we're not going to take um, full credit for this, but uh, as was just mentioned, there's a lot of money in the, in the state and federal budgets. And to your, to your question, Supervisor, you know, one of the things that keeps that I keep hearing from the board members and others is with the resources now be, being there and with obviously our policies now being really fine-tuned mm -hmm. in a supportive way, you know, for, for years now, and appreciate the, the, the positive comments on that front. <coughs> what are those true barriers? There's a scaling issue that I'm hearing. Right, scaling in terms of contractors and, you know, have, actually having, deploying those resources. 
the other question that comes up pretty often is are there are there planning issues you know in terms of any of the environmental documentation and you know sort of like are there are there is that a resource issue or are there still policy issues that maybe make it harder to do certain projects that's, that's also one of the you know, reoccurring questions that's come up and I'm wondering if you know based on on the state side I think there's some provisions on the federal side is there any any observations on on you know how, how that situation is these days morning everybody I'm Jerry Sharp I'm a registered professional forester for Cal Fire I can speak quite a bit about the regulatory environment um, on the state side anyways I'm sure we, have, we can have some excellent comments on the federal side but uh, it's heavy to say the least um, there's there's a minimum level of environmental documentation and that can take six months if we want to get a little more complex with our project and go to that next level of environmental review that's a year plus a lot of time on my end and our environmental scientists end a lot of paperwork a lot of analysis a lot of letters sent and not replied to things of that nature it, it's it's really at the state level it's all state law and I know the department is doing their best to streamline things but that to me is the single biggest impediment to getting these projects completed <clears throat> and uh, to answer your question about maintenance herbicides cheap effective quick difficult and heavily regulated but I'm trying my best to make it happen and, and kind of make it as programmatic and easy as possible in Fresno County but we'll see fingers crossed on that any other comments can I ask a follow-up on that <clears throat> have you ever I'm sure this is this will get mixed reviews this question um, have you ever uh, sought a CEQA exemption for any of the projects that you're that you need to do yeah I mean if, if you take and, and what was the result fairly easy to get depending on the complexity and level of disturbance that we're expecting really? if, okay. if we're not going to disturb the ground with machines terribly much we can get away with a categorical exemption but it still takes quite a while what with the environmental and archaeological review the archaeological review takes a lot of time no matter what um, minimum a month but it, it still takes quite a bit of time but those those categorical exemptions are kind of our bread and butter to the extent that we can get away with it thank you councilwoman lewis thank you a couple of questions um, uh, just to follow up on the archaeological review for the sequel what would you be expected to find up there or the state would expect that you're going to find up there that can vary but usually it's a mixture of what they call in the archaeological community prehistoric which typically means Native American sites and then whatever historical sites we have a lot of the times it's sawmills and homesteads um, we find it we document it and we make sure that we do not disturb it when we're doing our projects so they are fully protected under the law okay and the, <clears throat> excuse me this is just for my edification um, under the new no burn law I think that's coming up is it January 1st 25 um, which affects basically our farmers that I know of how does this affect our state forestry department here in California are you still going to be able to do the prescribed burns in order to mitigate the problems we have in our forests I believe we will yes okay all right Thank I believe that yeah, just to it, it hasn't been discussed much in the department but I think it affects <laughs> mostly the agricultural community not us so much yeah yeah it doesn't apply the, the uh, and in fact what we've been doing and I really appreciate the partnership here what we've been doing is actually ramping up our uh, uh, search for ways that we can be helpful for so one of the things that was cited for example was state funding for supporting the prescribed burn program which your board actually showed a lot of leadership in in looking at our fee rule and when we have backfill dollars basically that we've been able to get actually through advocacy uh, together uh, you know we're able to actually reduce or eliminate the fee for these projects because we're able to to see some of that funding going into uh, supporting the prescribed burn program our policies are continuing to be they're, they're very fine-tuned I think now in supporting the effort as well as even resource side we've been very strong advocates of not only that but the much larger funding for um, enhanced forest management so I'm, I'm really just listening with a keen eye and just trying to figure out are there more opportunities for us to be even even more supportive and so but yeah that those two things are 
are separate. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm going to ask for public comment. <laughs> Thank you. A very good uh, presentation, and thank you very much for coming, and we want to help you as much as we can, so never hesitate to reach out at this level and at the county levels. Never hesitate. Your help is our help. Okay, P uh, item 12. Of course, public opinion, that's Jane. That's me. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to let people kind of get settled. You might see our videographer pulling some stuff out behind me. Just ignore him. Good morning. As we have mentioned on a few occasions before, and as some of you may recall, we have a history of doing public opinion surveys. Uh, we use these scientific surveys to do a variety of things. Um, generally, they measure the public's awareness of air quality issues and what might be top of mind for the public. Uh, we use uh, these surveys to get a better understanding of what the public thinks about where our air quality is is at any current time, whether it's getting better or worse. We ask the public if they know about the district. We ask the public about certain programs. Uh, back in the day, we used to ask the public about a program called Spare the Air, which um, we found wasn't very successful when we did these surveys because we were calling, um, you know, uh, 60 plus spare the air days during the summer and when every day is a spare the when everybody's special nobody's special when every day is a spare the air day then people just don't really think that they can they can do something unique on those days um, we want to make sure that the things we're doing are having the effect or the impact that we think they're having uh, we often build upon past surveys that is we take questions that were maybe asked five, ten years ago and ask them again to kind of see what's changed over time. And then we use that information to guide the next round of outreach. We've done multiple surveys over the past several years, going back as far as 1997. And I will tell you, for the most part, they've been telephone surveys. They've been um, what they call uh, RDD, Random Digit Dialing Surveys. Back in 1997, we called 400 people, which is 400 to 600 people is about the number you need for an, a statistical sample in the United States. Um, more than that, you can maybe get your margin of error down a little bit, uh, but for the most part, you're getting a pretty good sample of the valley by calling around 600 people. Uh, in 2002, we did another survey of 400 people. We asked about the Spare the Air program. We asked about if people were using charcoal briquettes. We asked if they were using lighter fluids. We asked about aerosol pro pro products. Things have changed a little bit since 2002. Uh, in 2005, we asked uh, about air quality issues. Was air quality improving? Um, most folks actually do think air quality is improving in the valley. Do they think we have an air quality problem? Most folks are aware that we have an air quality problem in the valley. And most folks are aware of the Valley Air District. Um, in 2005, we called about 600 people. And we had um, uh, also asked some questions during that, started to ask some questions about folk, where folks get their information in that survey. And what was true then, and is still true now, but the percentage is going down, so we might ask it again. People still get most of their information from TV. Uh, we'll ask that again, probably through this survey. And it, back 
back in 2005, you were looking at 70, 80% of the people were getting most of their news from TV, from the evening news. I have a feeling that's going to change significant when we ask about it now. Uh, in 2010, we started with our first bilingual survey, and we specifically honed in on a couple programs. We talked about what was then our Check Before You Burn program. We talked about lawn care, and we talked about driving habits. We also took the opportunity in this survey to do 31 stakeholder interviews. We went out and we kind of cherry-picked 31 folks both on our environmental side, our EJ side, our business side, some of our board members, and did more of a qualitative interview of them, of them to kind of get some more fine-tuned details about what was going on. And then, of course, our most recent survey was in 2017, and it was really meant to inform the shift that we made in our residential wood burning strategy. You might recall that out of that survey came some changes to our Burn Cleaner grant program. We changed some of our incentive dollar amounts. We also changed some of our messaging to really make that connection between neighborhood uh, fireplace use and personal health. And that health message we've continued to evolve as we've evolved that program over time. Uh, in that 2017 survey, we also did something a little unique where we did a 1,000 phone calls valley-wide, but then we did 600 in very targeted hotspot zip codes where we knew that there were folks using wood-burning devices and asked them some more specific questions so we could just have that little additional level of detail that we were, uh, that we were trying to get. Every time we do a survey, we try to build on the, the, the information from prior surveys and really try to have a little bit of a history of changes over time in public sentiment. Some of you may remember that when we did that 2017 survey, um, we had a little bit of an issue in that the phone call response rate was really challenging. As you know, we all walk around. We're no, you no longer go to the wall in the kitchen and pick up the phone, remember? We've got some younger people here. They might not remember that. But uh, we now walk around with these. And if you're like me, Buddy's saying you, remember, you do not remember this one. <laughs> I remember this one, not this one. <laughs> or the one where you said Klondike 919. You know, I, I'm not that one. Um, we all walk around with these, and if you're like me, it is rare that I pick up a call if I don't know who it's from. We all, I think a lot of us do that. So we began to see that in 2017. Um, what that meant for us is that it took more time for us to reach the number of respondents that we wanted to get, the number of people answering our survey. Um, we are seeing that across the industry. Robocalls are skyrocketing. I don't know how many times someone calls me that tells me that my car insurance or that my car warranty is there. The, the, the number of robocalls that are often mistaken for legitimate surveys, people just aren't picking up the phone. Or when they do pick up the phone, they may hear that it's a survey and they think, I don't have time for that. They're going to ask for money. I'm worried that this is some type of scam. Um, I'm busy. So there's a whole reason why folks are, are looking at the research and survey industry, the polling industry, and seeing where it's evolving. I will say that, that what the research, what, what some of the big, re like the, the Pew and some of the big research uh, entities are finding, is that when you do get your phone call responses in, they tend to be fairly accurate. There's not a huge shift in that accuracy. The challenge is you now have to take a lot more time to get your 600 or your 1,000 responses. So what that means to us is that it's more expensive. Whereas you used to maybe call 10 people, eight of them would pick up. You now might call 10 people and one of them will pick up. So that's something that we want to keep in the back of our mind. There's also a lot of additional methodologies that are out there. Um, personal interviews, mailed questionnaires, 
uh, focus groups, door-to-door -door canvassing, and we think all of those are incredibly valuable. They do take time, um, and there are other kind of challenges that might come with each of those. The last one that's really growing in popularity, especially I think in a more uh, casual setting, are these little online surveys. It's something that social media is kind of jumping onto. You'll see the Facebook has the little, you know, do you have a dog, yes or no kind of, kind of surveys. There's also surveys that you might get emailed. There's a couple of issues with the online surveys. People are, well, let's just do an online survey. One of the issues is that your online survey data and your phone survey data are probably going to be different. What I'm going to say to a human being on the phone might be different than what I say to someone in a survey online, to a, to a, when I'm not actually talking to a human being. So it's not that it doesn't have value, the online survey. It's that we can't necessarily build upon past phone interviews, phone survey data, with current online survey data. So just something that we have to consider. The other thing about the online surveys is that we have a digital divide in the Valley. We have folks that don't have access to the internet. We have folks that can't afford access to the internet. The other thing, unlike random digit dialing, you can't random email people. We don't have a list of everyone's emails. There's no, uh, there's no uniform way that we can randomly email people and get a cross section of folks living in the valley. So it does come with their challenges. And I will tell you, we are not the experts in this. There are folks, uh, I know Dr. Pacheco Warner is one of them, that deal with this type of survey data, polling data, research data on a regular basis. And so we want to build our next survey kind of with that in mind. But before I get there, some of the things that we want to look for as we're potentially doing this next survey in the next, you know, six to 12 months. It's really a lot of the things that we've talked about over the last couple of days, a lot of things that we've talked about in previous board discussions, and a lot of things that are our kind of primary issues. We once again want to build on data we've asked in the past. Basic demographics, uh, what do people know about air quality, uh, what do they know about the district, New one is we want to see how much folks are connecting air quality to their health. We've never really had that air quality health connection in there. We want to understand more about the public's uh, understanding and recognition of our residential wood smoke reduction program, which we used to call check before you burn. We now don't want you to check before you burn. We just don't want you to burn. We want you to upgrade that device to a gas or electric device. We want, and this came up a little bit with Heather yesterday, we want to understand how folks are accessing air quality data. Are they getting it when they go to their weather app? Are they using our app? Are they using EPA's Air Now app? How are they accessing their data, and how can we help them to be more informed to access that data and then to use that data to take uh, whatever steps they might need to take? We want to better understand what are the challenges out there to folks adopting some of these air-friendly behaviors? Is it economic? Do we need, you know, the, you know, bring one, get one? What, what does it take to get folks to take advantage of some of these really amazing grant programs that we have? Especially, I think, some of the new ones that are just beginning to kind of percolate out there, some of the air filtration stuff that we're looking at. You know, when you're looking at electric vehicles and everyone says the electric vehicles are coming, I drive an electric vehicle, I agree, what do we need to make sure that everyone has access to those electric vehicles? How do we deal with some of the range issues, some of the infrastructure issues? What I think we hear a lot from folks who are kind of inside baseball, you know, I think about my neighbor who you know, is retired and they have an RV and they go to the coast, they, they they are happy to do their part, but we want to better understand what they need, what we can provide them so that they can make these changes easily. And then, of course, picking, <coughs> piggybacking on the last presentation, better understanding of wildfires and our other episodic air quality events. And then, of course, a big part of today is to hear what other ideas you all might have to add to this. This is a lot, so we may need to hone this down or spread this out, but really taking a snapshot of, you know, the 90% the of the public out there that we're not hearing from on a regular basis. 
So our next steps, again, this industry is, is uh, changing with the advent of cell phones and social media. So we need to really look at what's going to be the best methodology for us to be able to get good, solid scientific information that we can base our programs on. Based on the discussion today, we want to identify some potential vendors who might be able to partner with us. We're going to release an RFP. We're going to score it on a variety of criteria, which you see here. Of course, do they have experience doing this? Can they come to us with kind of a strategy that understands some of those strengths and weaknesses of kind of just the research and polling industry in general? What does their proposal look like? We don't want to pay a bunch of money for this, so how much is it going to cost? Can they be innovative? Can they uh, understand and work within the valley? Uh, really looking for someone that, that will work with us to kind of fill out some of those questions that I presented for you. With that, uh, I'm open to hearing what you all have to say. We will be coming back to the board once we have a contract in place. But with the conversation today, uh, listening to what you all have to say, and then we'll hopefully be moving forward with getting an RFP out there. Any questions for Jamie? I'm going to ask you one or just make a comment. Um, <clears throat> you've been doing this for many years, and you're probably the expert in this room on how to do that. But don't be a cheap ass, okay? Don't, you know, don't cut your nose to spite your face hoping that you're saving us some money. Gotcha. But like I said, you're the most qualified person in this room <laughs> to even approach this subject. So, Mr. Bessinger. Thank you. I, I just uh, ran a campaign and was successful. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> I think we, yes, we can say that. Yeah. As did a lot of other folks, too, just to be clear. One of the Actually, that's a fantastic point. And some of the research that, <coughs> that I was doing was based on, on data really not in the last three to six months. And I want to – just my personal experience has been that in this last election cycle, that text to – it opens your browser and you, you get, like, you know, 20 questions sometimes. That – that worked for I was doing that. That's a really good point that that I think when we start talking to these folks, the, these vendors, that in a lot of them are vendors who work both in the political arena and in kind of the public agency sector. And I think that savviness is something that we definitely need to need to bring to the table. some uh, some people to help out. Okay. Ms. Fugazi. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so um, thinking along some of those same lines, I know that, you know, you have a captivated audience 
at our Tune In, Tune Up programs, but those people are taking advantage of what we have. Um, I always say, you know, make the most, get our biggest bang for our buck while they're there, let them know about, you know, replacing their their wood-burning stoves and, and um, our, their lawnmowers or whatnot. Um, but also say like, hey, do you know anybody that could take advantage of this program? Do you have their email or their number so we can text them about this? Just to get us a database of people that maybe haven't taken advantage of our programs. Uh, I would also say our faith base, going into uh, putting that out there and then going off of what Chair said about being cheap. So I will tell you this morning I did a survey because I got $10 off something by doing that survey for something I wanted. Um, and it wasn't the full price, but it was definitely, I took, it took me about 15 minutes to fill it out. And you think, oh, well, $10, come on. Get, I don't care. I don't leave money on the table on the floor anywhere. I will pick it up and put it in my pocket. And so uh, uh, incentives, they, they, they work. Even with my Amazon packages, I, I'll, t I'll wait a week to get my digital credit. Um, so I, I, I would uh, agree that there, there are opportunities out there um, and, and we just have to look at, at you know, what's working for things such as a, a campaign. Um, because there are people who will take the time when they're sitting in line somewhere, they've got time to kill, they look for things uh, to do. And then targeted, um, I would say the younger kids because they say only old people use Facebook now. Um, but Instagram is, is, is for the younger uh, uh, group. But you can target your audience as to who you want to see your message or click on your link. Thank you. Uh, do you want to say something? I was just complimenting. Uh, Vice Mayor Fugaz got her great ideas. <laughs> but I had some closing comments after hearing from the board members. You would oh, okay. appreciate it. Right. Thank you. Councilwoman Lewis. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'll probably have to buy a new phone because mine blew up <laughs> from so many political ads, including the ones that I got in text message. I dumped them all. Um, and I guess maybe I'm one of those old codgers. Somebody in our IT department stuck it in our political heads that you know, don't open up anything that you're not sure about because it could be spam and it could destroy your phone or your iPad or whatever. But there's one place during this election cycle that I could not dump anything. And that was on uh, Roku and your Amazon. And you're looking at movies and ev everything that's free has an advertisement. And they were always political. You can't get away from them. So it's, a, it's another avenue of driving a message uh, to, the, to the public that's, I don't know how much it costs, but you can't turn it off, that's for sure. Uh, so I just want to throw that idea out there to you as well. That's a great idea. Yeah, I would just also add it's 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 constantly changing, and I'm 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 here, you know. I used to open all my texts. I don't do that anymore. Done, you know. I'm not even looking. Oh no, nope, don't know that text. It's like the phone numbers now, um, and so, you know, maybe that'll work for the next six months. But then it's no, it's not going to not going to be a way to reach people. I do like the suggestion around Dr. Uh, Ms. Fagazi's comments that, you know, there, there are lots of places we touch people, and now we have to interpret, okay, who, who is that audience and how does that skew the information we're getting back, but through the 617 process, um, through clean cars for all, for all of these things, um, you know, when people are applying for grants, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way to develop a contact and to, to get other information that, that will help us do do the important work we do. Um, and maybe that's going to be much more important in the future than doing surveys. Dr. Pacheco. You and I could talk methodologies all day long, so I'm not going to talk about that. Well, and we, uh, we may, we, Samir, and I already, Samir and I have already talked about maybe involving you a little yeah. bit more as this process goes a little For further. For sure. I think one of the things that I, feel, I find like an interesting piece right now that you incorporated in the 
adopting the clean air vehicles, but I think could probably be adopted into the, some of the other categories. Um, particularly around, for me, I'd be interested to know um, what do people find as like barriers to protecting their health? You know, when they're like, if they know that that you know, wildfire or, or you know something is impacting, you know, or air quality is impacting their health, like. What are the barriers that they see to actually doing something about that? I think that'd be interesting. As well as, um, you know, not just the knowledge and experience, but, you know, hypothetically, like, also what would be, like, a barrier for them to, to get some of our grants? You know, what do they foresee as, as, as challenges? And I think that would help um, me understand a little bit more about where, um, where the gaps are and, and how can we can support you all as a staff and additional uh, staff that you need additional you know resources so really kind of from the like challenges to act kind of perspective mm -hmm. I feel like that I like that in the vehicles and I think that could be applied to other categories you have here I'm always curious about those joggers on the days when we have wildfire smoke in the valley <laughs> like significant wildfire Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, my comment or idea would be that I've seen in the past when we have done uh, surveys in our community, uh, our community actually, like for the census, sometimes they don't trust the people who are doing the census or the survey. So what I've seen, they actually trust and talk more. They're more open to, to people who they know or they trust. And by that, I, can, uh, I may say a nonprofit group working together with their district directly and probably, uh, you know, having a community member that are well known in each community is different. And I think when you bring a, a contractor, you know, they may have a way of doing things. It might not be, you know, it may not fit every community. So I think when you have a community, uh, somebody who they know or trust, you know, they'll be more open to do a survey. But once you do a, a survey, I think you need to kind of follow up and get it done because sometimes surveys are done and they just stay there for a long time. Thank you. Uh, are there any other um questions or suggestions. I, what, what I want to do is try to um, wrap up a little bit of a summary of some of what we've heard and some next steps on, on, on the item. It's really exciting and uh, a lot of appreciation from, from the staff on, on the fact that the board continues to support this ongoing work. It's really helpful in, in how we craft our strategies to come back to your board for, for action. So to, to your point, uh, Chair Mendez, we'll certainly be, we won't be um, and, I heard know, I had a million dollar budget. Is that right, Samir? Uh, yeah. So, uh, actually, uh, I don't know. Even more, maybe. But um, <laughs> but uh, no, we we're, we're, we'll definitely uh, make sure that we, we, we want we want a, a a representative, you know, scientifically accurate, um, representing you know various communities and different perspectives. And to to do this right, you know, we we covered some different you know items here. It's not the the five question. Um, you know, uh, Facebook or whatever other tools are using you know, survey. It's, it's, you know, to really get some data out of this, you really need to, to do a little bit more than that. So um, I think the how, um, and we just had another wonderful idea of, of something that we need to think about, right? There's a conventional methods, there's more community level methods, uh, you know, to try to get a, a, a certain level of response and accuracy to, to the same questions. I think the how is a very important question that we need to really think about, and we heard a lot of great ideas today. And the what, where we had a list of some of the different topical areas, and even based on today's discussion, I saw some opportunity for kind of fine-tuning, you know, those different questions and sort of the topical areas, and we'll be working on that, you know, based on the ideas that we, we've heard today. Um, and I think if there's time for some public comments, you have, certainly will be listening in to more feedback as well from, uh, from the public. So I just wanted to say that, you know, I think we will – we're excited to, to take all the input today to come up with a, an RFP that is multidimensional, you know, when it comes to, to approach healthy on um, not, you know, not being a, a $2,000, um, you know, survey, right? We need, we need something that's, that's good that will actually inform this board. And, and to your point, um, Mayor Preciado, it, 
we, our, our, our practice is to actually bring the, the results immediately back uh, to the board for discussion to see if there's opportunities and anything that we learned, you know, from the survey. So it's not the kind of survey that we do, and but we actually bring it right back. And usually it's, it's spurred even some, some opportunities for us to, to think about it staff to present to your board. So um, that would be the process for that. And I, we will be leaning on any, any board members here who want to, you know, continue sort of advising on this. Um, we'll be leaning on different board members as we as we uh, kind of keep going with the process here to get even more more input. And feel free to reach out to us and we'll, we'll keep um, enhancing the process as we move forward with it. So with that, I, I think there may be a, sure. well, another I, question here. Chair, sure, could I? I don't know if, I assume other counties do this, but other COGS. Um, I think we, we do a very extensive survey in Kern County every two years, and it's on a wide variety of subjects. Uh, there might be value in adding, I don't know how many questions they would want us to add or allow us to add, but why wouldn't we just take advantage of, I don't even know if they charge anything for us yeah. for that. That's, that's a great idea. That's piggybacking, as I yes. guess they call it, um, and we can investigate that. You, go, you can almost tie that back into what he was saying. You know, the mayor was right. saying about actually having ambassadors to get your questions asked. Yeah. And that's kind of what the COGS do in a way when they ask those questions. President does one too. Yeah, but I don't know the extent of it though. Okay. So with that, do you want to look for public comment? I know you're the... I, we have uh, Tammy's assisting. Um, yes, I think, uh, let me go back to one little example of what I think the mayor is saying, but also uh, John, uh, Supervisor Couch, is uh, Buddy with Fresno County Health Department um, entered into an agreement with the Farm Bureau of Fresno and Nisei Farmers League Insure America, our immigration arm. Uh, last week we got a report together, but since COVID, our organization went to the fields of the workers throughout the entire valley, not just Fresno County, and I want to, of course, cover his ears, <laughs> because Nisei Farmers League went outside the boundary line and went down to Kern or went to Merde uh, Merced or something. But our numbers of actual workers, we gave a bottle of sanitizer, we gave some N95s, we gave surgical masks to the workers in the fields and put them in their car. Now, we did that, and that number, right? I'm going to say when we report next week to the Board of Soups in Fresno, we will have hit, since COVID, 92,000 actual physical workers that we actually touched in our office to contractors and packing houses. So a lot of those workers were excited to get a box of masks and some bottles of sanitizer with their paycheck when we were in the fields. And exactly, that word of mouth of trust. Now, workers wouldn't take it from anybody else in a sense, but they've seen us and they know who we are. And even Jose Ramirez, the champion boxer, he went with me about, I don't know, a dozen times. And the workers thought that, oh my God, this is an actual, this is him. He's actually here. So I believe that the concept that the mayor and John Couch and even Buddy, uh, I think is the actual another mechanism, how we get to the rural communities. Because the workers we have are Farmersville, Arosi, Shafter, Mendota, uh, Los Balas. I mean, they're from all over. So that's another way, Jamie, that might help. We'd be absolutely excited if we can, if we have to give something and it's in Spanish, we give to them and they turn it around and send it or they do their thing on their phone because everybody's got a phone. Everyone has a phone, not a dial-on phone that some of you young ones don't realize. <laughs> but uh, anyway, thank you. So we'll move to the next item. 
That would be item number 13, to receive an update from the Valley Air District's Employees Association. We have the president of the association here in the audience, Michael Hamaguchi, who is probably working his, there he is, working his way up. Uh, hey, good to see you, Mike. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, the Air District has, has a really strong um, staff, and you're gonna hear a little bit later about our star work culture. Um, our asset is our people, and the Employee Association is, uh, is somebody that the management team works with very, very closely. Uh, they represent the wonderful staff of, of the Air District, and it's my pleasure to introduce Michael, who's the president, to share some thoughts and um, just have a little bit of interface opportunity here with, with the board, and I'll stop wasting his time and let him <laughs> give an update on what's going on, and feel free to interact here with the board members and ask any questions that you may have as well. So with that, Michael, go ahead. Thank you, Samir. Everybody hear me okay? Awesome. Yeah, so it's just, it's great to be here this morning. It's good to see everyone's faces, and I was thinking of a joke to say, but uh, everyone looks a lot taller in person. Uh, <laughs> and not the, the screen size. Um, <laughs> everybody looks great. Uh, you know, uh, uh, just before I get started here, you know, the, having the opportunity to come here, I appreciate it, Samir, for the offer. Um, it, it's a great opportunity. Uh, Driving, driving down 99 this morning. It was a little foggy coming into uh, uh, Madeira, and then uh, get to Fresno, and it clears up. Take a take a left on 180 or 180, and just get this wonderful view over here of, of the mountains with the, the dusting of snow. So I'm, I'm very envious of everyone in Fresno County right now. It's just beautiful. So, uh, in preparation for this, well, I guess I should say my name is Michael Hamaguchi. I'm uh, going into my 15th year at the district. Very proud of that. Um, uh, and uh, what was I say? oh, I'm the employee assistant for president. So uh, I haven't given a speech in about three years, I feel like, in front of everybody. So it's a great opportunity. Um, in preparation for this, I uh, kind of went went through my, my desk, and I was thinking, you know, should probably uh, um, since everyone's talking about where the district is going, talk a little bit about where we've been. And uh, had the opportunity to work with quite a few inception employees, so um, the, the 30 year plus employees over the years. I'm very fortunate uh, indeed for that. And uh, they left me some material. So kind of dug in the, in the archive of what, what, the, what, the, what the old employees left me. And uh, I found this uh, pretty cool promotional flyer. I'm sure it was given away at, at, at board meetings or, or public outreach and stuff like that. And. Uh, it's in great shape. Uh, it's got some stats on the back, but on the inside, it actually has a, a brief history of of the control uh, air district here and, and how we, we came to be. So I figured I'd, I'd just kind of read this paragraph to everybody and put things in context. Um, so the history of air pollution in San Joaquin Valley. Um, the first steps in air pollution control in the San Joaquin Valley were taken back in the 1970s with formation of the air pollution control districts. Um, in each of the uh, district, eight district counties, uh, as mandated in the Mulford Carroll Act, the boards of supervisors served as boards of, for the districts, each individual district, um, and they were responsible for uh, developing their own programs to meet state and federal guidelines. Um, there were early recognition that the need to coordinate air pollution activities in the district, uh, throughout the district, uh, cooperation between the eight counties began in 1972 through the uh, Basin Control Act, which represented an informal effort to coordinate planning, rule development, and compliance functions. In 1990, the Unified Air Pollution Control District Air Basin Authority, UABA, was created to further formalize the, and this recognition of the, their effort. However, since no single organization was responsible, there continued to be a considerable variation between counties in air pollution control activities. The first step in consolidation was taken by the counties of Kern, Tulare, Keynes, Fresno, Madera, Merced, Stanislaus, and San Joaquin County in March of 1991 with the formation of the San Joaquin Valley Unified Air Pollution Control District to assume all responsibilities for air pollution control in the San Joaquin Air Basin. The district includes seven counties plus the valley portion of Kern. Um, Senate Bill 124 passed in 1991 required modifications to the structure of the district uh, by July 1st, 1992, wasn't too high, uh, which were successfully completed and certified by the Air, Air Resources Board 
uh, in August of 1992. So we've come a long way. Um, there's actually a, a cute little thing here, 10 ways people can do, things people can do to, to clean the air. Um, and we've come a long way from there, uh, in, including uh, uh, getting rid of uh, wood-burning devices and stuff like that. And I see that this, this one is not lit, so that's good. Um, <laughs> yeah, today. I, I see it's been used a lot. So uh, to get back to things, um, yeah, this is just a great opportunity to be here with you and, and uh, share the sentiments of our membership and employees uh, here at the district. So the last several years have been, uh, you know, trying at best and, and interesting for, for everyone. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure we've all been through a lot. Um, there's a lot of changes because of the pandemic and, and how we do things and how we interact with each other and the public. Uh, I've heard a lot of that, about that today. Um, you know, um, as ever, our membership remains optimistic for the future. Uh, in typical district fashion, I, I think it's uh, the running theme for, for many of the things here is that um, the way we approach things is, uh, you know, using innovation and, and, you know, with a positive outlook. And uh, last year we successfully worked out another three-year contract uh, with the district, and uh, a lot of that same ethos was applied in, in those thinking of new and innovative ways to uh, um, benefit employee welfare and, um, and productivity. Uh, this should be no surprise to anybody here, but the district survived the pandemic. You know, we're, we're doing fine. I, I would say, dare to say that we actually thrived um, in, in those dark times. Um, and uh, quite frankly, it was because of uh, very decisive uh, and decisions made by executive management and uh, by people like our IT staff over here, um, uh, and, and staff at all levels, really. But uh, it's no stretch um, uh, either to say that we've all learned a lot from dealing with adversities uh, uh, during this, this period, and uh, you know, we're all going to come out a lot stronger. These include such items as, uh, you know, we have the rapid deploying of our, our telecommuting procedures. I'm sure you all, uh, all uh, know that we have been doing that um, and, and succeeding at it, but uh, also adapting to new technologies. And I'll throw out there Zoom. Um, I know it's uh, uh, for, for new interacting with new groups, it may be not as personal, but for when you're a very tight-knit team uh, district with our three offices, it's actually been a huge boon um, for, uh, for interaction between staff and, and management, too. So, um, yeah, those types of things are, are, uh, are, are great. I, I see them uh, continuing to help us uh, do more with what we've got. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I, also, I also think of, uh, we'll, you know, 10, 20 years down the line, we'll, we'll, we'll laugh at, at the whole uh, your, your mic is not on type of uh, thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe those will be, be old people jokes in, in 20 years from now. But... Um, uh, you know, <laughs> um, uh, so you know, we're able to remain, remain or sustain our incredible positive work culture here through the Star Star program, which you're going to hear more about later. Um, this also uh, uh, included a massive team effort uh, to promote rapid hiring and filling of positions uh, from our personnel, IT, um, finance, all the other departments. Um, you know, it's that type of atmosphere. It's been a lot of turnover, uh, and, and I'm sure all of the counties and cities uh, and your agencies as well. But uh, definitely um, um, having the direction to, to keep our staffing level up and get new blood in and people with great energy, it's, uh, it's really helped us um, um, continue on through this period. <laughs> what I'm really trying to say is that, uh, you know, when called upon, our membership, the employees, are always ready and able to respond when called upon. And uh, one note, um, or on that note, uh, uh, many of the productivity enhancements that uh, came about because of the pandemic have, have become standard practices now, um, such as you know, all staff are receiving laptops so they can work remotely, um, allowing for telecommuting options, um, and, and of course the, those Zoom meetings that we all love. Um, and then you know, these creative ways of thinking have helped our staff maintain a high level of productivity over this period. And I'm confident that uh, they will persist into the future. Um, you know, and this was a, a milestone year for the district, um, you know, celebrating its 30th anniversary uh, to improve air quality uh, and public health throughout the region. The district continues to grow as planned to meet the requirements of new and innovative expanding programs 
Um, I think you've heard some, some staffing increases because of, of the new, new things that are going on, so it's great to hear. Um, and then, as you're aware, there are always challenges in the regulatory wor world, hearing from the fire agencies um, and, and everyone else. But you know, we'll face those challenges with a positive attitude and, and with confidence, uh, facilitated through the district star program um, and, and, and its culture. Uh, district staff have implemented the, the community emission reduction programs that Jessica spoke about for disadvantaged communities uh, across the valley as part of Assembly Bill 617. Uh, this bill has also been party to accepting uh, many installments of grant funding to promote the immensely successful emission reduction programs offered by the district. And staff at all levels are working diligently and faithfully to implement, implement these commitments. Uh, this board should also be committed for pragmatically approving the need for additional funds to help incentivize the phase out of the majority of agricultural burning across the valley over the next coming years, the coming years, uh, and for putting a bigger emphasis on helping uh, small farmers. Uh, with, uh, with whatever the future may have in store for us, the employees remain committed to the, su the success of the district, to our mission, and to our core values. Uh, we, as employees of the association, uh, commit to the board our continued positive and proactive working relationship with each other uh, and with district management and, and, and with your board. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. Is there anybody want to ask him any questions or you want to move on to the next deal? I think it's just all thumbs up here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's all right. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank, thank you for that presentation. And, you know, the question I had when you stood up was um, and started was, uh, boy, what got the district this far through the pandemic um, with continued good relationships in the community, positive accomplishments, good staff morale, um, a sense of cohesion, which I've certainly seen in so many organizations uh, suffer with, with uh, the adjustments we've had to make to protect the public, to protect our staff, to protect ourselves during all this. And I think you, I, 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 I think you, 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 you answered that. Um, you know, it partly comes from within. We're going to hear about the star culture. It comes from above. Um, but uh, that clear mission that people are committed to and support to, to accomplish that. Um, you know, just thinking about, I don't know, maybe every organization did give a laptop to everybody so that they could work remotely when they had to. But I don't think that's true. Um, and it's that kind of detail that makes all the difference. You're absolutely right. Yeah, we, we, we may have closed offices, but we were, all the resources were uh, accessible. Um, so, yeah, there's no lapse in that. And to answer your question, yeah, it's, it's really the, the, the people that, that we hire and, and, and the long-term employees here that are, are committed to, to this mission. So, thank you. I think his life is about attitude. Mm -hmm. If you promote a good attitude which I think this organization might be the greatest at doing that, then they get more output out of their employees. So it's, it's real simple. Absolutely. But there's been people here been working on this hard for probably the last 20 years. So he said it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's actually... Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, a great segue into the <laughs> the next item, which is to, to, to share an update with, with your board on the district's star work culture. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of um, attitude, positive attitude. And, and as I said earlier, everything that we do, our greatest asset actually being our people and, and, and the way that we as a team work together to accomplish the, the board's expectations and our, our public health mission. So we're really excited to to share some thoughts with you today on where we are with the continually evolving, continually enhancing, you know, as, as life and, and our world continues to, to evolve, a work culture. We're really proud of, of what we do at the district. We're really proud of our, of our staff, a lot of them 
that are here today, wonderful staff that work on, on behalf of the board and the, and the public as a whole in the Valley. So I'd like to share some thoughts. I'm going to start off with our director of personnel, Shanika, uh, providing a little bit of an overview of the work culture, and then we'll we'll kind of proceed with um, some information across from a couple of different angles here. So Shanika, if you could kick us off. Well, good morning. It's still morning. Um, thank you all for sticking around, and thank you to whoever moved around the agenda because this they saved the best item for last, right? <laughs> So again, thank you, Samir. I'm Shanika Dixon, uh, Director of Personnel, and I am going to talk to you a little bit about our District Star work culture. Again, as Samir said, looking for um, additional input and guidance on how we can enhance some of these things. Um, obviously, they've continued to work really well for us, but we can always do better at everything that we do. So I'll get started with that. So as you know, um, and you've heard before, there are many key elements to the District Star work culture. The very first, um, we always put first, providing excellent customer service. That's our bottom line. We provide excellent customer service to all those that we interact with, whether it's the person sitting next to us, the uh, individual from the public who's walking into the building, someone who's calling in, our stakeholders, um, those that we uh, inspect their, their, their properties and their... And, and, th and things like that. The regulated community, uh, the general public, it makes us proud when we can hear positive feedback and you have heard so much of that um, at every board meeting and just in general today and yesterday. Uh, we've heard a lot of positive feedback from, from those that we regulate. We cannot be an innovative agency unless we promote ingenuity and creativity. So we emphasize this with our staff on a daily basis. Um, so that way they understand how important it is to the culture. You will hear a little bit more about that today uh, in the presentation. We embrace creativity. We love to hear thoughts. We are very open to it. Um, we implement many of the, the creative things our staff come up with. And embracing change. Embracing change can be tough. Uh, there's a lot of pain that comes with that just because it's something new. There's a lot of unknowns. But it's great that we have an agency that responds the way we do. And it's also great that uh, your board has enabled us to do this and, and do it well. So employees are so comfortable and they feel empowered uh, to share ideas. And again, we're so open to their suggestions. It makes them excited and want to come forward with more. And it makes us better at, at what we do. Setting and uh, maintaining high standards of employee performance, attitude, and behavior is important to us. There's no doubt that we like to have fun. Um, you all know that. We are a fun group, and I believe someone ha always says we, there's not a place who has more fun, but there's also not a place who works as hard as we do. So we have a lot of hard workers here, but we also have a lot of people who like to have fun. Um, we do have high expectations. We instill accountability um, in all of our employees. We have high standards. It's the fun that actually motivates our staff to want to do better. It really encourages them to provide better service and to continue to set higher goals and reach those expectations that are set. And this was extremely important during the pandemic. You've heard that a few times. Um, we've stayed very cohesive. We have been able to do all of the work that was necessary, provide all of the service that we were, to be able, uh, we were able to provide. Um, although we, we did have some times where we closed uh, you know, part of the office, we were still open. We are still open. We are still open to phone calls. We are still open even sometimes to the public. If they still came to our door, we would make sure that we helped them. Um, so we, were, we never shied away from that. Empowering employees to identify and solve problems. So our STAR suggestion process provides a collaborative approach, and it gives employees a voice when it comes to uh, strategizing and solving key issues. And you see a lot of that every month at our board meetings, um, sharing uh, ideas and different uh, programs that, that we have. Ongoing staff training and development starts on the first day of employment. Uh, we meet with our, our new staff during new employee orientation and consistently reinforce um, in many ways the district star principles. Um, all of our star principles are integrated into all of our training and much of our training is actually done in-house, which is uh, quite rare, I think, because a lot of people like to bring people from the outside but we feel like we know our employees, we know them well, and we really, really try to tailor our training based on our own experience. Um, again, this proved to be a little bit challenging during the pandemic, but 
with the tools that we had available, like Zoom, uh, we were still able to interact virtually in person. Um, we are really glad that we have been able to get back to some of our in-person training. It has had an impact on staff. Staff really enjoy it. They love meeting in person. It just has a whole different effect. Um, recognition. This is a huge part of our culture here at the district. Typically, well, all the time, uh, on our uh, agendas for every staff meeting, even um, our managers meeting with our managers and our executive team, we start the meeting with star suggestions, uh, not star suggestions, I'm sorry, with uh, recognitions, employee recognitions. And this is where we recognize staff for the exceptional things that they do, um, the exceptional service that they provide. A staff recognize each other during staff meetings, and it's not just those that they directly work with in their department. We really like them to look outside of the department and recognize those outside of the department. It shows that we're paying attention to what others are doing. It empowers other employees, um, and it makes them want to do the same and, and motivate others in return. So by implementing these key elements of STAR, we have achieved some really great results. I want to share some of those with you today. Um, we hear positive feedback from our stakeholders on a regular uh, basis. We take pride in this. You have heard many um, individuals giving public comment, thanking the district for the things that they do. We have the best customer service around, from the smiling faces that you see when you walk into our office every month, uh, to the, the, the smiles in the voice when you call into our office. Um, we have a very quick turnaround of issuing permits, providing incentives and grants to residents and bu uh, businesses to afford to replace equipment, and the in innovative programs that we launch. Also, our enforcement department. I, I, I know this is rare, but people actually do say thank you <laughs> when you go visit <laughs> them for a, a complaint or a completing inspections. Which that's really unheard of. And the positive feedback and recognition is a result of the emphasis that we place on exceptional customer service. So I've heard those stories many times where you know, our inspectors have come back from inspections and, and they were thanked for uh, the work that they did there. Successful implementation of the zero-based budgeting process to address new mandates for the upcoming year. Uh, this makes the, d the district very unique. Staffing is justified based on the workload um, that's expected for all of the new mandates. And uh, we strive for just if providing efficiencies, making new efficiencies, and continuous improvement in order to streamline processes. Uh, we have set the standard for other air districts in California. We have the lowest administrative overhead and lowest permit fees. Um, greatest staff productivity based on the number of permits issued, the number of inspections we conduct on an annual basis, and the number of grant projects administered. We are very proud to have the most cost-effective incentive grants program, and we're always looking for ways to enhance our incentive prog uh, programs. You hear a lot about that during our, our board meetings every month. Uh, and you've heard several times uh, today and yesterday as well. In the past, the, the district has also um, assisted in uh, administering grant programs for other air districts as well. Public accountability and transparency. This includes various public processes, such as public meetings, um, public workshops, individual meetings with stakeholders, meeting with industry folks, um, environmental groups, other agencies. We allow full transparency by providing easy access to information on our website. We're constantly looking for ways to make things more accessible, listserv, mailing information whenever it's requested. The district's innovative, effective air quality management strategies serve as a model to other agencies, so we do a great job in this area as well, so much so that other air districts uh, frequently ask for our guidance on various rules. Um, the air district has met or exceeded all state and federal mandates. We're always finding the best solutions to make that happen. And we work hard to foster positive working relationships and support from our stakeholders, regulated communities, the media, the public, um, many of which you have heard uh, from over the last couple of days. Uh, we have also been able to do this because of your board's leadership. There's no other way. Um, if it was not for your leadership, we would not be in a place that we're at. And as mentioned uh, previously, this is reflected in the recognitions that we frequently received, received from the public, um, from those we interact with. Entrepreneurial management that keeps us focused on continuous improvement and efficiency and relaying this same 
philosophy back to staff um, and challenging them every day, just telling them to do better. Um, it really motivates them and uh, motivates them to make change and to make change to do things in a better, more efficient way. As you just heard from our EA president, we have a fantastic relationship with the Employee Association. Um, you just heard from Michael Hamaguchi, and this is definitely a rarity. It doesn't happen often. I have to say we have a really great relationship um, with the EA, and we are super proud of that. Um, it helps things go smoothly, <laughs> and uh, we're able to communicate and communicate effectively on various uh, items that, that need to be discussed and resolved. So we're very open to positive, positive communication, and it's, it's awesome to be able to work with such a great, uh, a great group. Now, at this point, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Samir. He's going to talk to us a little bit about the STAR um, implementation of the STAR core values and just add a little bit of depth to the key elements that you just heard from. I'm going to try to hold myself to the same time expectations that we've been holding everybody else to because uh, I'm also the barrier between um, everybody and lunch. So I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be fairly quick here, but hopefully impactful. I actually wanted to face the staff as, as well as we, as we talked about this because that's how important STAR and our work culture is to all of us. And it starts, you know, we call this the DNA of, of the organization and, and our, our work culture. And, you know, we have DNA, defines who we are. Well, this is what defines STAR and, and who we are as an organization. It starts with that unshakable belief. You've heard, you've heard us talk a lot about this before. We build this program based on many great people. Sayed was obviously a huge champion of this, continue evolving this program. And this meeting, this item on this agenda, talking with the board about this, is part of this. It's part of the reaffirmation of just how important this work culture is to the organization getting ideas, keeping it fresh, and showing the staff just how committed we at the board level, the, the executive staff level, are to, to the employee welfare and well-being being first and foremost, thinking about ways to support our team because we are our people, right? Everything we're able to do comes down to our staff and their ability to deliver the service that we all expect to our stakeholders. So this is very, absolutely key at all levels of leadership, starting with myself, starting with this board, and then working its way through through the organization as, as a whole. Exceptional customer service is, is absolutely essential to what we do. It's a top priority of the, of the organization. We brainstorm this on a daily basis. There isn't a day in my office that we're not having a conversation with some team, with a team of staff about a particular program and how do we provide better service. And, and I think you hear a lot of that affirmation even these last few days from various programs that we, that we operate. We have to embrace change. Um, it's part of the culture. It's part of who I am. Uh, and I think anybody who's worked with me um, has seen this. And I'm so proud to work with the team of folks who all really embrace this change. And it's, it's the norm at the organization. You know, how do we launch a, a $180 million ag burn phase out program in two months? Literally from a budget being adopted to having a program live on September 1st, end of July. There's no way to do that without embracing change. The people that are working on that program weren't working on that program weeks before that, right? So we have to have this ability or we can't do what we need to get done done. And so this is absolutely central to what we do. We want to be the best. We're very competitive. We're very proud of the fact that at a national level we just won a best practice award for a residential wood smoke reduction program. We seek to be the best constantly because that's, again, how we meet the goals of, of the board. We place a higher value and positive attitude. We talked about this before. Initiative, that's how we hire. We meet all the qualifications on a technical basis. But when it comes down to it, who we hire and how we promote always comes down to the approach the person takes in terms of what they bring to the team, how positive they are. And that's, and, you know, that's very, very contagious, right? I mean, that's the message that everybody out there sees. And in fact, it's a much more pleasant working environment when we all work together with a positive attitude, right? So it, it just yields a much higher, you know, motivation, motivation and morale within, within our team. We embrace and promote diversity and inclusion. And, you know, this is something that um, I wanted to recognize just as one, one of the examples of some of the ramped up effort, the board for uh, continuing to add resource in this area. I've got Rochelle who's going to be providing a little bit of feedback here, here in a bit as somebody in our management team who's really been trying to help us you know, ramp up even further our, our ability to, to recognize the diversity within our team 
and really you know, champion these principles that we can then also do a better job at providing better service to our community and ultimately taking pride in what we do. We've done a lot of great work. We've improved air quality. We have an important mission and our staff need to know what it is that we do, why we do it, how great we've done, and that way they can be enabled and empowered to take that message out to the community and justify what we do, whether it's an inspection, whether it's a grant program permit, or all the other things that we do. We're a regional agency who's got a huge implication to the economy. We, you know, we, we can either be a huge barrier to, to the business community and to, to residents and to every facet of what we, or we can actually be somebody who can move this valley forward in a positive way. And we have to take pride in what we do to be able to do that. We talked about a lot of these. This is where I'm going to streamline the presentation just a little bit here because I really want to hear from the staff, actually. I'm really excited to have you here, a little bit of perspective. Um, so we talked about a lot of these already, but this is how we implement the program. Shanika covered these. I want to make sure that you, you see these and maybe point out a few of the, of the just embellish just a little bit more. It, it, you have to have a safe environment. So when we talk to people about change and suggestions, you have to feel safe in bringing up uh, those ideas, right? If we, don't, if we don't allow somebody to take a risk in speaking up, and actually bringing up those ideas and not be um, disciplined or, or be looked at as, hey, stay in your lane and, you know, why are you bringing up these ideas? Like, we don't want to fix something that's not broke. We don't subscribe to that at all. In fact, those that bring up the most ideas are the ones that are really noticed, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, whether it's promotional opportunity, recognitions, and other facets of what we do. And we, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to uh, – I think we covered these um, enough to, uh, to move on a little bit. I do want to hit on this first bullet here, is that you have to keep this program fresh, and that's by having ongoing conversations with every levels of staff um, in the management team. We talk about this all the time. You know, what do we do to, you know, one of the big examples of where we spent a lot of time this last year or so was coming out of COVID, if you will. What are we doing to come up with creative ways of reengaging with staff? We've hired a lot of new people. A lot of them were hired during, during the pandemic. We did a lot of great things during the pandemic to, we actually had face-to-face -face training, by the way, just to be clear on, on our approach on this initially. And then once we got comfortable, we were able to institute some telecommuting and uh, other practices. But, you know, a lot of folks started in an environment where not our typical district environment, where there's events all the time at the office and, you know, picnics and face-to-face symp -face symposiums. So we, we've been doing a lot of work this last year, including a big district picnic, a bunch of events um, internal to the office. And you're starting to see, in fact, you're seeing a lot of amazing face-to-face -face teamwork going on and that relationship building that really was a foundation of why we got through the pandemic as strong as we did. And so there's a lot of, you, you got to keep the program fresh and provide that freedom, serve as a role model. It starts with, with the board and the, the amazing board that you are in continuing to you know, support this program and provide the, the leadership that you do to, to myself and to our team and the, te the whole district. Uh, you know, I, I try to infuse that our management team tries to, and I just really feel like, you know, we've really got to, um, when it comes down to those risk-taking exercises, the way that we promote, we really have to establish ourselves as role models and, and take pride in what we do. Um, these are just examples. just want to highlight some of, the, some of the really cool things that we've been doing recently. And I, I mentioned Rochelle, somebody who's been a big champion in helping to ramp up our, our efforts in this space. Just really recognizing, and we have such a diverse staff. I mean, you've seen them come in on different programs from all walks of life, all dedicated to our, our valley. Um, we do a lot of, you know, various celebrations of different heritages. Um, just a lot, of, a lot of activities. Brings people together to share and to build those relationships across departments, opportunities for folks that may never, you know, really work all that closely together on a day-to-day -day basis, but just, just find ways to build those connections and, and see ourselves as, as a team. And, and, and also promote those principles as we work in our in our programs. I'm going to turn it back over to, to Shanika. That was my condensed version. Um, again, just, you know, being a little bit of situational awareness here. And, uh, and most importantly, just get given time for the staff to share a few of their thoughts. I'll turn it back to you, Shanika, for introductions and to wrap us up here. Thank you, Samir. So today we heard a lot about the District Star Work Culture, um, how we continue to implement all of the Star principles and all that we do. Um, now, this is, uh, this is where it gets good. <laughs> Anyone who's had an opportunity to, to interact with the district has their, um, or be part of the district, has their own STAR 
uh, their own star story to tell, whether um, it be staff, stakeholders, even um, governing board members, the public, every interaction uh, carries a unique story. So we've invited a few individuals to join us today, and they're each going to take a few minutes to just kind of highlight their experiences, to share what they have done to integrate um, STAR in their daily work, and how star, uh, the STAR work culture has empowered them and the work that they do and those that they serve at the district. First, please just turn your eyes to the screen for a quick short video. STAR is not just a program. STAR culture is something that you are, not something that you do. It's about relationship, it's about being engaged, it's about team building and helping everybody do good in what they do and be the best that they can be. And it's really what kind of keeps us all glued together and providing such great service and supporting one another. I translate all that into the field, so all that positivity, the teamwork. They are willing to help and they're genuine and everyone really does want you to just grow. Never have I worked somewhere that just felt more welcoming. Over here it honestly just felt more homey. The more they feel valued, the more they feel welcome, the harder their work. This is the place to be. Staff here are so invested and so dedicated to the mission of cleaning up the air and improving public health in the San Joaquin Valley. So that was just a snippet. More to come. So I'm actually going to allow them to come and introduce themselves to you. So. Good afternoon. I think we started with good morning. Now we've transitioned. It's past 12 o'clock said good morning on my paper. Now I've changed it. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emily Neeland, and I'm a senior air quality specialist here at the district on our air quality planning team under the fabulous Miss Jessie Fierro. Um, I started at the district in 2019, and when I first applied to work at the district, I was finishing my senior year in college. And as you can imagine, I was extremely intimidated by the thought of working at your typical government agency. But as soon as I came into the district and I had my very first interactions with district staff, I knew that this was not your typical government agency, and I felt immediately welcomed and accepted. To me, STAR is so much more than an acronym that we give presentations on, like today, or have on our district website. STAR really does build the foundation at this agency of positivity, empowerment, and inclusivity. On my team specifically, I work to implement STAR by creating an atmosphere where my team members feel valued from the moment they start at the district. I reach out to my team members on a daily basis, and this is something that I've always done, but I really embraced more during the COVID pandemic as we had new staffing onboarded. So I reach out to them just to see if they need any support or guidance, and just to make sure that they feel connected to the team. I also recognize my team members for every single accomplishment that they have, whether it be a small milestone on a project like a, a public workshop or a huge milestone. We actually just had like a, a dessert party the other day for a rule that your board approved. And it's because of these accomplishments and the, the positivity and embracing these accomplishments that everyone feels extremely valued. Outside of my day-to-day -day duties, I'm also the head of the district's Healthy Air Living Committee which is a group that puts on fun team building events during breaks and lunches to keep staff connected and most importantly to promote the star culture. I took over these duties when I'd been at the district for a little over six months and although I hadn't been here very long I felt really empowered by the district star culture to put myself out there and this was at the beginning of COVID and as all of you know and I'm sure you dealt with in your individual groups this was a really critical time to make sure that staff were connected. Not only new staff, like Samir mentioned, to make sure that they were being embraced by the agency and making connections, but also for existing staff that were used to working from home, but needed to maintain those connections and feel like their team members were there alongside them. So with the support of Samir and executive management, we switched to 100% virtual events during this time. And we did things like Jeopardy tournaments, which I won last year. <laughs> um, we also did a bingo game, and we've also been doing a walking challenge or a step challenge, which has now become an annual event where staff from all three regions compete on teams to see who can get the most steps through different exercising activities. 
And it's through fun events like these that we're able to not only further strengthen the connections on our very own teams, but also form connections to staff from other departments and staff from other regions. So with that, I'd just like to give a huge thank you for having me here today, and a huge thank you to Samir, Executive Management, and your board for continuing to prioritize STAR as the center of this agency. Thank you. All right, so I'm just a little nervous, but I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Okay. <laughs> Well, good afternoon. What's that? <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josue, and I am a senior inspector here at the Valley Air District. And I've been with the district now for six years. Growing up, one is always asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And very early on, I knew the answer to that question. I remember 16-year-old me attending a South Coast Air Quality Management District board meeting. Yes, air quality was a passion of mine very early on. I admired the meeting, the important public health topics, the public participation, and how the board members listened to the community. I knew I wanted to work for an air district. I knew when I grew up, my career would involve doing my part in keeping the air clean and improving public health. What people don't always ask is, what kind of work culture would you like to be a part of? A great work culture can take a job you love and elevate it even further. A great work culture focuses on a wonderful mission, focuses on employee growth, focuses on providing the best service, focuses on promoting positive work relationships, and focuses on continuous improvement. At the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, we have all of these values intertwined and more because we have STAR. And these values greatly benefit the public that we serve. As an inspector, sometimes I am on call, which means I am available outside of normal business hours to respond to community air quality concerns. And when we receive these voicemails and online submittals from the public, we reach out to the reporting parties right away. So many, so many times, one of the first things that reporting individual says is, that was fast. Others say, you're the first agency to call me back. Immediately, they have a positive outlook towards the district. And this outlook only increases when we inform them that an investigation will be, start, will be started and that they will receive a follow-up phone call on those investigation findings. And so many times, after the investigation is complete, I receive thank yous and expressions of gratitude. As an on-call inspector, I have been able to provide excellent customer service and have been able to act on the district's mission to improve the air quality and public health of Valley residents. Now, since I have been an inspector, I have been assigned disadvantaged communities, including AB 617 communities, as inspection areas. I began noticing when conducting inspections of paint shops and coating operations that many of the mom and pop shops in these communities had difficulty in calculating their VOC emissions, volatile organic compounds for their coding jobs. These businesses did not have the resources to hire a consulting company to calculate the VOCs for them, like other well-established businesses might have. Noticing this pattern, I acted. Over a dozen times, I have been able to teach VOC calculations, including all the math involved, like order of operations, you know, PEMDAS. I was like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Uh, uh, and canceling units when multiplying across and oftentimes, these 30 minute to one hour impromptu classes I gave were in Spanish. The best part of returning, the best part of it was returning the next year and seeing their great VOC records, sometimes better than those made by consultants. Now, these were external examples, but in the office, star shines through as well. Every day walking through the cubicle aisles, there are friendly hellos, how are yous, and how can I help? Every day you see an inspector joining another to conduct joint inspections, which are efficient and are opportunities for mutual learning. Every day the office buzzes with excitement as staff discuss rules and other work topics, bouncing ideas off of each other. And during monthly meetings, we each take a moment to give shout outs, star nominations, 
to those who helped us out or went above and beyond. Another thing I love about the district is the star suggestion model. Employees can bring new ideas to the table, see them come to fruition, and in turn, know that they were a definite part of improving the district. And as a last example, when I got married in 2018, I came back to work for my honeymoon, and I found my cubicle filled with balloons, streamers, pictures of my wife and I, and hanging cans, like, like the ones that drag behind the vehicles after weddings. <laughs> each with sweet congratulatory messages. So I felt cared for, appreciated, and I just felt the warm inside. 16-year-old me knew that he'd be working for an air district. 32-year-old me today is grateful that working for the Valley Air District has been so much better than he could have ever imagined. I am proud to stand before you today to highlight what has made it so great, STAR. And I want to thank you, Samir, the executive management team, and the board for continuing to support us by supporting this excellent work culture. Thank you. So uh, speaking of star work culture, you know, we, we respect each other, we care for each other, and we also bake for each other. And that is why one of our inspectors in the southern region, uh, he and his wife, made these awesome Valley Air District themed cookies. Uh, we hope you enjoy. And they were brought by our manager in the south, Jennifer and Marlene. And we're going to pass them out because when you see them, you will be so impressed. So. Wait, who's, the, who's the inspector and his wife? Kirk Bourne. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, we got to do a big thank you to him and his wife. Thank you. Thank you. All right. One clap if you can hear me. Two claps if you love Star. All right. All right. All right. All right. You can hear me, and we love Star, so we're good. All right. My name is Rochelle Lee, and I am the Senior Personnel Analyst at the Valley Air District. And I started around this time in 2018 as a temporary air quality specialist. Um, but before I got hired, I went and did some research on the website, and I came across a video that was a STAR video. And in this STAR video, there were some people talking about the star work culture. And I was like, what is the star work culture? And they went on to talk about service, teamwork, attitude, and respect. And I was like, wow, this place seems pretty cool. And I was really intrigued by this place. But then they went on to talk about how they were looking for people with entrepreneurial minds and people who could bring ideas to the table. And I was like, Hey, that's me. That's me. That's me. <laughs> I was like, I'm an entrepreneur. I got, I got ideas, and so I was like, I was really intrigued at that point, and so I was like, okay, um, Star seemed to check all of the boxes, and so starting with service, being a service to others, I believe that we're all put here to serve in some sort of capacity, and to make a difference, and to make sure that we always have a servant's heart. So that was one check. Teamwork. I pretty much been on a team my whole life playing sports. I was a four sporter back when you can do four sports in one year. And um, oh, I just thought about, I probably had teamwork before that because I grew up with eight kids. And when you're trying to do the dishes, you have somebody has to do the wash the dishes, somebody has to rinse, somebody has to dry, someone is doing the table and sweeping. So that was, I think that was teamwork, but I digress. I'll work, I'll keep the, I'll keep the sports there because that's what I wrote. So, um, so sports, it kind of gave me my, uh, my first hand of what teamwork should be like. And, um, it told me how to have my teammates back. And then attitude, that's one of the most critical attributes that one can have is a great attitude. And it goes a long way. Your attitude speaks long before your before you open your mouth to, to speak. And it goes further than what a degree can't where a degree can't take you. It's a great attitude. So check. Respect. 
I strive to respect everyone, including their views and their ideas, their cultural differences, and I always try to give the benefit of the doubt. So check. Star had literally checked all of the boxes that I stood for as a human. And and the intrinsic values that the star encapsulates is what drew me to the district. So I felt deep down that the Air District was somewhere that I was supposed to be. So being a temporary air quality specialist did not deter me from applying. I, I saw it as a way to get my foot into the door, as a way to get in there and give my ideas and bring my ideas to the table and, and let it be known that I deserve to sit at that table as well. And so after being at the district for about a year and a half as a temporary specialist, I applied and got a personnel um, analyst position. And I felt that that kind of aligned more with where I was supposed to be with my uh, career goals and my aspirations. So it was in this position where I began to sprinkle a few ideas that I wanted to bring to the forefront to highlight diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because in my heart, I knew that this was the kind of work that I was supposed to be doing. And on breaks and lunches, I began to do these cultural events and um, various, various things, providing infographics and trivia during emails and just to bring awareness. And so in doing this, I saw firsthand the positive effects of having this sort of thing and the positive effects that it brought to our employees. But one time in particular, we were celebrating Asian American Heritage Month. And I had a month, we had a month long of events. And we had Tai Chi, we had a fashion show, we had food. Um, we even had a place where people brought their, their belongings where they could display their, their cultural um, artifacts. And I can still remember seeing the smiles on our fellow Asian American faces. And as they proudly put out those, those beloved items that was handed down from, from their family members. Or the pride that was shown when they wore their cultural clothing as they went in front of everyone to display their, their clothes. I can hear the conversations and the laughter. And people of all cultures gathered to partake in this amazing food. And I can still remember eating those egg rolls because they were so good. <laughs> Um, so it was laughter and joy and pride. It all filled the room. And STAR, it encourages all of these team, these team building events. So events like these at a place where you spend the majority of your time is essential. It's essential because it makes people feel like they're cared about. It makes them feel like they matter. It makes them feel seen and heard. And it also inspires creativity. So the best organizations are the ones who sought to, to infuse diversity, equity, and inclusion in their work culture. It's a part of their DNA. It's not a checkbox on a piece of paper in terms of a quota or something that they must hit, but it's something that they live every day. Everyone from the top to the bottom lives this creed and knows that the organization, this is what we are. This is how we show up. This is how we show up in our interactions. This is how we show up in our policies. This is how we show up in our procedures. This is how we show up in the community. This is us. So Samir, I thank you for seeing the bigger picture. <laughs> I thank you for that. And aiming to embed diversity into our star work culture. This is our star work culture. And ultimately, if we do it right, the intrinsic values will spill out beyond the walls of the district and into our everyday lives. But two days ago, I was orienting 11 new hires. And I like to do icebreakers. And one of the questions I posed was, tell me something that you have learned or noticed, like since you've been here. And every last one of them said, hey, people are so nice. Everyone is so nice here. They're so caring. Um, I have never experienced anything like this before. And so that is what STAR does. It makes people excited to come to work. This is what STAR is. It's a culture that makes us uniquely different from any other agency. This is who we are. This is STAR. Thank you. Thank you all, we appreciate you. Thank you so much.
for your service. Thank you for making the drive over here this way. Um, thank you all for, for listening, and now we're just open to any feedback or input that you have. Well, go ahead, but you're going to get, you can speak here in a minute anyway. Yeah. Um, well, you know, well, go ahead. No, that's all right. No, <laughs> I have a lot of respect for you. <laughs> star, star. Describing the city of Fresno. <laughs> <coughs> Sheriff. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, add my support and indicate I would be happy to participate in the step challenge. And maybe we can get the rest of the board to uh, get on board with that too and, you know, different teams and bring it up. <laughs> I can guarantee you that Dr. Sheriffs would bring a lot of steps into that team. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, when I came to the district, I will tell you that as a board member, I was shocked. And the reason why I was shocked is because everybody, every step of the way, oh, no, we'll come to you. They came to my school to give me my iPad, whatever you need. Anything I asked for, anything, I felt a little guilty because I knew, oh, my gosh, I'm adding work onto somebody's plate. But at no such time did anybody complain, did anybody scowl. I mean, you have nonverbal communication as well, and sometimes you can't control it. And I've seen it from our staff in Stockton. Is this being recorded? Um, because uh, uh, it, it, it's scary because I've had people go, oh, and, uh, you know, the bullying and the retaliatory behavior that is rampant in some of the agencies I'm a part of, as well as, you know, being an educator and having principals, assistant principals, other staff members. I would say you need to patent this, really, this, and you could actually go out if the Air District needed a little more extra, you know, change on the side. But seriously, everybody in this organization has been absolutely fabulous from beginning to end up to down left to right I, I, I can't say it enough uh, and the fact that you 
you put it out there. I mean, there is no ambiguity. There is nothing nef nefarious going on. But you guys are 100% all of the time. And it's not, I, I'm going to say it's not because of me being on the board. It's because of the culture that is part of this organization. Uh, and I'm just happy to say that I've witnessed it. And I literally, if I ever become a principal, I'm going to put this in my school. So, awesome. yeah. thank you. Mayor Preciado. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just would like to thank the whole uh, staff, the whole, um, you know, everyone from, you know, from Samir all the way to, I don't really don't know everyone in person or know their names, but I know that uh, it takes a, a team effort to do what you guys do. You know, it takes, to do an, you guys do an excellent job. You guys are very friendly, very supportive, and very helpful in any which way. I, when I do come into the office on my meetings in, at the office Fresno, you know, I can see the warm uh, greetings and I see people working, but uh, not only working, but also trying to help in any which way they can. And I know for a fact when I reach out to Samir, you know, I get uh, the, the response that I'm looking for and if he doesn't have it, he'll reach it for me, he'll find out what I need. And also, you know, I see how you guys reach out to the community to you know, the disadvantaged communities far, far away from Fresno. And, and I, I believe that everybody in every area, Stockton, Bakersfield, and Fresno, you know, are really proud of having staff like you guys. You know, you guys really focus on your job. And, you know, I believe that, you know, when you're asked to do something, it's not about, you know, why do I need to do it? I think it's Sometimes you do the job before you have to do it, so that's very appreciated. Yes. So I would like to congratulate everyone from bottom one, because just remember, if there's a position within the district, it's because that position is mandated, so it takes a teamwork to get everything done. So everyone should be, it don't matter what position it is, I believe you're needed, appreciated, and should be appreciated. Thank, Thank you. Amy. I, too, am very happy to see uh, the morale. I think we all know how big a, a boost morale is in the work environment, maybe when some other things aren't going well. Before becoming a supervisor, I was, oh, man, 40 years? Wow, that's a long time. Um, in, you know, punching a clock. I was an employee, um, so I understand how the you know, work environment can have an effect on morale, and it's just it's good to see that the Air District um, is so positive, so I appreciate that. Yeah, what can I say? The I've termed it the happiest place in government. You know, and, you. and it is. And it's not a phony deal. But we need to sit back here right now and think, and thank Syed for you know really promoting this, bringing it in, and then every, Syed's top management that went now to Samir, and it, you guys come continue to improve it, continue to improve it. And I wasn't joking when I was make, made that little joke with the passenger. The city of Fresno is the king of whack-a-mole. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, and uh, when I came into Fresno County, that, uh, and Gene Rousseau, when he came, came in, I don't know how things are now in Tulare County. I think he helped some stuff when he first came over there. But he brought a, a different culture because I would call it like uh, in that culture, you're, you're being, a, you know, the personnel director. You're more like uh, the secret police. And I would actually, I actually refer to our old uh, head of personnel back in, uh, she retired in 15, as Laurenta Beria. Beria was Stalin's chief of, of the secret police. <laughs> and basically, if, you know, upper, you pissed off upper management, she literally made you disappear. And it was a very whack, you know, height of whack-a-mole. People had their heads down, and this is back in 14 and 15, and 
that's kind of changed, but no place is like this. No place is like this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman? Okay. Chair, Chairman? Yeah. Just real quick. Um, I wanted to thank the folks that made presentations because you obviously just spent some time on that, and I appreciate it. And I would just encourage you, we don't have this culture where I am. Um, I expect most of the people around the table don't have it. And once you lose it, it will be almost impossible to get it back. So I encourage you to, to keep the momentum going. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Quintessentially the opposite of, uh, of the quote, you know, you guys are very sincere. You believe in what you say. But there's, I've seen people in history believe in what they say, and that was little teenagers in China in the great cultural rev revolution banging people in the head with, with Mao's little red book. They believed it, but you believe in something that's true and that works. Mr. Thank Chair, you. there may be a few quick public comments. Um, and and I just Chair, wanted to... Uh, I'd like to be able to say something before you go to public. Well, I'm sorry. I was wondering, I'm I've had my little <laughs> sign up here. Maybe I should do this. <laughs> that's what happens when you sit at the end of the table. Um, and that's all in jest. You know, um, with Chairman Mendes saying what he says, I, I think every single public agency that sits up here, we all have whack-a-mole stuff going on in our, in our districts in the county, in the cities, and, you know, I'm saying this all in fun, but in reality, I think every single employee within government in the Valley should serve some time coming to your agency and being there for a month or two and then bring them back into the fold so that they can be re-energized and almost indoctrinated to have this energy to carry on government and service the way that this agency does. I, you know, it's, it's a pleasure. This is like playtime for me to come over here and be with you guys. It's such a, uh, a relief off the shoulder to have an agency that's this cohesive and care about each other. I mean, truly, sincerely care. Because you can, you can tell phoniness uh, uh, a mile away when you come on it. So uh, thank you all for what you do. Thank you for making me as a board member feel comfortable. And, and just like uh, Director Fagazi indicated, they came to my house and brought my iPad to me. I was like, man, what is this? <laughs> and, and there have been many times with my lack of technology that I can't get on a, a Zoom meeting when we were having them. And um, I would have a Zoom meeting with council the night before, and the next day I couldn't get on Zoom with the board. But you, your staff, your IT staff was there for me, called me on the phone. Um, the, uh, the clerk would let them know I was having problems, and it was an immediate reaction to get me where I needed to be. So to submit to everybody, every staff member, and those that I haven't met, those that are here today, you all have an intricate part in making this successful. And I applaud you. I really do. And I was sincere by saying, you know, I wish all of our government employees could serve time with you to understand how this works. Because it would make us have better government and get things done more enthusiastically with joy and love in our heart, and the public wouldn't react to us the way that they react. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to say that if you wanted to allow maybe 30 second. Um, comments. There, yeah. there may be, it sounds like there may be a few. One, one thing I wanted to mention real quick is that the board has, um, has worked with, with, with me and, and we've, we've actually, uh, we have, we have materials and we've offered to assist, um, other agencies and other, um, even other organizations that may be interested in learning about what we, what we do here and sharing some of that, uh, that experience. So if you do think there's any opportunity at some point for, somebody to, to work with us and uh, I'm just building a little bit on council members uh, suggestion there of <laughs> uh, Deborah um, not sure, at the, uh, maybe at the management level certainly we're happy to train people too and all that so if, if, if you see that opportunity as well I haven't thought about that one as much but you know again you start, that's a star management? suggestion happy to help implement that um, yeah so just 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 know that we have materials 
and, and I'm committed. And in fact, I've talked to a few folks. There's been a few actually board members that have suggested that I, you know I, I share some thoughts with a few individuals. So um, feel free to um, you know to take us up on that, and happy to, to do that. And we're very very humbled by 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 the board, and just a, a lot of appreciation for me and the, the staff for all the ongoing support. And with that, if you had, if you thought okay. there was a little bit of time for a few quick comments, yeah, we, uh, we'll, we'll go to general public comment for stuff that's, that wasn't on the agenda. I'll be super fast, Samir. I promise. And I'm not even sure which way to face when I speak because everywhere I look in this room is someone at the Air District who, in one way or another, has been helpful in the five years that I've been in the position that I'm in. So I work in an industry, and I have since I was 19. But yesterday, another agency stood up and said we had already been phased out. So that's that's the world that, that I live in, and that's how I feel when I go to other agencies. And I, that's not to say that the rules aren't hard. That's not to say we aren't struggling, that we don't work very hard to comply, that these folks aren't authorities to whom I answer on behalf of my industry. but. Everything that's been said here in the last hour and a half or so has been so true because this this organization and the way it operates and the way you all treat one another and the way you treat my industry, even with where we sit, um, is unparalleled. And, and you're right, uh, Ms. Lewis, they should send people to work at the Air District before they go into other branches of government. So your board should be very proud of, of your leadership and your staff. That's all I have. Thanks. I'll make it fast, buddy. Uh, first, uh, like I say, 360 degrees, plus all the, the other three offices. But uh, just like this week, I had a young man, several small farmers called me with some great vocabulary about ag burn. It was super vocabulary. And this young man... Uh, right after that, went to church and said, okay, okay. Uh, but if it wasn't for the staff in all levels, Samir, even back with Syed, uh, compared to Dave Crow, it wasn't the same. But what we've seen in every one of you, even this group here, buddy, I came in this morning and this group here specifically told me, this is the young group. You're welcome to sit with us. <laughs> and I felt like, oh, my God, okay. I, you know, I love it. I love it. But I, I will say that we've had some rough times. We really have. Even with uh, Aaron and Todd and Jessica and all of you. And even with Jamie's great programs. And you three, you need to be commended. Absolutely. If we can take this to our Fresno City Council, my God, uh, what an accomplishment that would be. But again, you board... You should be very happy because I remember uh, 97, 96 at the PG&E building, at the school uh, building. The meetings were not very good. They were rough, even with the staff. But what we've seen over the years, and all of you, the new staff, the young ones, the ones that are getting up a little bit of gray, uh, you know, uh, the ones that took all the gray away, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're getting up there too. So, but again, buddy, I want to thank you for leading with all the chairs, but definitely Samir and the workers, the employees, the association, um, you've done a great job. And, and I mean that sincerely, all of you. You've done a great job, and thank you for treating us as an industry, especially agriculture, has been through some pretty different times. But you've treated all of our farmers with dignity and respect, no matter how old they are, or if they dial a phone, or if they have the iPad. So, buddy, thank you. So we just covered item number 17, which I think was public comments, right? Yeah. Where 18 is my, my comments. I just wanted to say thank you again to the board members and all the support staff that are here, the staff that attended. Um, I can't, I, you know, I'll just leave it there because that was an excellent closing. The, the prior item, yeah, uh, thank you all very much. Lunch is, uh, I'll make sure everybody here stays for lunch. Yeah. Uh,
Um, and I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, for board it, member comments. And just a note on lunch, the sodas are now in the blue cooler over there. And I want to encourage the board member, once you get your plate, come and sit at one of these tables and meet some of the employees that maybe you haven't met before. Any more comments from the board? Go ahead. Just real quick, I, I think we would be remiss to say that um, it's been a rough year in terms of what's been said about the district in the public sphere. And I just, you know, I just want you to know, since, you know, some of you are here that aren't usually at the board meetings and maybe, you know, don't know me personally, but I'm sure I can speak for other board members that, you know, we're out there, you know, really proud of this district and really standing up for the work that you do. And I want you to know that, and I, and I know that the fact that you keep going and that you keep this attitude in spite of what's out there being said, you know, um, I really commend you for that because I know as board members, like, we're used to get, you know, taking hits, but um, just know that we know and that there's a lot of people out there that know the great work that you do and just keep it up. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, uh, as you know, may not but this is my last meeting and I, I would be remiss if I didn't say uh, how this all kind of came to be I kept getting email messages saying where's your application where's your application where's your application for the air district and I was like I don't know what this person is talking about why do they keep asking for my application um, but I had already known about Syed because of my work with SB Vilma in the area, and she had said, you need to get with this guy here because I'm a high school, I, I do physical and life science. Um, and, and I was like, oh, okay, okay. So here I fill out this little application, and I'm thinking, oh, they must have gotten hundreds of them. And next thing I know, oh, you've been appointed <laughs> to the Air Pollution Control District Board. And I'm like, what? What? And you have meetings, you know, on the third Thursday of the month, and people were calling me, and I was like, what did I get myself into? And Dr. Sheriffs was there, and Supervisor Couch, Supervisor Mendez, Supervisor Peterson, and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I think I was the only woman at that time, because Kristen Olson came, like, the next year. But I was like, I, I was really afraid of this group. Mm -hmm. And I was so wrong. I was so incredibly wrong. And I will say that this has been a phenomenal agency to be a part of, phenomenal employees to be able to work with. I mean, Todd, we did a presentation, and I was like, help, 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 uh, with the slides. And I stole some of his thunder, but he didn't complain at all. But I just want to say that, that I, it, it has been my honor and my pleasure to be a part of this organization, and I'm not going to be far away. I will still promote. I will still champion. I will still cheer. I will do everything I can uh, in order to push this forward uh, into our community and to uh, highly disadvantaged people that I will represent whether I am an elected or not. So thank you. It was great to have you on this board, and I just want to let you know real quick. I actually, my pre, the supervisor that um, I took her place was Judy Case, and she served on this board for many years. So I'd kind of just kind of seen what she did and tried, did it a little different, but uh, you know, I, I tried to serve. <laughs> But uh, go ahead, Doctor. Thank you very much. And Vice Mayor Fagazi, thank you very much for your service to this board and to the district. Um, the, this has been a really great study session. I really enjoy study session because it's a, it's a chance to, to often think about bigger picture stuff um, and really appreciate the opportunity to in, engage in a different way with fellow board members, with members of the public, with various stakeholders. Um, it's a really great, great opportunity. Um, you know, so, mu so much of our work is driven by NACs, uh, NOx and uh, PM 2.5 and focusing on the traditional sources, uh, the mobile sources, the industrial sources, the residential sources. Um, 
but this, 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 this study session really highlighted, uh, you know, thinking about the fate of the aquifer, thinking about forest management, um, thinking about greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I think our recognition of these challenges, our recognition of uh, how important they are tied together absolutely with the work that we do. Um, so really terrific panels, um, very helpful information, very helpful discussions. Um, and thanks to the planning that went into putting this on, one, how pleasant to be here. Um, and that certainly facilitated some great discussion. So thank you. I think, uh, Jamie, you were the, what words do you hide to? Yeah. What's that? We're done? I was going to thank her for, I'm sure she, I don't know if she was the lead of everybody that worked on this, but I think. Uh, she, I'll accept it on Okay, there you go. I, I just want to thank everybody. You did a great job. Great job. Yeah. Okay. All righty. With that, we're done. 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 Done.